This is Audible. Death by Cliché. Written by Bob Defendi. Narrated by Robert J. Defendi. Chapter 1. Authors who write their own chapter quotes should be shot. Bob Defendi. The bullet ruptured from the end of the improvised silencer without muzzle flash or a puff of smoke. D'Amico barely had time to twitch as it struck him in the forehead. For a moment, he looked afraid. Then he fell. For some reason, convulsively, he laughed. The moment you're shot in the head, a great terror seizes your body. Then peace floods through every limb. Your fingers tingle and your toes, if you can move them, curl. That part is important, because if you can curl your toes, your body will want to take a breath, a big one. This is the moment of truth. When the breath flows into your lungs, it tastes sweet. Sweet like bubblegum perfume. Sweet like taking the body shot off the cleavage of a perfect ten. Like the seven hundred to one horse winning by a nose. It's that moment you realize that when your daughter said she was late, she just meant her watch had stopped. As D'Amico collapsed, bullet wound in his head, he experienced none of that. One of the first rules of writing is, never start a novel with a flashback. So maybe ignore the fact that we just traveled back to ten minutes before the gunshot. Maybe the bullet is messing with your sense of time. Maybe it's magic. Maybe the author just wanted to start by shooting someone in the head. Maybe we should start here. D'Amico was a game designer. This might seem like a wonderful job until you consider that to be a game designer, you have to love gaming. Once you've gone into a business based on your hobby, you've turned your love into a job. Anyone who thinks work is a four-letter word has a damn poor vocabulary for swearing. You see, this book isn't a murder mystery. It's not a heartwarming tale of overcoming massive brain trauma. It's about gamers. Not the suave, telesavalis kind of gamer that's just a euphemism for gambler. The only thing our type of gamers gamble with is their own virginity, and much to their chagrin, they never lose. There were gamers before there were proper games. They drifted aimlessly through history, making do with the feeble forms of entertainment their times provided. They were sailors without ships. They were soldiers without a war. They were titans trapped in frail bodies. They wouldn't cross a street to stop a bully half their size. They seemed to have no courage at all. A single word from a girl, and they might wet themselves. No one suspected that each and every one of them was a hero deep inside. Ten minutes before he was shot in the head, D'Amico parked in front of Fantasy Rules and climbed out of the car. He walked up to a door so plastered in superhero posters it would give a roid raging dumbbell jock an inferiority complex, and they said Barbie dolls created an unrealistic body image. He pushed open the door and gazed about the store. A large glass counter ran from the door to about fifteen feet in along the right side. Graphic novels, anime DVDs, and dice lay heaped in piles. Behind the counter sat shelves stuffed with catalogs, more graphic novels, boxes of card games, and dozens of toys and action figures. It must have been a time of mourning, because all the action figures wore black. Further into the store stood racks of comics and game books. To the left, a doorway opened into the gaming area. The first table was empty. The rustle of papers drifted from deeper in the room. Doug Switch, the owner, walked out of the back room wearing a wargaming t-shirt and torn jeans. He had a boyish face, graying hair, and a paunch. What's up? My credit card debt. Still waiting for those checks? Yeah, it wouldn't be a problem, but, you know, I've gotten used to food. And his apartment, but he wouldn't say that. Not here and now. He wanted to escape, not dwell. There a game here? D'Amico asked. Yeah, Switch nodded toward the game room. They started a few minutes early. One of the guys from marketing at Sorcerer's asked me to rescue the players of the GM's a loony. Tell me it's not total disaster, D'Amico said. Switch shrugged slightly as if afraid someone was watching. Big fan of yours, though, he said. Couldn't stop talking about those autographed copies you left. D'Amico frowned. He eased toward the door to the game room, and a voice drifted out. You enter a room led by flaming braziers. Braziers, D'Amico said. I think he meant braziers, Switch said. You think? The cracking voice drifted out of the room. Unafraid, though, you step through with a certain panache. You think he means panache? Switch asked. 
I think I need to work up to this. D'Amico walked to the back of the store and scanned the titles there, his eyes not taking the words in. It was an open area with shelved walls surrounding a coin-operated pool table they used for miniature gaming. The eight nine balls were lost, among others, making it perfect if you wanted to play a game of seven ball with a snow globe for a cue. What was he doing here? He didn't want to play a game today. He didn't have time to play today. Store games were often the kind of dreck that made you think fondly of the time that the bit slipped and you power-drilled your hand. He was only here as a favor to Graham. Graham worked in marketing for Sorcerers by the Sea. The company possessed a stranglehold on the gaming industry. There hadn't been a grab for power so successful since Hitler decided to road trip through Belgium. If D'Amico could get in good with Sorcerers, well, third-party designers had been made by less. All he had to do was sit in on a game. It wasn't like he had a whack a stoolie in front of the feds. But he was being an asshole, and he knew it. Maybe this kid was all right. Maybe he had his learning from books, and if D'Amico could get past the mispronounced words, he'd find a diamond in the rough. Maybe this was a good game. She stood in front of you, her chainmail bikini holding two luscious— Maybe not. D'Amico slapped the bar on the door, stumbling out into the back alleyway. There are several species of gamers. There's the role player. He's the ruined thespian, the failed comic, the life of the party. He's the type most likely to be arrested for streaking drunkenly through a renaissance fair. There's the tactical genius, the unrecognized savior of humanity. He's never happier than when he has the advantage of ground. He's the type most likely to accidentally conquer a small Central American country. There's the combat gamer. He only wants to fight. There is a deep, disturbing love of violence in him, but no care for reason or common sense. He's the type most likely to work at the post office. There's the female gamer, an oddity with a strict chromosome. She probably got into gaming to play a vampire, but then migrated away after discovering she'd rather make love to a cheese grater than pretend an emo kid has maximum charisma and a presence of five. She is the type most likely to become possessed by Yoko Ono. Then there's the aspiring writer. He has likely started his own game company and claims great fame after selling 12 copies of a PDF. He's the type most likely to lead a cult of followers in a posthumous rendezvous with an alien comet. Finally, there's the loony. The loony worries even the geekiest gamer. He will regale you with stories of the sex comedy he recently ran with a group of local 6th graders. He is the type of gamer most likely to own a telephoto lens and a ball gag, or an improvised silencer. Ah, hell. I just blew the big revelation, didn't I? To the left loomed a red brick wall the shop shared with the local dollar theater. Paper and refuse cluttered the ground. Interspersed among the torn newsprint were discarded beer cans and a single-used condom. To the right sat a big P.O.S. Buick with a square mile of trunk space and a gunmetal primer paint job. D'Amico thought he could just squeeze around it. The door to the shop opened behind him, and he turned. Standing there was a teenage kid in torn jeans and a t-shirt that said, I'm looking for a Japanese girlfriend in kanji. He also wore a blue terrycloth cape. A sheen of grease painted starry night and pimples across the cheekbones and the bridge of his nose. Mud-colored hair sat in a rat's nest that might have been fashionable if it resembled belly button lint just a little less. D'Amico had left too loudly. This was probably the kid, the one running the game inside. Hi, he said. Mr. D'Amico, the kid asked. D'Amico mustered his courage and nodded. Yeah, that's me. Can I show you something? The kid moved toward the trunk of the P.O.S. The smell hit D'Amico next. The kid smelled like day three at a sci-fi convention. D'Amico stumbled away reflexively, moving back toward the dead end of the alley and trying not to choke. If this was the demo kid, he needed to figure out a way to rescue the players. This kid in a closed room would peel the dope off an airplane fuselage. "'I've been so excited to meet you,' the kid said. "'My name is Brandon Carl.' Great. The kid didn't even warrant a last name. "'Carl,' D'Amico said his greeting. Carl opened the trunk and rifled around inside. "'I've read all your books, played all your games.' D'Amico edged toward the back door, but Carl stood next to it. He tried to figure out a way to open it without a noise. This kid creeped him out. "'I'm... Flattered. Carl straightened, 
turning and pointing what appeared to be a two-liter bottle of Coca-Cola. D'Amico stared at the bottom of the bottle and went cold. Instead of soda, charcoal-colored foam filled the bottle. The kid had attached it to the barrel of a Glock 9mm pistol, so any shot would pass down the entire length of the bottle, like a silencer. An improvised silencer. "'You haven't been answering my emails, Mr. D'Amico,' the kid said and was probably his best movie villain voice. "'Game God?' D'Amico asked. "'Game God at Bullocks.Game. He'd harassed D'Amico with demands to publish his game for months now. The kid didn't take no, please no, or please God no for an answer. But loonies weren't supposed to be dangerous. They were supposed to be crazy. He was supposed to have to listen to a three-hour lecture about this kid's favorite character, and then it was supposed to be over. It was light stalking of a fifth-rate celebrity. It wasn't dangerous. It didn't end in a pistol and a gunshot. This couldn't be real. At least the kid used a two-liter and not a potato for the silencer. D'Amico was allergic. D'Amico had always thought in the face of danger he'd act with bravery, but this was real, not fantasy. A step toward the gun would end with a bullet in the face. A step toward the door would end with it slightly to the left, but still in the head. His knees quivered, and his stomach turned to liquid. Tears welled up in his eyes. He didn't know what he'd do if Carl told him to hit his knees right then. He didn't want to know. Dear God, he was going to die. I'll publish your game, he whispered. The silencer whispered back. D'Amico perceived things one sense at a time. He couldn't see the area around him, couldn't hear his own pounding heart, he couldn't even smell the metallic stench of his sudden sweat. Where was he? No time to think. Desperation clawed at his heart. He was dying, wasn't he? Dying. Shot in the head. He remembered that vividly. He felt his body. D'Amico had always considered himself a sexy man, but it had been in spite of his body, not because of it. Before, just five minutes ago, as far as he could tell, he'd been heavy. Well, all right, fat. He reached down and expected to find that comfortable layer of flesh. Instead, he found himself possessing a completely different kind of body. Sculpted muscles moved under a layer of 2% body fat. The back pain, the heel spurs, all the aches were gone. He examined his arms and wondered how long he'd been unconscious. What would it take for him to lose all that weight? He went to the gym a lot, so this might have been his real muscles if one were to remove all the padding. Still, it seemed a little much. All right, there was an explanation for this. His body might feel like it could bench 500 pounds, but it was probably just the same straining for 300 body he'd worked so hard to build up. That didn't explain the body fat. Maybe they rushed him to the hospital with a head wound and tagged him for liposuction instead of brain surgery. Maybe they had to call in a plastic surgeon for his face and he turned out to be the man's millionth customer. Maybe he was going crazy brain damage, hallucinations. His mind danced away from that one. Not crazy. No, no, no. Just dealing. Dealing. He reached up to his face. It felt normal, except for the thinness, the sleek, healthy skin. More chiseled, but the same nose, the same cheekbones, the same Italian eyebrows. His complexion felt a bit clearer. What the hell was going on? Only then did he notice his clothes. We should forgive the oversight. He had a lot on his mind just then. He still couldn't process any senses other than his hands, so he groped about in the darkness. He seemed to be wearing rough cotton pants and boots, a thigh-long tunic, a long cloak. He had a sword, a sword, on one hip. He checked his business and found a codpiece. And apparently he couldn't see. Panic welled up inside him. He needed to find the light. He checked with his fingers, feeling for glass eyes, but only managed to poke himself. He cursed and fumbled in his gear. His hand brushed his pouch, and a glimmer shone out. He managed to pull out a glowing rock. His mind was too busy shunning light to realize a more appropriate reaction would be, What the f— A corridor. Fitted gray stone walls extended into the darkness in both directions, and they must have used cement rather than mortar because the stones stayed on the ceiling without an arch. 
In fact, the entire construction showed the geometric precision of laser levels. He could have rolled a quarter across the floor without it bouncing on a seam. Strange. He crept down the hall, holding the rock in front of him, not thinking of drawing a sword. Of course, some part of his mind had figured it all out and jumped up and down, waving for his attention, but he ignored it. There are facts one didn't confront. About thirty feet down the corridor he found a patch that blackened the floor and walls. He stood there and stared at it, the part of his mind that wasn't firmly in denial leaping about with a megaphone. The char's consistency matched what would happen if someone makes two parts napalm and one part jello pudding. Bill Cosby would be turning over in his grave if someone had the presence of mind to run a stake through his heart. Odd, D'Amico said. That was the type of sentence that reassured when your mind unraveled like a Mexican carpet. He should have stopped and reassessed the situation. He should have tried to call out or plan or just power through the mental cycles necessary to work this all out. He should have done a hundred different things, but his mind was kicking back at the juice bar of insanity, choking on the sample cup of wheatgrass and wishing it could just order a pizza. D'Amico moved down the passage and voices rose somewhere in front of him. At first he ignored them until he figured out he heard them through his ears and not his head. Voices. Voices meant people, and people could answer questions like, where am I? And how do I get out of here? And was that charred spot someone you knew? Chapter 2. Never name the main character after yourself. That's just pathetic. Bob Defendi. Who goes there? A voice shouted. Bob D'Amico. A figure stepped into the light. He was six foot nine and wore chain mail on his arms and legs, a breastplate, and a helm with a tea slit like Boba Fett's. In one hand he held a large axe. On his back he carried a beaten leather backpack, a bow, a quiver of loose arrows, and a sword. A polished mace and a morning star hung on his belt. Daggers lined a bandolier across his chest. A five-foot-tall tower shield hung from one arm, battered and splintering around the edges. He didn't seem to notice the weight as he approached. What do you want? he asked, holding up the axe to strike. D'Amico threw up his hands. I'm friendly, don't attack! The man's expression fell with disappointment. He sulked off into the darkness. D'Amico called out after him, but he didn't respond. Strange. D'Amico stared after the man for a while, then took a step after him. A new person materialized the light. This one wore a pirate shirt and green tights. He carried a rapier on one hip and a mandolin over his shoulder. On his head perched a folded cap like Errol Flynn. Um, hi, D'Amico said. Prithee, good my lord, what brings thee to this dungeon of peril and dread? And suddenly he had it. LARPers. Live action role-playing. Basically, grown men playing dress-up. Some would call them the pimple on the ass of the gaming world. D'Amico didn't mind them much, except for at conventions where they spread like a virus, annoyed like crotch rot, and generally brought the entire industry a bad name. They were drunken, obnoxious, and horny. Convention LARPers made D'Amico wish he could call in an airstrike on his own position. I don't know why I'm here, D'Amico said. The guy seemed nice enough, despite the getup. I think I'm lost. Where did you come from? The hospital, I think? Ah, a temple of healing, the cool, soothing touch of the gentle ministrations of the clerical arts. I think you mean ministrations. What is thy injury, sirrah? D'Amico blinked a few times, and the little man in his head gave up completely and decided to kick back in the back row, knock down a little popcorn, and wait for the realization to hit. I was shot in the face, D'Amico said. Ah, the bard, he must have been a bard, said. A grievous wound. Seems healed, though. The last didn't sound like Elizabethan English. The guy couldn't keep character. I got better, D'Amico ventured. It was a test, and the man burst out laughing, slapping his knee and stroking his Van Dyke. So he was a gamer, or a renaissance nut. Someone who watched a lot of Monty Python, regardless. Good, sir, of course you did! So, are you here for adventure? I'm trying to find my way out, D'Amico said. Alas, there is but one door out. It seals behind, and it was guarded by a deadly slime. D'Amico glanced back toward the charred spot down the hall. I think someone torched the slime, he said. That would be us, good my lord, the bard said. We are a group of prowess and might, of bitter blades and boastful songs of... Give me the cliff notes, Bardykins, D'Amico said. We kick ass. I see, D'Amico said. Why are you lurking there in the dark? It isn't dark, a voice said from the darkness. 
No, it isn't, another voice. I have a torch right here. Fourth voice. How many people were there? Where? It's written on my character sheet. No, it isn't. Well, I have a lantern. Where? On my sheet. Well, you don't have it out. Yes, I do. No, you don't. I distinctly said I pulled it out. A light flared now, not thirty feet down the passage. It came from a lantern grasped in the hand of the big lug of a fighter. Next to him stood a woman in a long navy dress with some sort of gold and red embroidered surcoat down the front and back. Her hair was long, straight, and brown, her eyes pretty and penetrating. Actually, she looked a lot like Jag-era Zoe McClellan. Next to her stood a dwarf. Odd. D'Amico's brain kind of skirted over the image because it wasn't a little person dwarf. It was a Tolkien dwarf, complete with a long red beard and a helm and four axes and a hauberk of chain armor. D'Amico blinked at the creature. Let me introduce everyone, the bard said. I am Lord Arithian the Noble of the House Damocles, a bard and rascal of the highest caliber. How can you be a rascal of the highest? My hulking friend here is Omar, half-elven, warrior of might and terrible power. He doesn't look at all half. The lady is Latiana, a mage of wisdom and subtlety. She clearly isn't old enough to. And the dwarf is Gorthander the Delving, mighty in acts, reverent in faith, wise in the ways of the underworld. Hi, D'Amico said. Back at you, the dwarf said. D'Amico nodded, vaguely wondering if these LARPers were dangerous. They were obviously crazy they were LARPers, after all. But were they the harmless cat lady kind of crazy, or the don't-look-in-the-trunk kind of crazy? I'm Bob D'Amico. D'Amico, the dwarf said. Funny. Why is that funny? D'Amico asked. You are obviously an adventurer of the highest caliber, the bard said. Again with the calibers. Shall we travel this day together? Uh, sure, D'Amico said. I really just want out. Before we leave, we must beard the master of this dungeon in his lair, the bard said. You don't say. Join us, and I will weave a tale of heroism and noble deeds. D'Amico stared at them for a while. Fine. We backtracked this way to determine if the door was indeed closed, Arithian said. Perhaps we should continue along. You just said it was definitely closed, D'Amico said. It is, Arithian said with a sideways glance at Gorthander. But some of us need to be sure. It's a stupid adventure, Gorthander said. I want out. They all walked down past the charred deadly slime and past where D'Amico must have appeared. They marched until they came to a blank wall of unrelieved stone. Damn it, the dwarf said. Aren't you supposed to be able to check for moving walls and the like? Arithian asked. Oh, Gorthander said. That's right. I'm a dwarf. He didn't say it sarcastically. He said it as if he'd genuinely forgotten. So, Mikey... We go back? Mikey must have been the dwarf's real name, because after examining the wall, he nodded and led them back down the hall. They trudged through the dead slime silhouette to the end. There they found a gnarled and swollen door. The thing should have taken all of them to open, but Latiana walked up by herself. With a touch of one gloved hand, the door opened for her. Light shone through from the other side, casting a flickering glow across all of them. One by one, the other four walked through. D'Amico stepped forward and froze. He'd entered a room lit by flaming braziers. Chapter 3 Having a character from our world go to a fantasy world was old when C.S. Lewis did it. Bob Defendi. There are many kinds of nightmares. There's the nightmare where your teeth fall out, but you just can't stop chewing, can't stop poking and pulling at them. You know the consequences but you just love the pain. There's the dream where you show up at work, and for some inexplicable reason you take all your clothes off. Then you dart back and forth in front of your co-workers naked, but you don't put your clothes back on. You want to be embarrassed. There's the dream when you're in a fight, but no matter how hard you try to hit the other person, you keep pulling your punches. It's as if you're fighting underwater. You make yourself powerless. Dreams are not something that happened to us. Nightmares do not make us victims. These are things we bring on ourselves, things we know we deserve. We say the harsh word that will end the friendship. We commit the careless transgression that will destroy the love affair and push that last button that will alienate the family member. We take the wrong turn that will lead us into the bad neighborhood. We place that one last charge on the credit card. We do it to ourselves which is why that moment hit so hard, why those final words hurt so 
badly why that closing door sounds so final. Because no matter how much we deny it, we know it was our fault. D'Amico stared at the flaming braziers, and he finally accepted it. He knew where he was. He knew he'd gone mad. He knew this was a final fate, or hell itself, or a living delirium. He was in Carl's game. Forced to live in the worst game ever. Forced to stand here and live out every terrible moment. To know the truth. This couldn't possibly be real. He'd gone mad. He'd slipped the surly bonds of sanity and touched the face of Claude. And because it couldn't be real, he knew he had done it to himself. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not in a bang, but in a gibber. Insane. To Sartre, hell was other people. To the game designer, hell was the game. He had to find his way out. He had to claw his way out. He had to scream and fight and hack his way out. If necessary, he had to beg his way out. He had to, no matter what it would take. He had to get out if it was the last thing he did. Because he lay somewhere, bleeding and alone and at the mercy of the man who'd shot him. Carl had used a silencer, and that meant no one was coming. He'd have time to hide the body in that Texas-sized trunk and wash the blood into the gutters. No one would know. No one would help. He had to get out. And there was nothing funny about that. Chapter 4 Inventing a clever quote for each chapter is difficult. I'm not going to do it anymore. Bob Defendi There are laws of the universe. Nature abhors a vacuum, but it abhors an atmosphere more, so check your suit seals. There are laws of romance. You can ruin the most romantic mood by calling out the name of another woman. You can absolutely shatter it by calling out the name of another man. There are laws of the land. Bullets fired at a cop will return to you sevenfold. And there are rules of storytelling. Do not tell. Show. So let's break that last one and save us all the tritest scene in fiction. What I tell you three times is true. Haraldoff was a bad man. Haraldoff was a bad man. Haraldoff was a bad man. Believe me? No. All right, I'll show you, but you brought this on yourself. Haraldoff sat in a hall of immense power. Beneath him cowered a throne made of blackened bones. Behind rose a xylophone of glimmering ribs arcing off a backbone that would make the most honest chiropractor start shopping for a boat. It culminated in a tail that snaked into the air. The seat was to vertebrates what the bikini atoll test was to firecrackers. Raldoff rested both elbows on the arm bones of the vanquished, and his hands rested on the skulls of two creatures that would make Roger Corman start sketching like mad. It had fangs, to say the least. Smilodon people. Haraldoff didn't consider the throne. It was an extension of his body. He didn't consider the room that should have belonged to a galactic overlord. He didn't consider the priceless paintings on the walls. He didn't notice the tasteful pillars or the majestic ceiling or the plastic carpet that was brown, not because it was a tasteful color, but because eventually blood dried. He certainly didn't notice the guards. They were thoughtlessly loyal and built like Lou Ferrigno with anger management issues. They wore enough metal to give him even odds in a head-on with a Volvo. No, he only noticed the two henchmen. These two are called henchmen for a reason. They aren't going to be around long enough for you to learn their names. Tell me, Haraldoff said. Lord Haraldoff, Henchman A said, we've searched the world over, but the artifact is nowhere to be found. There are rules of fantasy, too. There is always an artifact, blamed Tolkien. I need it, Haraldoff said. We know, my lord, Henchman Two said. But we can't find it, said Henchman Prime. Haraldoff heaved a fatherly sigh. The kind of sigh a man releases before he tells one of his twins that the boy came with a convenient spare. It's the kind of sigh a man lets loose right before saying, it puts the lotion in the basket. There are sighs that punctuate sentences. This is the kind of sigh that punctuates people. He rose with far more dignity than a man with his name had any right to possess. He moved with the grace of a ballerina. His feet caressed the stairs down from his throne as they crossed one in front of the other, in dainty slippers. Finally they stopped, and Henchman the Junior stared up at the stocking legs that would have made Louis the Sixteenth bitch slap a nun. 
Araldoff saw fear as the man stared at those sagging tights and those gymnast legs. Slowly, the henchman's eyes rose. Don't look at me, Araldoff said. He smiled. The beauty of that smile flashed through the henchman's eyes, popping them like Lawrence Welk bubbles. The sweet eye juices dribbled down the man's cheeks even as his smile fixed in a rigor of ecstasy. Then he fell over, dead. Henchman the wiser kept his eyes on the ground. You may leave, but find the artifact, or I'll blow you a kiss, Haraldoff said. The henchman withdrew, weeping hysterical thanks. Haraldoff smiled and strolled back up his dais to his throne and picked up a delicate feathered mask from the seat. Carefully, he put it on. You may look, he said. As one, the guards lifted their visors and their gazes swept the throne room. Then one of them walked forward and hooked the dead body under one arm. Already it oozed blood from every pore as the guard dragged it down the plastic carpet and out the door at the far end. Haraldoff sat on his throne and never once wondered about his own motivations. He did what he did, and no one, not even the great Karl above, knew why. He was simply the villain. Haraldoff stroked the feathers of his mask and studied the paintings around him, admiring art that wasn't half as exquisite as his own face, admiring with the vacuous expression of the hollow, admiring because he couldn't admire himself, or rather, he could, but a full-faced look in the mirror would be his last. And that might have been the greatest cliché of all. Chapter 5 See? No quote. Wait! Damn it! Bob Defendi. D'Amico! D'Amico snapped out of his reverie and faced Erythian, standing in the blazing light of the sea cups. The room was wide and perfectly square. D'Amico was willing to bet it was exactly thirty feet by thirty feet. A single, perfectly proportioned passage led out the other side. D'Amico, Erythian said again. Huh? D'Amico said. There had to be a better explanation for all of this, an explanation that didn't involve him hugging himself in a rubber room for the rest of his life. Or worse, lost in a coma, adrift in a sea of his own mental chemicals. Prithee, art thou all right? Erythian asked. D'Amico shook his head. He was insane. Cuckoo. He couldn't even convince himself it was all some trick. He'd been shot in the head. That kid couldn't have missed. I'm... Uh, fine? Your name is D'Amico, Latiana asked. Yeah. Funny, she said. He still didn't know why that was funny. But he knew what wasn't. If he was still alive, if this wasn't hell, then he was bleeding to death in the real world. Soon his heart would beat its last. The final ounce of blood would dribble into Carl's trunk. Soon. Are we going to push ahead, good my lord? Erythian asked. D'Amico stared at the man, trying to parse those words into meaning. Slowly his brain caught up. He nodded. What could happen to him in his own dream? Could he die? And if he did, would he die in real life? If he didn't, did he have to look forward to the life of Prometheus, the endless pain of death over and over every day for the rest of eternity? What horrors did this world hold? Come on, buddy. Gorthander said, gesturing to the far hall and trudging one hobnailed boot at a time. Madness. No, he was right the first time. He had to get out, and since standing here and throwing a temper tantrum wasn't likely to accomplish that, he'd probably better follow the dwarf. They walked down the hallway, and D'Amico tried to keep his eyes peeled. If this was hell, there was probably something extremely nasty at the end. If this was a game, there'd probably be something worse. They came to a door like the last, swollen and obviously all but sealed by grime. Omar reached for the large copper ring, green and scaly with age. Wait, D'Amico said. Huh? Omar asked. You said the door we came through was the only way in or out, D'Amico said. I, said Arithian. Then how come all the doors are warped like they've never been used? So you're saying this might be a trap, Gorthander asked. I'm saying it doesn't seem right. You know how to disarm a trap? Omar asked. Well, D'Amico said. No. I do, Omar said, and yanked the door open. There came a gentle whooshing sound, and a speck of fire flew out of the center of the doorway. D'Amico was vaguely aware of everyone scattering around him as the speck grew closer and closer. 
a malevolent orange flicker of doom. He didn't have time to swallow his tongue before the thing hit him in the center of the chest and detonated. Son of a— Take a large metal barrel and a half a pound of fireworks. Climb inside with the fireworks and seal the thing closed behind you. Then start a match. And in the echoing depths of the barrel, light the fuse. Do not stick your fingers in your ears. If, just before the fireworks detonate, the barrel gets hit by an 18-wheeler, you'll have a right idea of the noise. D'Amico did something he couldn't quite describe with his middle bit to try to dodge the explosion. One moment he stood there, the next he... Well, he still stood there, but his clothes were clean and sharp while everyone else picked themselves up and patted out little fires all over their clothing. D'Amico didn't understand how he was unharmed. Well, I'll be damned, the dwarf said. D'Amico carefully studied his limbs, checking for damage. He couldn't find any. That was some dodge, Latiana said. Oh, a game mechanic. Abstract. You dodge the fire, but your miniature stays in the same place on the map. I think I've taken three levels of thief, D'Amico said. Let me examine the doors from now on. Either that or you're a martial artist, Gorthander said. I wish I'd seen my character sheet before the little prick shot me in the head. Come again? Gorthander asked. I didn't quite make that out. Never mind. D'Amico patted his sword. I'm a little well-armed for a fighting monk. Gorthander grunted and gestured toward the open door. D'Amico slinked ahead and peeked through the doorway. On the other side, five creatures stood frozen in the room. They had green skin and wore scale armor and furs. Great tusks emerged from their bottom jaws, and they clutched scimitars. I've always wondered why monsters in these dungeons never seem to move from room to room helping one another, D'Amico said. I didn't catch that, Latiana said. Why didn't they hear him? He hadn't spoken softly or slurred. Sneak in there, Gorthander said. He nodded and placed one foot carefully after the other, hugging the wall, doing everything sneaky people did in movies. He even tiptoed. As he broke the plane of the doorway, the creatures, they had to be orcs, started moving. They didn't do anything useful, though. They just sort of moved their arms and torsos aimlessly while standing in place. The country orc jamboree. D'Amico glanced back at the doorway, and he couldn't see the others. But the orcs didn't even seem to notice that the door hung open. He didn't know how many times he'd seen monsters behave like this in games. It wasn't any less stupid in real life. He slipped behind one of them and drew his sword. His body moved effortlessly, familiar with the skills, even if he wasn't. He didn't think as he glided into place, as he put his longsword point first into the back of the closest orc, as he grabbed it by the throat, as he thrust. This wasn't right. This wasn't real. He wasn't a cold-blooded killer, but a person, a real person, and he wasn't supposed to feel the slick, hot flow of blood over his hands, down the front of his clothing. He expected to see the point of the sword come out the other side, covered in green or black blood, but it came out glistening a perfect, beautiful red. Against the green of the creature's skin it looked absurdly festive. Christmas with Mussolini. As quickly as it started it was over, the orc kicked once, twice, and then went limp on his sword, and became a two hundred pound dead weight. He let it fall, guiding the monster to the ground. This wasn't real. It wasn't real. Omar and Gorthander burst through the door, their weapons high, bellows echoing from their lips, Frick and Frack, Mutt and Jeff, Tweedle Die and Tweedle Doom. A Rithian strode in behind them, strumming a mandolin. Bolts of white light flew past his head, blowing the chest out of a second orc. D'Amico barely had time to think before he charged, just aware of his own actions, and lopped off the head of another one. The orcs lay in broken heaps on the floor. D'Amico didn't know if it was his stomach or if the room really swayed like that, but... One of the orc heads rolled back and forth to his queasiness, so he decided to give himself the benefit of a doubt. The two warrior types cleaned their weapons, and D'Amico did likewise. Then he stared around the room and spotted the door on the other side. He left the dwarf to loot the bodies and walked over to it. Kneeling, he did what every good thief was supposed to do. He pressed his ear against it and listened. Great heaving gusts of wind roared in the next room. It was a terrible snorting sound, as if from the unholy union of a bull, a wind tunnel, and the brass section of the London Philharmonic. D'Amico straightened and stepped away from the door. Gorthander had a handful of gold that could have funded the takeover of Saudi Arabia. He frowned as if it were a pittance. Hardly worth dividing, he grunted. The others nodded their heads. The corridors in this dungeon haven't branched, have they? D'Amico asked. No, Ladiana said. Why? 
Well, a dungeon is so popular as an adventure structure because it's essentially a flow chart. You go from here to here to here, and although there are branches, they order everything neatly. You can't flank a dungeon crawl. So? Omar's voice practically yawned with the boredom. So this flow chart has only one branch. Gorthander scratched his head. What does that mean? It means Carl has no imagination. I didn't catch that, Gorthander said. D'Amico nodded. He'd expected that. He was starting to figure out the rules of this madness, and one of the core conceits was it behaved exactly as if he were in Carl's game. As if the boy had gone back to the table after stuffing D'Amico in his trunk. D'Amico now lived in the game, but the others thought he was a non-player character, a character run by Carl to flesh out the party, a thief type because the party seemed to lack stealth. It made a strange, beating-your-head-against-the-wall sort of sense. If he said something to the characters, Carl had to repeat it to the players. He wasn't going to repeat stuff that made him sound foolish. He wasn't going to repeat anything... Gorthander, D'Amico said. I want you to listen very carefully. All right, the dwarf said. Carl shot me in the head. I'm in his trunk. Call the police. Gorthander stared at him, confused. I didn't catch that. D'Amico sighed. Never mind. Let's go meet Sir Snorts a lot. He faced the door. Chapter 6 All right, fine. I lied, Bob Defendi. D'Amico checked the door for traps and then threw it open. If he had to live in a madhouse, he might as well do it with a certain style. He'd heard of polishing the brass on the Titanic. This was more like headlining at Ground Zero Hiroshima. On the other side of the door stretched a wide room lit by little dishes of fire hanging by chains from the ceiling. Braziers, but don't tell Carl. The room lay bare, and D'Amico only then realized that he hadn't seen a single stick of furniture in this damn dungeon. But that was of lesser concern. In the center of the room stood a minotaur, but not just any minotaur. It had a great bull's head and a muscled torso like, God help him, like a bulky superhero. The thing stood twelve feet tall, was lightly furred like a fat Italian, and wielded an axe with a blade the size of a dinner table. It wore a harness of green leather that was probably tanned orchide. Metal rings excised holes from the bands, giving it a vaguely kinky look. Fredericks of Crete. D'Amico sidled sideways, because sidling forward is just plain silly. Meanwhile, the dwarf went the other direction, and Omar charged straight up the middle. At least take a red cape, D'Amico shouted, but matador humor was a little beyond the great lummox. Omar raised that axe of his and hacked with everything he had, but the minotaur just blocked. Omar staggered backward. If the thing had hit the axe any harder, Omar's moles would have flown off. Gorthander charged in from the side. D'Amico cursed and did the same, angling for a backstab, hoping the thing would lose him in all the confusion. The minotaur smashed Omar, and the man took air, flying backward and landing with a thunderous crash, like a bag of pans rolling down a flight of stairs, or a dramatic reading of the Chinese phone book. Ladiana let loose with another volley of white-hot darts, and Arithian dove in to grab Omar. Meanwhile, Gorthander charged, his axe transcribing a silver arc in the air. The Minotaur parried the attack and slapped him with the blade. Gorthander staggered there, shaken like a James Bond martini. And D'Amico froze. In a game, he would have charged in without thinking, but here he stared at the naked, hairy ass of a creature that would tear him to jerky. The pain would be tremendous. The death would take hours. It didn't matter that he was already dying in the real world. He was beyond fearing that. That might have been real, but this felt real. This was here. This was now. Gorthander tried to dart in again, and the Minotaur smashed him, knocking the dwarf to one knee. Then the Minotaur raised that great axe, even as more darts of light splattered against its tough hide. Gorthander faced his doom. D'Amico moved. He didn't have any more time to think. He raised that sword in a two-handed grip, point down. D'Amico leaped, seeking height, searching for that sweet spot to the giant hairy back, looking for the center of the cashmere sweater the thing called a hide. Minotaurs aren't supposed to be fast like the bulls they resemble. It wasn't supposed to dash sideways. D'Amico wasn't supposed to sail past ineffectually. He stumbled as the blade stabbed down to the dwarf's chest, splitting mail and rending leather, shattering bone. The dwarf looked up into D'Amico's eyes, his own wide, 
uncomprehending. The Minotaur reared behind him, twirling that axe. Chapter 7 This is not the quote you're looking for, Bob Defendi. But we don't really care about a fight, do we? They're so droll. Instead, we will wheel the camera of our mind up and away from the dungeon, the minotaur, and the butchered dwarf. Up, up, and up will spiral, a leaf on a metaphorical wind, a plastic bag on the updraft of the soul. Once we reach daylight, we swing around, and there, do you see it? It's a village placed right next to these ravaging hordes of evil, a village that should have moved long ago, even though all the creatures inside have no obvious way to go peasant poaching. A village on the edge of disaster. Peasant! Is that one down there under the gaze of our long eyes? Behold him at the end of a plough, working his perfectly square lot of farmland. We will watch him, and he'll never know. A peasant under glass, as it were. He has no name, so we will name him. Bill, for the weapon. Bill reaches the end of a long, painful furrow in the earth. He reaches the end, and he pauses wearily. It's time to turn the plough. It's easier to pass an arms budget through a democratic congress than to turn a medieval plough. But he starts. Grunting and heaving, cursing the ox that pulls the thing and spitting, he starts the slow, exhausting process. He is low, lower than low, so low that right now you should be terrified that this, after all, is the real hero of our story. Never fear. It's not that Carl isn't unimaginative enough to explore the peasant hero becomes savior. It really isn't. It's just that this particular peasant hero was abandoned. Once in a game long ago, he was the hero. Or at least he would have been if the player hadn't found sitting in the same room as Carl about as pleasant as an all-day air supply concert. There is nothing sadder than a former player character after the player has permanently left the game. And so here he is, abandoned after less than one game session. Evidently, the player's aunt had been whisked away to the hospital, which then exploded. You can understand why he couldn't stay. He is halfway through this most torturous of all peasant tasks when he stops and surveys the field. Then he surveys the one next to it. There are six square fields, all in a row. He studies the plow, and then the fields again. Would it not, indeed, be better to have long rows? He could give up all but one-sixth of his field to the tillers of the other patches, in return for one-sixth of each of theirs. As long as those sixth all led one into another in a straight line, yes, that would work. And yet, wait. At the end of the day, he'd still have to go home to the wife he never loved, the children he couldn't remember fathering, the horrible, stifling life. He squinted over at the dungeon, uncomfortably close to his field. What had he been thinking coming out here every day? He couldn't imagine what had brought him to this. He couldn't remember the details. It was as if he had just been born. He didn't know that he stood directly between D'Amico and the villain's magical artifact, not the one he's searching for, the one I haven't told you about yet. Bill looked around and decided he wasn't going to negotiate the deal for the new fields. He wasn't going to plow one more row. He wasn't even going home tonight. Bill didn't care about any of that. He'd never cared. But it was as if until now he wasn't aware of his own feelings, his own wishes, his own needs. Bill let the ox loose, one buckle at a time. Then he walked away from the village, not so much as glancing back. Now, I suppose we should get back to that battle. Chapter 8 Still, don't expect a quote every chapter. Bob Defendi D'Amico stared up at the Minotaur, because if he stared forward, he saw those great hairy testicles like two coconuts. A man needed an ironclad self-esteem should he ever look a gift bowl in the crotch. D'Amico dodged to one side as the Minotaur brought its axe down, smashing into the flagstones and showering the area with sparks. D'Amico tap-danced backwards, almost feeling good with the energy, the vitality of this new body. But that feeling evaporated as the Minotaur dove in again, smashing his axe into the floor and sending up another great glowing shower. Either that axe was electrified, or this weapon came straight out of a Highlander movie. D'Amico moved in, trying to stab with his sword, only to have it batted aside effortlessly. He leaped away from another sweeping attack and darted in again, faster than he'd ever been in the real world, striking like a mongoose, thrusting like a snake, seeking like a tax auditor. 
Again the Minotaur knocked his sword away, and again it looked like the thing wasn't even trying. D'Amico was going to die. He couldn't believe it, but he was going to die. Again! He stumbled backward, his hand shaking his sword point, wandering, transcribing lie detector patterns in the air. He wasn't supposed to be here, fighting this great stinking brute. Even in the game he was a damn thief. It wasn't his job to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the boss monster. The Minotaur spun its axe gently in the air, as if it were a prop, not a real weapon of hardwood and steel. D'Amico's eyes darted to the dwarf, lying broken on the paving stones. His blood still spurted into the air through the rent in his armor. D'Amico had done that. He'd killed one of the closest things he had to a friend in this strange, unlikely place. And he barely even knew the dwarf. Tag! shouted Arithian, because character, in the hands of even the best role-player, is still a matter of convenience. D'Amico didn't dare take his eyes off that axe, so he just cringed at the bellow behind him. Someone charged at his rear. Omar burst past, weapon whirling, battle cry streaming from his lips. He sounded like a cross between a broken car horn and the 32nd Infantry Division. He struck. The Minotaur knocked him aside. This was a game. D'Amico had to keep that in mind. It might feel real. He might even be able to die, but still a game, no matter how deadly. And that was part of the problem. If he was outside the game, seeing the dice roll, he'd know what was happening. But in it, he'd never realized the terror of not knowing. He'd never pictured how frightened his character would be, even in a winning fight. The problem was damage. The D30 system, D for die, 30 for the number of sides on the die, used abstract hit points. They could represent luck, the amount of energy the creature could use while dodging, even sword tricks that only worked once on a giving opponent. D'Amico and Omar could be missing with their attacks, or they could be hitting, whittling away at the Minotaur's finite number of hit points. Omar dashed in again, and D'Amico circled the creature so he and Omar would be directly opposite each other, giving them flank bonuses. He needed to remember the game. He was an expert at the game. He moved in, attacking from behind, hoping his backstab would hit. Omar came in from the front, swinging. The Minotaur dove away from both of them to the right. Had they both hit? dropping those abstract hit points, or were they ineffective? There was no way to tell. "'What's your armor class?' D'Amico shouted at the Minotaur. Thirty-eight. The Minotaur shouted back, its voice rumbling like a locomotive in an echo chamber. Thirty-eight. But was that the real number, or was it using its bluff skill? They both ran in past its guard again, striking at almost the same time. They must have rolled the same number on initiative. The Minotaur dodged. Each time, it dodged to the right. D'Amico smiled. To hell with the game. The game wasn't getting him anywhere. On the next attack, D'Amico didn't plunge in with his sword. Instead, he fainted for the Minotaur's back and then shot to the right, falling to his hands and knees. Omar swung in with his axe. The Minotaur, already moving as if they both attacked, shifted to the right, its great hooves catching D'Amico in the ribs with a cracking sound, then tripping over, crashing to the floor. Omar didn't miss a beat. He moved in after the Minotaur, his axe high, bringing it down with a wet, meaty thump. Omar pulled the axe clear, trailing a streamer of blood in the process, then brought it down again, burying it with a car door sound. Carl must have been using some bizarre sound effects tape in the game. D'Amico tried to move, but pain exploded through his torso. He whimpered and fell. Stop your whining, Omar said. You only took twenty points of damage. But it hurt. The pain of the broken ribs radiated through his chest, aching and throbbing, twisting with the torque of every move. He'd broken an ankle once, teaching another kid daredevil acrobatics. Another time, he'd put his fist through a car window during a crash. Neither of them hurt like this. Ladiana appeared at his side and reached down, gently catching the arm on the unbroken side. She smelled of lilacs, and her hands felt cool as she helped him to his feet. He gave her a grateful smile. She winked at him with those Zoe McClellan eyes as she slid under his arm, helping to support his weight. He seemed to be the same height he'd been in the real world, maybe six foot two. It felt the same to have a woman under his arm at any rate. Thanks, he said with a strained smile. Lean on me, she said back. He somehow resisted taking that as a song cue. Pain could work wonders for dampening the jokes. Arithian was on his knees with Gorthander now, whispering spells. No, singing spells. D'Amico perked up. Wait, he's a bard, right? Yeah, Latiana said. That means he has healing spells. You ever know a bard that didn't select healing spells? D'Amico smiled as Omar tromped out of the room, searching for something. Arithian cast another spell, then another. 
The blood stopped spurting into the air. Then Gorthander twitched. He gasped and reached for his chest. Welcome back, Dwarf Lord, Arithian said. Shut up and let me finish the job, Gorthander said with a groan. Then he laid his hand on his own chest and cast a spell of his own. His hand glowed white, his chest lit up in response. D'Amico limped toward them, Ladiana supporting him. The dwarf skin knit, visible through the rent in his armor. Finally, the dwarf stood. He gave D'Amico a once-over. You hurt? Only about twenty points, but I could use a heal, D'Amico said, trying to sound like a gamer at the table, not a real person in real pain. Gorthander stomped over to him and said another prayer, his hand pulsing with healing light. He reached out and touched D'Amico. The warmth of the magic flowed into him. D'Amico's bones wrenched, then crackled together. The pain became heat, merging with the warmth of the spell. Then it vanished completely. He didn't want to remove his arm from Ladiana's shoulders, but he couldn't think of a reason to keep it there, so he dropped it to his side. It might have been his imagination, but he thought she looked disappointed as well. He'd seen healing spells used in games. He'd written them and described them in games he'd run. He'd even, on occasion, tried to convey the pure wonder of the effect. None of that held a candle to what he'd just experienced. It was a miracle. To a character in a high magic game, it might be commonplace. But to D'Amico? It took weeks to heal broken ribs, even with the best medical attention. Just like that, they were knit. Just like that. The game might not be real, but it was real to him. Uh, thanks, D'Amico said. The dwarf kicked the dead minotaur. Back at you. D'Amico glanced at the door. Omar had gone back the way they'd come. There were no other doors out of this room. You learn how to trip someone like that in the schoolyard? Gorthander asked after Arithian explained how they defeated the minotaur. That works better with bullies, D'Amico said. I see. Should we loot the body or something? D'Amico asked. That was usually the next step in these games. Yeah, let's, Gorthander said. They had just knelt at the body when Omar came back in, his face a dark cloud. D'Amico frowned and exchanged glances with Gorthander. What is it, big guy? The door, Omar said. It was supposed to open when we killed him, right? Right, Gorthander said. It didn't. Chapter 9 Bob Defendi Heraldoff stood on a hill overlooking a village, a black velvet mask on his face, his hair oiled and neatly curled, his clothes perfect. Around him stood humans more dog than man, and lapdogs at that. They sniffed and begged and preened for his attention. It was amazing he didn't have to bat them away from his rump. Below him, on the edge of the village, his walls of metal and muscle he called guards, the guards called men, and the villagers called sir, stood waiting for the order. They were a coiled spring ready to sprang, a charged bullet ready to fire, a mother-in-law about to check your ironing. In other words, doom itself. What is their crime? Heraldoff asked. They're late on your taxes, your majesty, one of the lapdogs said. He was a short man with a bald head he compensated for with furs that made him look like a small beaver. A grievous error, my lord, said a second lapdog, this one long and lanky, who wore a spangled coat and tights that showed off his legs. He resembled the cross between a dancing girl and a disco ball. Heraldoff nodded and contemplated the village. What was their excuse this time? A long winter, your majesty, beaver said. The spring crop went in late, they say, Legs said. I see. The men strained below him, almost chugging with their need to rush in and slaughter the villagers. Heraldoff watched them in a disconnected way. A fly buzzed by him, met his gaze, and despite the mask, dropped dead. Flies are perceptive, probably something to do with the compound eyes. Beyond the men, the villagers had gathered in clumps outside their homes. A pall of anticipation hung over the settlement, but they hadn't panicked yet. They never panicked until he ordered the attack. He'd never wondered if that was strange before. Anything else? he asked. The mayor begged for mercy, Beaver said. He said that they finished harvesting the crops yesterday. They're ready to pay their taxes now. Legs smiled a bemused smile. Fine, Raldoff said. Kill them. Discipline had to be maintained. The people had to know who was overlord here. It was the way of things. 
It was the way of command. It was the way of evil. And Hraldolf was an evil man. The troops started forward, tromping more like moving statues than men. They made the offensive line of the 1976 Oakland Raiders look like a ballet recital of eight-year-olds. They tromped through fields and underbrush, walked through fences in a shattering of boards and flying splinters. One didn't bother with gates when one was built like a cab over truck. Now the people reacted, panicking in tightly packed groups. They ran even as the soldiers drew their swords, but the soldiers didn't pick up pace. They marched forward relentlessly. Haraldoff frowned. Something tickled at the back of his mind. An idea. He'd never had an idea before. His mind had seen about as much activity as a parking garage with no street access. It wasn't that he was stupid. He was far from stupid. His mind was simply a muscle he'd never used. The thoughts sauntered about the empty halls of his intellect, admiring all the room, checking out the view and the walk-in closets. Then it settled in and decided to make a home. Hraldolf twitched. Wait, he said. His voice didn't need volume. His whispered word carried all the impact of a comet. The soldier stopped. Your Majesty? Beaver asked. Walk through this with me, will you? Yes, Your Majesty. They didn't pay their taxes. No, Your Majesty. But they can pay them now. Yes, Your Majesty. And the only reason they're late is because of the weather. Yes, Your Majesty. Which they can't control. No, Your Majesty. Haraldoff stared in confusion. Now, Beaver... My name isn't Beaver, Your Majesty. I never would have guessed. Now, Beaver, I'm as evil as the next man. More evil, Your Majesty. But it seems to me that they haven't actually done anything to defy me. I suppose you could come to that conclusion, Your Majesty. Because it's the truth. Well, you could say that, Your Majesty. So basically, we're wiping them out for no reason. You always have a reason, Your Majesty. But I need to buy things. I believe that was your reason, Your Majesty. Haraldoff regarded the little sycophant and shook his head. If there was ever time to kill a henchman, this was it. Still, he needed to focus. He was on to something here. Something important. Something that could redefine villainy as the world knew it. Something groundbreaking. Wait. Beaver? Not Beaver, Your Majesty. Fine. Not Beaver. Yes, Your Majesty? Correct me if I'm wrong. But if I wipe out this village, they'll never pay me taxes again. Not Beaver blinked three times and looked at Legs. Legs' face screwed up in effort as he tried to wrap his head around that, like a stoner who'd taken one too many hits to make it through trig class. I... I suppose not, Your Majesty. Kraldoff shook his head. Why had he never seen this before? Collect the taxes, he said, turning away. Then, don't hurt them. Yes, Your Majesty. And Kraldoff wondered why, for the first time in his life, he actually felt alive. Chapter 10 See? Bob Defendi. His name was Jerkind. Don't blame him. His mother had issues. He sat in the whorehouse, waiting for his go upstairs. Jerkind liked money. And whores. Money and whores were both nice. Preferably at the same time. Hopefully, there'd be enough of each that when he was done with the one, he'd still have something left of the other. Jerkind wasn't at the deepest pool in the park. He sat there counting his gold as he sipped an ale someone had dyed pink. He didn't wonder who could dye ale pink in a medieval society. He certainly didn't wonder if the ale would give him cancer, and that was a mistake. Whorehouse or no whorehouse, pink ale wasn't natural. So Jerkin sipped at what, if he was lucky, was merely lead-based ale, and stacked and restacked his coins. As he waited, a group of girls came down from the stairs and lined up like a cattle drive. Jerkin lifted his head. It was his turn. The room was done in the same tasteless lace one expects from the boudoir of an over-the-hill sex pot. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to pollute me. There were pink walls and pink upholstery. The room was decorated at an expense that would have bankrupted a French king. 
but Carl didn't have the best grasp of medieval economics. Candle chandeliers hung from the ceiling, perfume cloyed in the air. In one corner, a western gentleman, complete with six-shooters, banged away at an antique piano. I'm sorry you had to see that. I'll spare you a description of the whores. You might get adult-onset diabetes. Jerkin stood up and walked through an invisible line in the room, the line between D'Amico and that artifact I'm not supposed to tell you about. He stopped in shock. Something inside him opened, changed. Everyone else in the room passed back and forth through this line, but didn't seem to notice. Jerkin did, though. Jerkin had the qualification of being the most perceptive person in the world. That wasn't exactly ringing praise. Jerkin dropped the coins back into his belt pouch along with the other treasures, five paper clips and something he couldn't identify, the cap of a pen. He watched the whores and frowned. Honey, said one of the whores, are you coming? Jerkin shook his head in confusion. I'm not in the mood. Honey, you're always in the mood. That's just it, Jerkin said. I'm not. But he'd always gone with them anyway. Jerkin stumbled out of the door and into the street. He stared right, then left, his eye drawn to the perilous dungeon that was just up the hill from the village proper. Something was happening. Jerkin squeezed his eyes shut and tried to examine what had changed. He could feel passions inside him now, conflicting thoughts and desires. They pulled him one way and another. He loved his mother. He hated her as well. He loved the whores, but they disgusted him. He loved ale, but he loathed the hold it had over him. He loved money, but... No, he just loved money. He'd never felt like this before. No, that wasn't true. He'd felt like this, but he'd never noticed. Before his feelings, his desires, they'd been locked off from the rest of them. They'd been there. He'd simply paid them no heed. He needed a word for this, maybe a phrase. He needed to make this wonderful feeling concrete. And then he had it, suddenly, without any further thought. This was the thing that had been missing from his life all along. This was the core of being, the heart of humanity, and what he'd needed, what he'd always needed, what he'd never had. Free will, he said. Something in the world had changed. No matter what, he had to make sure it didn't change back. Chapter 11 Never End a Chapter with a False Cliffhanger Bob Defendi In the distance, the sound of a door echoed through the halls. D'Amico headed in that direction. Hmm, Gorthander said, kicking the Minotaur. This one must have taken some time to die. They looted the body, and Gorthander found a pouch. Out of it he pulled handful after handful of gold while Omar searched the bare room, scowled at D'Amico. You got ranks in search? Omar asked. D'Amico started to tell him to shove off, then he remembered his character was a thief. Probably. Then get off your fat ass, Omar said. D'Amico shrugged and searched the room as well. He didn't know what he was doing, but it seemed he didn't have to. His hands caressed the walls as if they knew what to do. His eyes seemed to track the lines of the stone on their own volition. His head moved back and forth, checking cracks and crevices from different angles. It was strange, like watching a movie in his head without the man in the sixth row chatting on a cell phone. You find anything yet? Omar asked. Well, not chatting on a cell phone, at least. D'Amico glanced at Omar and gave him his best don't-mess-with-me glare. The kind one got from mafia hitman, hockey enforcers, and old women at bingo games. Then he went back to his searching. After exactly ten minutes, he pushed a stone, and a door next to him opened with a rumbling sound. It moved out of the wall slowly, connected at one edge. Still, there was no visible hinge, although there should have been. In addition, no scrapes marred the floor or the seams, no tool marks at all. D'Amico rolled his eyes and stepped inside. He found a ten by ten by ten cube of a room. Inside lay a large chest overflowing with platinum and gems. A small bag sat on top, as if placed delicately. Positioned around the chest lay two axes, a sword, a mandolin, and a staff. All of them shimmered slightly in the darkness. "'Well, what have we here?' Omar said, smacking his hands together and rubbing them. "'Seems like Carl thinks he's Monty Hall,' D'Amico said. "'Or Monty Hall,' Gorthander said with appropriate carrying gestures. The pile of gold was knee-high now, the pouch it had come from the size of a fist. "'Is that Minotaur carrying around a few thousand gold in its pouch?' "'Seems like it,' Gorthander said. "'Is it a magic pouch?' D'Amico asked. 
Nope, Gorthander said. They pulled out the treasure. D'Amico handed the staff to Ladiana, the mandolin to Arithian, and took the longsword for himself. Omar took the axe that suited him better and tossed the other to Gorthander. What do you think? Omar asked. I think Carl is trying to outfit us for a quest. Omar laughed a dark, ugly laugh. D'Amico wondered if Carl had passed that along verbatim. He probably had. It was just the kind of lame joke that, when coming from a GM, Carl would think was clever and charming. D'Amico picked up the pouch and opened it. Inside he found eleven tiny plastic laser guns, the kind that came with Star Wars action figures. And a white sock. Just one. Strange, he said. Let's blow this place, Omar said. They divvied up the treasure, which didn't take nearly as long as it should have, and it didn't seem heavy once it was in their backpacks. D'Amico lifted his light load of heavy platinum and gold and trudged back the way they'd come. Evidently, Carl wasn't clever enough to have the dungeon open back up due to some trigger. It just opened up when they had generally finished the adventure. So they climbed out under the green veldt of grass running down from the dungeon to what appeared to be a village. The village had square fields and a cluster of houses like something out of Tudor England, with heavy beam frames and stucco walls. Children played in the street and a dog chased the sheep in an undeveloped field. Men trudged, but they didn't toil. They just appeared... unmotivated? Not tired. Let's find a tavern, Gorthander said. You think a village this size is a real tavern? D'Amico asked. Gorthander shot him a look and he shrugged. Never mind. D'Amico was outside at last. He was out of the dungeon, but he was still in the world. In a world he didn't want. In a time he didn't understand. In a place that made no sense where ambition and ability met. Where one man could make a difference. Have movie trailer man read that and it might sound pretty cool. But this was much worse. Here he was, trapped in this place, while his body ebbed away in the real world. He sat here under Carl's yoke while that bastard chatted away, or however he acted while running a game, as if nothing had happened. Chatted while D'Amico died in his trunk. This wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't even possible. He was mad or in hell or locked away in some deranged coma. Maybe forever. But if this was a coma, maybe this was his mind's way of presenting the truth to him. Maybe he was delusional with a purpose. Maybe, just maybe, if he found a way out, that was the way out of the coma as well. Maybe. It was the only hope he had. They marched down to the village and along the main street. The peasants were all dirty, but artfully so, the soot smudged here and there in ways that highlighted their appearance rather than muddying it. They all had a vacant, hollow expression in their eyes, like a cheerleader in physics class. Gorthander walked straight to the tavern, a large building with glass windows that would cost more than this entire village made in a year. D'Amico examined the storefronts as he passed, but he couldn't find a glassmaker's shop. They stepped inside, around cozy tables and across squeaky floorboards. They selected a table in the corner because that's what one did when entering a bar during an adventure. D'Amico gestured for Ladiana to sit in the actual corner because that was proper manners. Encyclopedia Brown had taught him that, and nothing good could come from doubting Encyclopedia Brown. He sat with his back to the room. You could only assume that he had a lot of ranks and hear noise. The barmaid bounced over and smiled down at their table. She had resembled a cheerleader, although D'Amico couldn't quite put his finger on exactly how. Was it the single pigtail? The anachronistic chewing gum? He somehow knew this poor woman was based on some real-world person at Carl's High School, and that she'd sleep with any person at this table, especially Latiana, at the slightest pass. D'Amico felt bad about his earlier cheerleader thoughts. It was one thing to be insulting to a stereotype, it was another to be confronted by an actual person. She wore a tan dress and a white apron, and her breast size was somewhere between outlandish and outright impossible. She must have worn an anti-gravity bra. Her eyes were hollow like the windows of a condemned house. This wasn't just the absence of a mind. There was no soul. She was a non-player character, a bit player in the world, run by the Game Master. He'd never seen such a clear indication. "'May I take your order?' she said in a voice that was seductive. That voice coming from under those eyes was creepy. Creepy like a little boy that never smiles, uses perfect grammar, and calls his parents Paul and Mary when those aren't their real names. "'I'll have an ale,' D'Amico said. Gorthander and Omar ordered the same. Ladiana ordered a wine, which they inexplicably kept in stock." Omar didn't hit on her. Evidently, role-playing a seduction with Carl was the creepiest thing of all. She started to walk away, but just then her eyes lit up. They came alive like the eyes at the end of the movie The Pit and the Pendulum, with horror. 
Yet that horror didn't touch the rest of her face. She flirted for several more moments, and no one else seemed to notice. Then she turned away, her eyes pleading, and went for the drinks. And why hadn't anyone else noticed? This was Carl's character, after all. This wouldn't have happened if Carl didn't want it to happen. Maybe he'd been the only one to make their spot skill check. Still, this seemed awfully subtle for Carl. As they sat there, a new person approached the table. D'Amico did have ranks and hear noise, obviously. A man approached, dressed in brown leggings and a green Robin Hood tunic. He wore no hat, but carried a sword and a strung bow, because in the world of role-playing, bows never lost their spring from being strung too long. May I sit with you? His face was open, friendly, and mildly attractive. He had salt and pepper hair. He was clean-shaven in a way that usually required an entire industrial base. But Miko didn't worry about shaving creams and manufactured razors. He was more interested in this new person who acted like a player character. By all means, D'Amico said, wondering how Carl had tricked someone else to the table. My name is Jerkind, the man said. Your dad lose a bet? D'Amico asked. He lost a great many bets, Jerkin said, and I had the misfortune of looking like him when I was born. Ah, D'Amico said. You want to join us on our next adventure? Nothing like that, Jerkin said. I just wanted to meet the man who'd made the barmaid's eyes light up like that. Is this some kind of a sick joke? D'Amico asked. The other people at the table looked confused. Not at all, Jerkin said. Despite the invitation, he hadn't sat down. I think I'll be on my way. He gave D'Amico a special wink, the kind of wink one shared with a close friend, a brother, just a little left of the one you might give to a man you were picking up at a bar. Then he walked away. Let's get out of here, D'Amico said. We haven't had our drinks yet, Omar whined. Yeah, Gorthunder said. Why leave so soon? You know Carl's giving us a job in this bar. Because that, D'Amico said, was creepy. Chapter 12 If you can read this, you're too close. Bob Defendi. The tavern smelled like a urine-soaked gym sock after it had passed through the digestive tract of a water buffalo. D'Amico hadn't noticed it at first. It kind of snuck up at you like a squad of Navy SEALs. Or worse, normal SEALs, the kind carrying clubs and out to prove that humans aren't the only creatures on the planet that like to wear a nice coat once in a while. Laliana, on the other hand, smelled like lilacs. The tavern rented bedrooms, conveniently enough. Omar had refused to leave and went to sleep first. Then Gorthander gave D'Amico and Ladiana a knowing glance and followed. For about five minutes, D'Amico and Ladiana sat in silence, sipping their drinks. And he felt comfortable. Normally, silences like this between a man and a woman became awkward, but D'Amico felt nothing like that. He enjoyed sitting with her. He enjoyed the smell of her, the way she regularly tucked an errant hair behind one ear. The presence of her filled the table with a sweet, easy feeling, and he found himself wishing he was wounded again, so he'd have to put his arm around her. The patrons had mostly cleared out. Only a couple of drunks remained. The owner stood behind a bar, staring vacantly into space, and barmaid Barbie flounced about, bending over and over again to pick up imaginary pieces of litter. D'Amico rolled his eyes and took another drink. "'Not your type?' Latiana asked. He glanced at her, catching her sly expression, then over at barmaid Barbie. At first, he could only see the horror in that poor woman's eyes. Then he shook it off and tried to make the movement into a shudder. That would be too much like masturbation. And rape, but he didn't say that. Ladiana smiled and sipped her wine. He'd passed some kind of a test. He made it a strict rule never to allow women to play games, except for the fun kind. In fact, he always made certain that he failed tests and made sure that the women knew it was on purpose. But Ladiana had caught him off guard with that one. And this wasn't the time to be on his game, no pun intended. What's your backstory? she asked after a time. D'Amico almost rerouted his drink through his nose. After swallowing, he chuckled. I don't know, he said. Ah, she said sagely, you're the one. Her eyes held a deeper meaning. Excuse me? D'Amico asked, not sure if he'd heard correctly. She appraised him, and he felt a delicious tension draw out in the silence. Mysterious parentage, you're the man with no past. D'Amico was about to tell her that he had a past, but had been snuffed out by the actions of a madman. But he didn't. He was the man with mysterious parentage. Carl had obviously designed the NPC he now inhabited, either as a mockery or as an homage to D'Amico's real self. But whatever backstory Carl had invented for D'Amico's in-game character, D'Amico didn't know it, and so he could only play coy. 
That made him the heart of the cliché, and he wondered if that had been Carl's plan all along, or if things had spiraled out of control for all of them. You? he asked. Oh, the usual sort of details, she said. Good home, made school at ten. Hogwarts, he asked. She smiled. Of course. And then you decided to become an adventurer. Oh, you don't find adventure, she said. Adventure finds you. She had a wry smile. She was playing to the old hackneyed lines on purpose. But how could adventure possibly find you, he asked. You don't seem the type to hang out in a tavern. I might surprise you. I doubt it, he said casually. I have you figured out. Oh, do you? I can read you like a game manual. And what do I say? Handle with care. She laughed and groaned, then got back into character. Then why aren't you? I don't like being told what to do. He found the bad movie dialogue delicious. Up until that last line, she might have been giving Carl a hard time, playing him for a laugh, but that last line. D'Amico couldn't be charming enough for it to show with Carl as a conduit, could he? She stared into his eyes, and he was considering whether to transition into a more teasing mode when she rose to her feet. He met her gaze casually, a smile creeping across his lips. I'm going to bed, she said. I have that effect on women. She leaned over to kiss him on the cheek, and he turned into it, meeting soft lips. It was amazing how soft. She lingered. When she pulled back, her eyes smiled down on him. Good night, she said. I know it is. She squinted at him as if trying to figure him out, then walked away. He watched her leave, but didn't follow. When she was gone, he collapsed onto the table. He took a deep breath and groaned. He stood and headed toward his own room, but he stopped to look at Barmaid Barbie. She stared at him, her smile vacuous, her head tilted to one side, her eyes searching in horror. He walked back to her, his heart full from the kiss, but aching in sympathy for this woman. She watched him approach and flipped her hair at him, her eyes still deeply disturbed. "'I don't know what it is,' he said. "'But you can fight it.' The barmaid looked at him, her eyes hardening now, her smile still vacuous. With what seemed like a supreme force of will, she nodded, the motion jerking and awkward. D'Amico understood so little of this, but he felt that somehow she'd won a personal victory. He hoped he'd had something to do with that. He walked away, stopping when he saw Latiana had come back down the stairs. She stood with her hands on her hips, her eyes narrowed, watching. He thought she'd gotten the wrong impression, but then she smiled and nodded before walking up the stairs. Damn it! He passed another test. He grinned and headed to his own room. It's none of your business whether or not he slept alone. Chapter 13 Where's my thesaurus? Bob Defendi. D'Amico's mind filled with dreams. This is typically the point in the novel where one of two things happen. Either I put in a dream I pass off as real life, tricking you into thinking something horrible is happening in a cheesy bait-and-switch, or else I toss out a dream full of deeper meanings and symbolism laying out the deeper, I need a better word, darker meanings of this entire narrative. This narrative has no deeper, damn it, darker meaning. During D'Amico's dream, he wandered through a palace made of corn chips, the tapestries and paintings woven from old report cards. The furniture was all naked women posed into living chairs, and in the background his drunken grandmother sang a torch song. Keep your opinions to yourself, Dr. Freud. Sleep had felt good, it felt right. It felt exactly how sleep was supposed to feel, all sleepy and restful and such, which wasn't surprising, he supposed. D'Amico had to inhabit a character of some kind, didn't he? Character in games and stories needed to sleep just like anyone else. The human characters, at any rate. So D'Amico had slept a solid night's sleep, although in the real world, Carl had probably said something like, You sleep that night. The next morning... That next morning, D'Amico woke alone, got dressed, and headed downstairs. Everyone else was gathered around the corner table, Gorthander working on a beer, Omar and Ladiana drinking juice. From the smell, the juice was about seven proof down the road to hard cider. I'm afraid it's too late. Latiana gave him a knowing look that probably had more to do with the night before than the current events. Omar scowled. What's that mean? It means my nose has given up on this tavern completely. Gorthander barked a laugh and fished a piece of bacon out of his beer, chewing on it absently. Latiana smiled a smile more knowing, good grief, than humorous. Omar just scowled. Oh, hell, I wrote the entire last couple chapters and forgot about Arithian. Arithian came down the stairs just then, and I planned that. Honest. He sat at the table, strumming his new magical mandolin, 
He sat, and his eyes darted about as if he were hiding something. There he, um, you know, sat. After a time, they rose from the table and moved to the front door. Barmaid Barbie waved at them as they walked across the room, and the tavern owner nodded in their direction. They almost made it outside. But an old man in a long, drab-colored robe appeared in the door. The robe was old and tattered. The man's head was bald and shiny, as if he polished it in a bowling alley. His beard hung long and tucked into his belt. It's said that the nose never stops growing. If that's true, this man was a thousand years old. Here we go, D'Amico said. He put a hand on Ladiana's shoulder, and she smiled knowingly. Oh, dear God. What do you want, old man? Omar asked. Doom! The old man shouted. Mm, you know, that didn't do it. Let's read it with more oomph. Doom! Uh, still not enough. Picture a crazy old hag pointing and bellowing in a bad fantasy film. Then crank up the volume until your ears bleed. Doom! Come on. Really frighten the dog. Doom! The neighbor's dog. Doom! That's the stuff. The tavern owner jumped. Barmaid Barbie gasped and covered her mouth with her hand. Pretty good, sir, Arithian said. Doom! The old man shouted again. Is this going to go on a while? D'Amico asked. Doom! The old man bellowed, shaking the rafters. I'm going to sit down, D'Amico said. Ladiana sat next to him, scooting her chair in close. Omar and Gorthander joined them. Really, grandfather, Arithian said. Doom! Oh, well, Arithian said, and took a seat. Doom! For this bar, the old man shouted, his voice creaking like the hips of a hundred grandmothers. Doom! For these people! Doom! For you all! Doom! For the entire world! Doom! I think I've seen this scene in a movie somewhere, D'Amico said. Princess Bride? Ladiana asked. No, that was Boo. The Tick? Spoon? Maybe... Doom! We better pay attention to him, D'Amico said. He's trying, the old man said. Yes, he is. He's trying, and he will find it. He will find it unless you stop him. He will find it unless you find it first. And where is this magical artifact? D'Amico asked, skipping several pages in the script. How do you know it's a magical artifact? Ladiana asked. It's always a magical artifact, D'Amico said. Blame Tolkien. Doom! Ah, oh, hell, I think I hit his reset button. Doom! For this village! Doom! For this nation! Doom! For every living thing! Doom! Who brings this doom, good sirrah? Arithian asked. Heraldoth? Oh, good grief. There's someone in this world named Heraldoth? D'Amico asked. He is the overlord. He rules the world. He rules the world, and now he's going to destroy it. Well, of course, D'Amico said. With a name like Heraldoth, he couldn't have had a very good childhood. He's seeking it! The old man wailed, pacing back and forth, wringing his hands. He smelled like a locker room after a marathon on the surface of the sun. He's looking and looking, but he hasn't found it! The old man's eyes rolled. He's seeking! What? D'Amico asked. Doom! The old man said. Omar ordered a beer. Doom! for the kiddies! Doom for the puppies! Doom for the babies and the mothers and the sisters! You think he's going to do the whole phylum? D'Amico asked. Doom! They were just getting around to lunch when the old man got to the point. By then, Omar and Gorthander compared their new axes, and D'Amico and Ladiana had moved in close and talked about their favorite films. The artifact is hidden, the old man said. Oh, here we go, D'Amico said, paying attention again. Gorthander and Omar didn't notice, so D'Amico said, Gorthander, convenient plot exposition man is getting to the point. It's hidden, and he's looking for it. Search beyond the swamp of despair. Search past the mountains of fell ruin. Search in the heart of darkness itself, the old man said. Is there a bus tour, D'Amico asked. <laughs> The old man shouted, then his eyes rolled back in his head, and he fell over, dead. The silence rang like a giant bell, the kind of bell that's big and, you know, bell-like. Hmm, Gorthander said. 
My ears hurt. D'Amico stood up. Shall we? We have to go past the swamp of fear or whatever. Omar and Gorthander looked at each other. Then Gorthander said, Sure, why not? They stood. Oh, good friends, I feel we are about to embark on a grand quest of darkness and honor, of nobility and tears, of Erythian said. Don't you start, D'Amico said. He offered Ladiana's hand, and she took it, putting her hand in his. They walked to the door, stepping over the convenient plot exposition man. The corpse's tongue lolled out. They stepped to the door. So? The world's going to be destroyed, huh? Gorthander asked. Yep, D'Amico said. Good thing we were in that bar. It is. Sounds like a good disaster to break on. It does. Chapter 14 Do you think they figured out the books all about clichés? Bob Defendi. Heraldoff built a crooked house, and in this crooked house he placed a crooked man, and for this crooked man he built a crooked room, and in this crooked room they did their crooked things. Raldolf could hear the screams as he reached the bottom of the dungeon of his fortress. The shouts wailed and rose on the still air, echoing through the halls, bouncing off rock after rock. It sounded like the screams themselves lived in the deep, narrow places of the castle. These were the very bowels of his domain, and Heraldoff the very colonoscopy weaving through, checking for cancer, thankful that he'd had a high clonic the other day to clean things up. Wow, that metaphor got away from me. But to finish it off, the problem was Heraldoff himself was the cancer. One can't find oneself by heading to the torture chamber. If more people knew that, there'd be a lot more discussion of bunnies and rainbows in history class. Heraldoff reached the last hall of his dungeon and threw open the door. The room was fifty feet on a side because, when Heraldoff enjoyed a good torture, he liked to stretch out. An assortment of racks made up the showcase, with iron maidens positioned along the walls. Chairs and strapped tables allowed victims to be secured. Shelf after shelf of screws and saws and knives and hooks lined the walls. There were ten victims in the room now, three being stretched and the rest strapped into chairs and tables. Most of them were unconscious, but one woman screamed and wailed in the rack closest to the door. If I come here so often, Heraldoff said, why did I put this room at the farthest corner of my fortress? My liege. The crooked man glanced up from his work, a bit of drool creeping out of the corner of his mouth, his eyes alight with joy and satisfaction. The satisfaction was just a little too sexual for Heraldoff's comfort. The crooked man had wispy white hair like uncolored cotton candy. His eyes had turned milky green with age, his face drawn tight and withered with years of hate. It was practically a double-blind case study proving that the blood of virgins had no good effect on the skin. Heraldoff shook his head. Never mind. What are these people in here for? You sent them here, Your Majesty. Heraldoff gestured impatiently. Yes, yes, I know. Assume I've forgotten. Well, this one, Your Majesty, wouldn't have sex with you. Heraldoff stared down at the woman, drawn and pale on the rack, and a strange thing happened. His stomach grew suddenly sick, twisting in his belly. He forced himself under control. Do you think that spurning my advances is cause for torture? He asked, trying to keep the quiver out of his voice. Your Majesty, I don't think you actually asked. The way I understand it, she just didn't offer. Really, fast enough. Heraldoff closed his eyes. He was an evil man. He prided himself on it. But this was ridiculous. This was one of his subjects. He had a nation to run. Evil was one thing, but this was just insane. Thank you, he said to the crooked man. Your Majesty. Heraldoff almost left, but instead walked over to the poor woman. Blood encrusted her lips, and her dress was torn and soiled. Blood had dried on her legs, too, and he didn't want to think about what depredations the torturer had visited on her. He leaned down and whispered into her ears, I think it's too late to save you. But if you have children, they will be dukes and duchesses. Then he straightened and considered the crooked man. I don't think I'll be needing your services any longer. For the whole day? The man asked hopefully. Forever. Heraldoff shielded the woman's eyes with his hand and took off his mask. Chapter 15 Travelogues are boring. Bob Defendi. Countrysides are inherently tedious. Sure, there are bandits. Often, there are monsters and ninjas and farmers chasing traveling salesmen. Occasionally, there's a tornado carrying off farmhouses, young girls, and small yapping dogs. But this is about all that ever happens in the countryside. But this is a fantasy adventure, so they must travel over land to get to the Swamp of Incontinence, or whatever I called it. Maybe there will be a fight along the way. It depends upon how Carl rolls on the random encounter tables. 
They walked down the road without wondering why a road led to the swamp of ill luck. Roads go places. There doesn't have to be a reason, and besides, D'Amico had long since stopped wondering about this stuff. Although, that collection of Star Wars action figure guns was still a bit of a conundrum. Conundrum is a great word. Anyway, they pushed down the road, and it was surrounded by trees and bushes. Occasionally, they wound through some hills. None of this was clear to D'Amico, because Carl wasn't giving out decent descriptions. Evidently, he hadn't spent a lot of time in the sun. They camped that night, and when they woke up the next morning, Gorthander made breakfast. D'Amico came out of his tent and watched the dwarf in confusion. "'Anything wrong?' he asked. "'Not much,' the dwarf said. "'Laliana said she was cooking this morning,' D'Amico said. "'Is she all right?' The dwarf shrugged. "'She called me a sexist asshole when I reminded her, and then stormed off into the woods.' D'Amico frowned. "'Strange.' "'Yeah, well, what are you going to do?' The dwarf pulled bacon out of the pan, dropping it into one of the five tankards of beer he'd set out. D'Amico had just started towards the woods when Ladiana came walking back toward her tent. She wore a foul expression, and somehow, inexplicably, a shock of her hair had turned white. She resembled Zoe McClellan a little less, too. Less wide-eyed ingenue, more Catherine Zeta-Jones. "'Are you all right?' D'Amico asked. "'Yeah,' she said, stopping and squinting at him as if she expected him to kick a kitten." He reached out and put a hand on her shoulder. Lottie, I... Hey! Don Juan de Gamer, no touchy! She shrugged his hand off and continued her trudge back to the tent. But we... He cut himself off. Gorthander could hear anything he said, and D'Amico wasn't the kind to kiss or anything else and tell. She was probably just in a bad mood. Maybe role-playing intimacy with Carl was too much for her. D'Amico shuddered. If he had to rely on people role-playing with Carl to get his genuine human contact, he had a very lonely time ahead. But he wasn't planning on staying long, couldn't stay long. At any moment, he could slip away in the real world. He'd been shot in the head. He couldn't expect to survive forever. And he missed his late bills and his crappy car and his life. He missed the deadlines and the barrages of email and all the things he'd hated about the real world. It had been his life. There might have been weeks when he nearly starved, but still his life. He walked to Gorthander. Maybe he'd play with Carl a little, make it seem like the man fished for compliments. Are you enjoying this adventure? Gorthander blinked at him a few times. Since D'Amico was in the game, Gorthander had to think he was a non-player character, and that meant that Carl was playing him at the table. That question, coming from Carl, would seem desperate. D'Amico could only hope the boy had passed it on. Uh, yeah, Gorthander said. I guess. Gorthander let the conversation drop, and D'Amico smiled at him not pressing things farther. He hoped he had caused a little awkwardness at the table. Even a feeble stab at Carl felt good. He walked away. I mean, Gorthander said, I came back this week, didn't I? D'Amico froze in place, his stomach plummeting, his limbs growing numb. He turned slowly to Gorthander and started to shiver, the implication of that statement roaring through his head. This week? This week? He tried the question casually, hoping Carl would pass it, phrasing it so it would seem like a natural thing for a GM to say. This is the second week we're playing, right? Yeah, yeah Gorthander, Omar, and Arithian said in perfect unison, though only one of them was outside their tents. The second week. A full week had passed since he'd been shot in the head. A week of him bleeding to death? A week of him in the trunk? No. By now, he had to be dead. Buried. And Carl had gotten away with it. Chapter 16. Death. Don't talk to me about death. Douglas Adams. No, wait, Bob Defendi. He was dead. He couldn't be dead. He had to be dead. No one survives for a whole week with a bullet in their head. No one. Dead. The word screamed in his mind like a thousand upset Trekkies. Dead. It rang and tolled and vibrated in his brain case. Dead. They'd have to drill a hole in his fantasy head to get it out. Dead. His legs collapsed underneath him. He crashed ass first into the grass. Dead. 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 All dead. He wanted to cry. He wanted to scream. He felt strangely hollow instead. In his mind, Laura Sangiacomo, her hair white, screamed, We are dead. And this is hell. And it was. This wasn't a delusion. 
This wasn't real. This wasn't any earthly thing. This was his punishment. No exit. Some day he'd meet the great horned one himself, Beelzebub, the hoary master of the underworld, the man in sensible hooves. He'd meet the great enemy's eye, and Amico would ask him what he'd done. He'd lived a good life, helped those who needed it, tried to make others laugh, never taken advantage of a woman, was nice to puppies and kittens, loved children and old people. Maybe he'd been a little scathing in his criticism from time to time, but it had always been funny. All's fair in love, war, and the cause of a good joke, right? Wrong. He was in hell. This was his entire existence. Clock in, clock out. The Department of Ironic Punishments owns your sorry white ass now. He scrambled to his feet, away from Gorthander. He thought the dwarf would follow him, but D'Amico saw someone standing in the woods about fifty feet away. Gorthander, D'Amico said. Company. Gorthander's axe rattled behind D'Amico, and he reached for his new sword. The man in the woods started to withdraw, but stepped out of the woods instead. It was Jerkind. You! D'Amico shouted. Jerkind moved out of the ambiguous underbrush. D'Amico walked over to meet him. You're following us, D'Amico said. I am, Jerkind said. D'Amico glanced over his shoulder at Gorthander, who shrugged. At least he's honest, Gorthander said. I want to talk to you, Jerkind said. All right, D'Amico said. Alone. Gorthander frowned and shook his head. D'Amico nodded back, and Gorthander shook his head again. D'Amico nodded more vigorously, and Gorthander shrugged and walked back to his breakfast beer. What? D'Amico asked. He'd rarely disliked another human being so much. Do you know who you are? Jerkind asked. D'Amico thought about that. Yes. Do you? You are the driving force. I see. He almost edged away from the man. I saw what you did to the barmaid. That was consensual. I'm not joking. Hmm. They stood near the edge of the clearing, putting the camp thirty feet behind them, a cluster of tents with a fire in the middle. A wispy column of smoke rose from the fire. A greasier column of smoke rose from each of the beers. D'Amico shuddered. He'd better cook tomorrow morning. So, what did I do to the barmaid? You gave her the gift of life. D'Amico looked at him sideways. I've been told I was good before, but honestly, I never touched the barmaid. You know what I mean. D'Amico shook his head. I'm afraid I don't. There's something about you that changes people. Jerkin's eyes were intense, penetrating. He leaned in as he talked. It creeped D'Amico out. I don't think I want to hear any more. D'Amico started to leave. You can't leave this world, Jerkin said. D'Amico stopped and glared at Jerkin. What was Carl playing at? No, Satan. What was Satan playing at? I don't know what you mean. You aren't from here, Jerkin said. D'Amico squinted at him. I'm from right around here. I'd show you on a map if you had one. Jerkin appraised D'Amico for what seemed like a long time. Then he said, Yesterday, I was nothing. I moved from whorehouse to whorehouse, and I never wondered why. Most men don't need a reason. I had no spark, no essence, no soul. Then yesterday, something happened. Where were you yesterday? In the Perilous Dungeon. And before that? The sound of a silenced gunshot, the sight of an acre of trunk. D'Amico had to shake off the images to answer. On the way to the Perilous Dungeon? I somehow doubt that. What are you saying? Yesterday, this world and everyone in it was dull lifeless. We had no spark. Then you showed up. I didn't understand until I saw you talking to the barmaid. I saw the effect you had on her. You're imagining things. D'Amico walked away, shaking slightly. The expression of horror in that girl's eyes haunted him. He couldn't be responsible for it. He was a game designer and didn't bring horror to people. Well, unless he designed a horror game. I'm not having this conversation. D'Amico called back over his shoulder. You're afraid, Jerkin shouted. Bug off, D'Amico shouted back. Me, her, how many people have you affected, Jerkin shouted. How many people, because you're here. What happens if you leave, if you take their lives with you? Isn't that murder? How many murders? We know of two. Is it ten? One hundred? How can you live with that? Ladiana stepped out of her tent, her brow furrowed, her face a scowl. Shut 
up, she shouted. It's too early in the morning. Stuff it, you shrew, Jerkin shouted. Did he touch you too? D'Amico spun in fury just in time to see a throwing axe appear in Jerkin's chest. Jerkin stumbled backwards, blood flowing out of the wound in a sheet, his eyes wide with horror and agony. He batted at the weapon several times spasmodically, then fell over dead. Well, that was unexpected, D'Amico said, facing Gorthander. He was annoying, Gorthander said. You killed him because he was annoying? D'Amico asked, not sure what to think. No, I killed him because he insulted the lady's honor. I enjoyed it because he was annoying. D'Amico shook his head. This was just a game, after all. No, hell, this was just hell, after all. The things Jerkin said, they were sheer fantasy. No one was coming alive. This was some trick of Carl's. Satan's! This was just somebody's trick! He wasn't going to sit here and let his killer or his tormentor play mind games with him. He might be dead. He might be in hell. But this might be a game, after all. Maybe he was still alive. Stranger things had happened. Either way, he had to keep fighting. Chapter 17 Just Use the Word Said, Bob Defendi They packed up and started down the road, heading toward the swamp of an ending toil. D'Amico didn't know what to think any longer, but he could feel the ground crumbling away beneath him like the argument of a flat earther. He stumbled and clawed and struggled to keep his head above the proverbial water, even as the sharks circled and checked their menus and bribed the maitre d'. Gorthander trudged along happily with his battle-axe over one shoulder, singing, Whistle While You Work. D'Amico followed, trying to understand anything that was going on. But those eyes, the eyes of Barmaid Barbie, kept haunting him. Could Jerkin be right? Not about giving life, that was ridiculous. But could he have caused that girl's distress somehow? He shook off those feelings. He needed to stay focused, to get... Back on his game, no pun intended. He moved up to where Ladiana marched at the head of the party. Feeling any better, he asked. Was that a PMS question, she retorted. D'Amico stopped and blinked a few times, then quickened his pace to catch up. Evidently he'd missed part of a conversation? D'Amico glared accusingly at Omar. What had they said to her before he'd woken up? No, he replied. I just thought you were feeling off this morning. She scowled at him. "'Keep it in your pants, leisure suit, Larry,' she growled. "'Good grief, woman, what's your problem?' he exclaimed. "'You're my problem, asshole,' she spat. "'What the hell is going on?' "'Great. Maybe I'll just get out of your damn life, then,' he insisted. "'Fine,' she ejaculated. "'Good riddance,' he asserted. This conversation was positively surreal. He stopped and let her stomp on ahead. Arithian walked by him, shaking his head. Omar walked by, whispering, "'Smooth move, Exlax. "'Who talked like that?' Gorthander came up last, and D'Amico fell in next to him. Gorthander shook his head and chuckled to himself. "'That not go well?' he inquired. D'Amico shook his head. "'We were doing so well yesterday,' he bemoaned. "'And now he hated her. "'She treated Omar like crap. "'She yelled at Gorthander three times while packing. "'She told Arithian to stick his mandolin up his ass. "'That one was kind of funny. "'But she was the only person here he could talk to.' And now she'd become this loathsome person. It just didn't make any sense. It was one thing to have a bad day, but to treat everyone so terribly? D'Amico felt alone. He could still talk to Gorthander, but that wasn't the same. He needed companionship, female companionship. He needed to feel like he had a real connection with someone. Like someone out there cared. And now, he hated her. Worse, she hated him. Gorthander just patted him on the shoulder but didn't say anything, which was probably a good thing, because the said bookisms were getting old, I assumed. Chapter 18. How do you spell of? No, really. You're kidding. That just looks wrong. Bob Defendi. His name was Longshad. Say it fast and it sounds like something out of the 2000 Florida election. He was the noble of legend, the noble of stories. When he was young, he bested a dragon and saved a handful of simple and ugly village virgins. Selfless. When he took over for his father, he gave the village mill to the villagers, allowing them to charge themselves the mulcher. When he was thirty, he was the first noble to stand up against Haraldolf and win. 
Reldoff denied him at every point, but the overlord kept his mask on throughout the whole meeting, so it was a moral victory. That same meeting, Reldoff fed his favorite ally to a cage full of rabid hamsters. But I digress. Longchad was a good and honorable man. I'd say that three times as well, but I sent your attention wandering. He stood on the balcony of his manor place and watched the village below. It was a good place, an honest place. The people there lived wholesome lives. Not even the pets had sex out of wedlock. It made the finest wool in the land, not to mention being the number one exporter of doggy-sized wedding tuxedos. He loved his people. They loved him. The town girls showed up at his door almost every day with bundles of flowers. His house smelled like the bathroom of your church organist, what the ass of a bee smelled like after a hard night of carousing. Even now the girls walked from house to house, chatting and talking. The boys nodded at them politely and played organized little games. The women cooked industriously inside. The men performed a field ballet using oxen and plows. Really, I wish you could see it. As he watched, the butler buttled about behind him. And then it hit. He didn't know it, but at that exact moment the invisible line between D'Amico and that artifact crossed through him. It was like having someone walk over your grave. In golf shoes. No, scratch that. It was like having someone walk over your naked genitalia. In golf shoes. Longshad blinked. Jeeves, he asked. Yes, yeah, sir. Bring Thelma to me. After a few heartbeats, Jeeves showed up at the side with Thelma. He stopped following his master's gaze. Longshad watched the village below with a subtle smile on his lips. How long have you been with me, Jeeves? Since you were nothing more than a bit of bad math in your father's head. He never could count to twenty-eight. Yes, and how are your brothers? Longshad ignored the question and watched the people below. Am I a sporting man? You told the dragon you were coming, sir. Indeed, he said. Jeeves, I have a new sport. Hand me Thelma. Jeeves slapped the heavy crossbow into the master's hand. Longshad slowly cranked it up. Meanwhile, Jeeves watched quietly, not judging, the butler's easy stare. How are your lungs? Longshad asked. Good, sir. Why do you ask? Because I'm a sporting man. Yell, run. Pardon me, sir? Yell it, Longshad said, taking a bead on the first of the girls. Chapter 19 I Stole a Joke in This Chapter from Night Court, Bob Defendi. So then the proctologist says, There's my thermometer. Where did I leave my pencil? They all stared at Gorthander. Then D'Amico groaned, and Arithian grunted. Ladiana didn't deign to answer. Omar frowned. I don't get it. You see, a proctologist is the kind of doctor that sticks things up your... Gorthander! D'Amico shouted. In front of them, about one hundred feet down the road, a bear had appeared. What is it? D'Amico asked. Wandering monster! Gorthander shouted, drawing his axe. Omar charged, frothing at the mouth. A Rithian started to strum a song about hibernation. The bear's head nodded, but it continued approaching. Watch out! A Rithian shouted and dropped a song. He's immune to sleep! D'Amico circled, trying to figure out how to backstab a bear. Meanwhile, Omar closed in, his axe in both hands, screaming a mighty battle cry. Well, tally-ho, but he tries. Omar's axe crashed into the bear's back, but bounced off. He must have rolled terrible damage. Gorthander swung in, and his axe bit home, spraying blood on the path and irritating the bear. Do you sit in the woods? Gorthander shouted. Do you sit in the woods? It isn't sit, Gorthander, D'Amico shouted as he circled. The dwarf needed some serious work on his trash talk. Omar attacked again, but the bear savaged him, claws tearing through armor. Omar stumbled away, favoring his belly as he fought two-handed, parrying like an extra in a production of Cyrano de Bergerac. D'Amico finally made it around back and jumped in, his sword high, aiming for that furry bit right in the middle of all those other furry bits. His sword cut deep, but not deeply enough. The bear reared, tossing D'Amico clear. Omar downed a healing potion. D'Amico couldn't make out how. Obviously, Carl had forgotten Omar was fighting two-handed. Then he hacked down with that axe again. The bear reeled from the blow and stumbled. Omar hit it again, and it stumbled farther. Omar finished with a final stroke. The Dow Jones finished up today, asshole, Gorthander said. Trash talk can't be subtle, Gort, D'Amico said, brushing himself off. Arithian let his mandolin fall limp, sweat glistening on his forehead, but Latiana hadn't done anything at all. D'Amico scowled. You couldn't have spared a spell there, princess? He'd had enough of her attitude. 
You all had it covered, she said haughtily like a high school heiress. That wasn't exactly an easy fight, D'Amico said. The thing went right through Omar's armor. It rolled a natural thirty, Omar said. I saw. I'm not wasting one of my spells on some random encounter, she said, pushing past him and starting down the road. D'Amico scowled. How dare this woman talk to him like they were some sort of servants? He stormed after her, shouting at her back, itching to throw a dagger at the fluttering cloth of her cloak. I'm talking to you, honey. Yeah. He said that to piss her off. Don't honey me, she said, not even looking back at him. I'm far too valuable a resource to be wasted on crap like that. But it's okay for Omar to waste a potion, D'Amico said, catching up and glaring at her from one side. I can't help it if he can't tank with a dam. I'm not even the healer. Not my problem. D'Amico reached out and grabbed her arm. He wanted to throw her over one knee and cut that lock off her head. Listen, skunk girl, this is a team. Get it? She spun on him, and her stare could cook a lobster. It seemed names were the way to get to her. He noted that for future arguments. Get away from me, she said, teeth clenched, one hand raised, glowing with power. D'Amico thought about a parting shot, but this was mutually assured destruction now. He spun on the ball of one foot and stormed back towards Gorthender. Dude, Gorthender said, it's only a game. They all thought that. None of them understood. None of them could understand. It was only a game to them. That meant he was alone. And did Miko even have a plan to get out anymore? He followed some vague hope that if he got to the end of the adventure, he'd somehow find a way out. How? Through the power of awesome? Still, he didn't have a better plan. There was no better plan. Go along and see what opportunities present themselves. Could he stop playing? Maybe, but when the story moved away from him, did the world just stop? He was an NPC in this game. If the player characters couldn't see a non-player character, he might not even exist. Maybe. No, he had to keep going. Get to the end. Win. But that was the real problem, the flaw in his plan. You couldn't win a role-playing game. The very concept was thrown as an insult at people who didn't understand the point of cooperative storytelling. There was no end. It kept going until people stopped playing or they started something new. What would happen if all the players stopped coming? If Mikey and Brian stopped being Gorthander and Omar, did everything stop? Did D'Amico go into stasis? Or did he cease to exist entirely? No. He had to stay with them. He had to keep the players coming back, despite Carl. It was his only hope. But things weren't improving. They got worse. Now even his dialogue sounded hackneyed. The fights felt contrived, the emotions shallow and without real motivation. And that scene where they fought the first time? Terrible! Was the world slowly unraveling around him? Or was he becoming more like it? Was he less and less real with every moment? Was he fading? Would he soon just be one more NPC in this terrible game? Was the world sucking the life out of him? Because that's what it felt like, and there was nothing he could do about it. Nothing except get out, but that was pointless. All of this planning and theorizing was pointless, because he must have died by now. So there was nowhere to get out to. Chapter 20 My God, It's Full of R's, Bob Defendi Haraldoff sat inside his dungeon of dungeons next to the torture room above the bladed oubliette just down the hall from the monster pens, behind the batting cages, right next to the bathroom. He sat, and he tried to figure out what was happening to him. He was evil. Yes, wait, let me check. No, nope, still evil. In fact, he was even more evil. Now he had movement and style and a splash of panache. Evil on the go. A sporty, no-nonsense kind of evil. The kind of evil that catches a quick cup of joe and a nibble of sushi on the way to the endowment of the latest Republican candidate. Not that I'm saying Republican candidates are evil. That's what backers are for. So, evil, but to what purpose? He still had one of the two artifacts. Still that. Still, there were minions, agents, provocateurs, even the occasional henchmen in the field, all searching for the second, more deadly artifact. Searching and searching. And when he found it, when he had it, then he would show them. Evil. Yes, he was still dedicated to evil. Don't get me wrong, still 100% behind the whole evil agenda. Hoorah, rah, go our team and all that. Love, love, love the evil. Give him an evil flag and he'd wave it. 
evil. You see, here was the thing, the real point, the absolute crux of the matter. You see, he wasn't actually sure if he put it in so many questions. You know, why? This wasn't a loss of faith or anything like that. Oh, no, hell forbid. He wasn't losing his will to be evil. He just wasn't exactly gaining it either. See, now that he thought about it, he couldn't remember becoming evil. He'd never sat down and made a list or anything practical like that, say with all the pros on the left side, like get to sleep until noon, and sex with horrified partners, and a face so beautiful it can strip the sea off of cat. He was sure the other column had very interesting points like torch-wielding villagers, constant assassination attempts, and no Christmas cards from mother. Actually, that first should probably go in the other column. Torch-wielding villagers made a reassuring popping sound when he took off his mask. He looked devastating by torchlight. He walked through the dungeon of dungeons and was amazed by how boring the room was. No furniture, no torture devices, just a pair of manacles strapped to the wall. You see, the point of prison, the real point, is boredom. That is the worst punishment of all. Actual torture nicely breaks up a day. No, the real enemies got to spend time here, where they were attended by magically appearing food and the air absorbed the sound of their screams. Just unrelieved stone and poor lighting forever. The strong ones lasted a month. But Heraldoff didn't use this room to shatter men's minds any longer. He realized that its reputation was far more powerful than its intended purpose. You see, not even the most insane guards would come near this place without orders. He touched a knob in the wall and a panel made of five stones swung to the side. All dungeons had to have a secret door, after all. It was in the evil manual and everything. Inside, he found the greatest of his treasures. A remote control, 74 pennies, five receipts, 12 women's phone numbers, a cat with a C because an at wasn't any use at all, and a cell phone headset. And, of course, the other artifact, the one I'm not allowed to mention. The greatest treasures of civilization. He could keep collecting them, always collecting them. Eventually, he might find one of every type of sock. But the artifact was the main missing item. There was a little pedestal in here with a beam of light shining down dramatically. That would be its home. With it, he could destroy the world. Hmm. It was just occurring to him, and sorry ever so much, but this didn't detract at all from the evil thing. It was just occurring to him that he couldn't figure out why he intended to destroy the world. After all, he lived here. He closed the panel quietly and shut the door to the Dungeon of Dungeons. There he sat, and he thought, and he puzzled. And there's nothing blatantly symbolic about that. Oh no, not at all. Chapter 21 Eternal life means never having to say you're sorry. Bob Defendi The next morning, D'Amico woke to the smell of bacon, not feeling half so morose. It was morning, and a new day meant a new chance. Maybe just a new chance to mock Carl, but still. He rolled onto one side, seeing Gorthander preparing breakfast. He fell back and stared at the sky. More beers, he asked. Alcoholism, Gorthander said. It's not a disease. It's a goal. Great. D'Amico climbed out of the blanket and stumbled into the woods. He was the only one in the party that ever seemed to need to go to the bathroom. He sniffed himself and winced. Or who needed to bathe. And don't get me started on the toilet paper situation. He opened his cod piece behind a tree and took a piss. Soon he leaned toward the tree, one hand on the trunk, experiencing the limitless bliss of an emptying bladder. D'Amico? D'Amico glanced over his shoulder. Jerkin stood in the woods about thirty feet off. D'Amico shook off and fastened his codpiece. Don't you know the most important guy rule? I'm afraid I don't, Jerkin said. Never talk to a man when he's holding his penis. I'll keep that in mind. D'Amico considered the man. Then he walked back toward camp. Didn't Gorthander kill you? One shot resurrection charm, Jerkin said dismissively. We need to talk. I don't feel like hearing anything you have to say. From the sounds, Jerkin trudged along behind him. I promise, no yelling. D'Amico stopped. He always tried to be a reasonable person. He looked the man up and down. Fine, talk. Jerkin stopped about twenty feet away and leaned against a tree. 
He wore the same clothes as before, but there was no tear from Gorthander's axe and no blood. Evidently, his clothes healed, too. "'You know something is happening, don't you?' Jerkin said. D'Amico wanted to hit him. Anything to not answer that question. Still, he forced himself to take a deep breath and nodded. "'I saw her eyes.' Jerkin nodded. "'I saw them, too. What are you going to do about it?' Two days ago, D'Amico could have answered that question. But now... "'I don't know.' "'What are you?' Jerkin said. "'A damned soul.' D'Amico said wryly. Jerkin frowned. I don't understand. D'Amico didn't know what to think. He didn't believe Carl was even involved anymore. I'm in hell. This is hell. This isn't hell, Jerkin said. You aren't living it. I am? D'Amico started to walk away again. His tone might have been condescending. You don't understand. This isn't what you expected, is it? Jerkin shouted after him. D'Amico stopped again. He closed his eyes. What? I don't know where you came from, or what you've done, but you're disappointed. D'Amico opened his eyes and stared off into the woods. What are you saying? I don't think you are the person you appear to be. Are you a god? Jerkin asked, his eyes frank. No. Do you come from someplace else? Yes. Are you making people come to life? Don't answer that. Don't answer that. Yes. Pause. Thank you for being honest. D'Amico looked down. This is a game. I didn't design it, but I've designed others like it. This isn't a game, Jerkin said. Fine, D'Amico said gently. You misunderstand, Jerkin said. I believe you if you say this is a game. I don't understand it, but I believe it. What I'm saying is, this isn't a game to me. This isn't a game to the barmaid. Most of all, this isn't a game to all of Heraldoff's victims. Maybe this man was right. Maybe this wasn't hell. But there were bigger issues. What if Jerkind was correct? He was the most real person D'Amico had met, realer than the other player characters, far realer than the non-player characters. What if what he was saying was true? And D'Amico had been killed. This world, this hell, this game, whatever it was, it was eating him alive, portioning his life out in tiny packets to everyone he met. It was destroying him, piece by piece. But he couldn't deny the reality of this any longer. He could try and try, but despite the ridiculousness of this world, it was real. He could feel it. He could taste it. He wasn't crazy. He knew it with the same inner reserve that kept him submitting ideas to companies for all those years, through all those rejections. He knew it with that same inner confidence that made him try despite failure and bad reviews and internet flames. He didn't get to where he was without a strong central core. He believed in himself, he believed in his mind, and he wasn't mad. It didn't matter if this was a game, or hell, or whatever. It wasn't all in his head. Dear God, whatever it was, this was real. Carl had shot him in the head, and there was no way out. It was silly to even think there was a way out. How could he do it? He didn't even know how he'd gotten in. Jerkin was right. It was affecting the people around him. Somehow, he brought life and free will to people, and if it was killing him, was that so bad? If this wasn't a game, and he saw someone who needed help, wouldn't he want to help them, even if it risked his life? How is this any different? If he'd only given Jerkind and Barmaid Barbie free will, a real existence, wouldn't that be enough to justify the risk? No more sulking. No more self-pity. Did it matter if he was dead? Did it matter to Jerkind? Did it matter to Barmaid Barbie? Let's go back to camp, D'Amico smiled. I'm sure Gorthander is dying to say hi. Chapter 22 What do you mean that last chapter wasn't funny either? Bob Defendi. Back at camp, Gorthander looked up and saw Jerkind. Didn't I kill you? Yeah, Jerkind said. Well, let that be a lesson to you. D'Amico was about to say something funny, honest, when he noticed Ladiana cooking breakfast. He frowned. You're cooking. She shot him a shy glance, blushed, and looked back down. D'Amico gave Gorthander a questioning shrug. She said beer wasn't a breakfast food, no matter how much bacon I put in it. The monster, D'Amico said. Ladiana blushed again. D'Amico opened his mouth to say something, but nothing came out. 
She changed again. She didn't resemble Catherine Zeta-Jones anymore, either. Now she looked more like Jennifer Love Hewitt. What was going on here? Uh, I'd worry about that later. Jerkind, meet everyone. Everyone, meet Jerkind. Jerkind, Latiana said as if she hadn't heard his name before. Yeah, his mother wanted to make sure he was the toughest kid coming out of elementary school. Then why didn't she name him Gaylord? Omar asked. Jerkind is going to be traveling with us for a while. Why? Omar asked. Moth to a flame, D'Amico said. Because I want to stop Haraldoff too, Jerkin said. All right, Omar said. But you aren't allowed to fight. You don't trust me? Jerkin asked. No, I don't. But more importantly, I ain't dividing experience points six ways. Claudiana served up a wonderful breakfast of eggs, Benedict, and maple bacon, and they all devoured it. You put ranks in craft cooking? Omar asked as he took a second helping of bacon. How does that help you level? Not everything is about going up levels, you git, Gorthander said. Some of us are role players, not role players. He made a die-rolling gesture movement. You saying I jerk off? Omar asked, misinterpreting the gesture. D'Amico rolled his eyes and smiled at Ladiana. Are you feeling better? Better than what? she mumbled. Her eyes darted up to him and back down. It didn't sound surly. It sounded like a genuine question. Better than yesterday? D'Amico said. I suppose, she said, her eyes darting to him again. Are you okay? he asked, frowning. I'm great. She said it like a bashful child reporting about her day at school. She was back, at least in part, and his heart swelled. He'd missed talking to her. He needed to talk to her. He needed to talk to people. Real people. As much as Jerkin seemed realer than the rest, he still didn't count. Maybe it was because part of D'Amico didn't trust him, or didn't trust that he was actually real. Or maybe it was just that they had no shared experience. But he needed Ladiana. So, we're friends? he asked. She didn't answer. Friends? he asked again. Her head dipped lower. She nodded. And it felt good, but there was still something wrong. Because this wasn't the angry Ladiana, but it wasn't the friendly, lovable one, either. She changed... But she hadn't changed back. She was a new, completely different person. What was going on here? Chapter 23 Puissant is a funny word. I think I'll use it in this chapter. Bob Defendi. Haraldoff stared at the ceiling, his eyes wide, his mind empty. Haraldoff wasn't just an evil man. He was a man of the world. He'd conquered nations. He ruled. He collected fine art. He made love to beautiful women. It was what an evil overlord did. It was in the job description and everything. He rolled over in the tremendous feather mattress, cozy under a great weight of furs, and looked at the woman sleeping next to him. She was beautiful. All his maids had to be beautiful. But there was something different about her. A glow of reflected light. The faint hint of movement as she breathed. He found a magnificent comfort here. A warmth, but more than that. The feeling of another body, a woman's body, under the covers with him. It had a sensation all its own. A strange confluence of the flesh, the heart, and, dear gods, the soul. Haraldoff stared at the ceiling. If he kept thinking like that, he'd lose all of his evil overlord cred. No, he had to stay strong. He had to keep pushing ahead. The second artifact, the destruction of the world, these were the things that meant something, not the affection of some nameless maid. Maids were nameless for a reason. It made it easier to call them things like honey and sweet cakes and boom boom. One didn't talk to a maid unless it was to tell her to take her clothes off. One certainly didn't care for a maid. They didn't have feelings. They were moving furniture. And yet, he wanted to take her in his arms and squeeze her. He wanted that so badly it made his heart hurt. No. There was something deeper here. Something stranger. He avoided the main issue like he avoided adventurers and vengeful peasant children and the occasional old woman. Old women gave him the heebie-jeebies, maybe because his grandmother used to play with him using a cheese grater and ten yards of black nylon cord. But he avoided the issue again. The real issue was he just had sex. He'd had sex almost every night of his life since he'd become Evil Overlord. Evil had its privileges. 
The problem was, this was the first time he remembered having sex. He could remember the before and the after of every other sex act he'd ever performed. But this was different. This time, he could remember the during. It was like, and he couldn't understand this, he'd just lost his virginity. But that was crazy. He'd lost his virginity at the age of 13 with his father's girlfriend, but that was beside the point. The point was, he couldn't remember that either. And so he had to fight all these strange emotions as if he'd never experienced a woman before, even though he knew that wasn't the case. He didn't know the reason, couldn't even guess the reason. There was no way for him to know that this was because he was becoming real, feeling things for himself for the first time. He didn't know Carl was a virgin, and that was why this was the first time he felt like he'd had sex. This was the first time he'd had sex. Really. And, uh... Puissant. Chapter 24 Good morning, Starshine. Bob Defendi. Not singing, as that would be a violation of U.S. copyright law. There are clichés, and there are comforts. The father going nuts over your Little League game is a cliché. The father holding you when you're hurt and crying is a comfort. The snotty cheerleader is a cliché. The snotty cheerleader floundering in math class while you get every answer correct is a comfort. Let's face it, we're people, not saints. So while it's a cliché that adventurers hang out in taverns, actually hanging out in a tavern is a comfort. It was a mid-sized village like a Viennese mountain town with large Tudor houses, roads that climbed and twisted through buildings, and the smell of hickory smoke. A two-wheeled hay cart blocked the road in front of them as a fat man with a leather apron beat a donkey with a whip. The donkey seemed more concerned with showing the man the power of a disobedient labor force than with the whip itself. D'Amico expected a bunch of strike-breakers wearing pinstripe suits and spats to appear wielding clubs. Evidently, Jimmy Hoffa had reincarnated as an ass. They squeezed by the donkey and down the street, up a steep, cobbled alley with hay and rushes littering the stones. Over the last doorway on the right hung a sign featuring an improbable act between a cow and a naked man. "'You think that's where minotaurs come from?' D'Amico asked. Ladiana blushed and bowed her head, but the other party members laughed. "'Hey, Brandon,' Gorthander said. He must have been talking to Carl in the real world. "'How come you're only charming when you roleplay D'Amico?' D'Amico stopped and stared at him. Then he looked at Ladiana. No wonder he was able to have real conversations with her. When Carl passed on what D'Amico said, it must sound like it came from an actual human being and not, well, Carl. Charm was all about lines and line delivery, after all. Carl must be able to pass on what he said exactly. He'd have to think about the implications of that. They pushed in through the heavy oaken door. There were some universal truths about taverns. They all smell slightly damp. Every one of them has at least one forehead-shaped dent in the bar, and when the front door opens, every patron cringes away from the light and squints. There wasn't a free table in the corner. D'Amico stopped suddenly, and the rest of the party crashed into him. "'Where are we going to sit?' Omar asked, his voice sounding lost. D'Amico took charge and sauntered over to a table in the middle of the room. He sat down and gestured for the rest to follow. One by one, they did. There was something different about this bar. The people laughed and talked. A barmaid dodged a playful pass from one of the patrons, balancing a tray full of mugs in one hand. Two kids dressed in dirty smocks of unbleached wool played something like jacks in the corner. This is strange, D'Amico said. What is? Gorthander asked, scanning the room. D'Amico didn't know how to explain to Gorthander that the people here were coming alive. Carl wouldn't pass the information along. He tried anyway, and two frustrating minutes later, Jerkin shrugged. I don't know why he doesn't understand, Jerkin said. It has to do with game logistics, D'Amico said. I don't understand that either, Jerkin said. Don't worry about it, D'Amico said. The barmaid was coming. Hi, she said, approaching the table. My name is Bolzig, and I'll be your barmaid tonight. Welcome to the Happy Cow. Bolzig? Omar asked. I created it with a computer name generator, D'Amico said, casually hoping Carl would repeat it without thinking. Omar and Gorthander both laughed, Arithian chuckled, and even Ladiana smiled. Carl was passing things on in the same tone and delivery as D'Amico, when he bothered to pass them on at all, at least. I don't get it, Jerkin said. 
I'm taking shots at Carl, D'Amico said. Only then did he remember he didn't know if he believed this was Carl's game anymore. He didn't know what he believed. Who's Carl? D'Amico didn't know how to explain that without saying Carl was God, so he smiled at barmaid Bullzig. She was far too pretty to be named Bullzig. She had the nicest blonde hair with dark roots. We'll all have ales except for the lady. She'll have wine. Lemonade, Ladiana said. Lemonade. Okay, barmaid Bullzig said. I'll be right back. She bounced off into the crowd. D'Amico frowned and jerkened. What do you make of this? You've affected these people. Without ever being here? D'Amico asked. Jerkin shrugged. I wasn't that nearby when you affected me. D'Amico nodded. He had felt something more like himself since Latiana had begun acting like a human being again. He hadn't been able to get her to talk, but just spending time with her bolstered his spirits, and she didn't seem to mind. She might not be talkative, but if anything, she seemed to enjoy it when he spent time with her again. But that didn't stop the drain. He could feel it more now, greater and greater with every person he met, sucking at his soul, devouring his energy, hungry, like an American kid. And it was killing him. He didn't want to die. He wanted to go on, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield, or any other Tennyson poem you might like to quote. These were real people. Real people doing real things. He wanted to be with them forever. To be one of them. To just live with them. To live, period. He could be happy here, if things were different. He was willing to accept it. Still, now he knew what he'd been missing. He smiled at Ladiana. She averted her gaze shyly. But she smiled back. Chapter 25 No quote this chapter. Deal with it. Bob Defendi. Doldrin wasn't the sharpest knife in the bandolier. You could tell by his name. Carl's greatest achievement in naming was a spider demon named Spydra. He required pre-written notes to talk his way out of a speeding ticket. He couldn't invent a reason to go to the bathroom. But we were talking about Doldrin. Doldrin was a Wainwright. He had started early in life drawing circles in the earth, putting training wheels on puppies. He only argued using circular reasoning. His greatest wish was to fulfill the circle of life by being eaten by a giant broccoli. That isn't how you spell broccoli. But Doldrin was illiterate, so he won't know the difference. Anyway, every day Doldrin went to work in a wide open room under his apartment. In it sat a perpetually unfinished wagon. He spent the entire day taking inherently long bushy things, trees for instance, and making them round. He worked with a saw, a chisel, and a plane because those were the only carpentry tools Carl knew. Shaving and sawing and hammering, with the chisel presumably, he would carve spokes, and then he would build hubs, and then he would shape the rim. When he was done, he would have the ultimate symbol of technology, the wheel. In a day, he could build a wheel. In a week, he could build eight. Daldron wasn't very good at counting, either. When he dropped a tool, it took triple redundancy computations to determine if he'd lost a toe. But he loved wheels. Did I mention that? Now, Daldron worked in this perfectly bare shop with an unfinished wagon he never touched, and the walls made of perfectly rectangular wooden planks. There sat a water barrel in one corner, brackish from lack of use, but there because all workshops needed a water barrel. If he had a wife, at the end of the day he would dip his head in the water in a manly fashion, throw back his hair in a cascade of droplets, and carry her off to bed. But he didn't have a wife. Or hair. His manhood wasn't drawing any gasps from the ladies either. But it was perfectly round. But I'm as on topic as an internet forum. At that moment, a moment fairly arbitrary because I never told you what Doldrin was doing, the line between D'Amico and the unmentionable artifact crossed over him. He looked up, startled. He examined the wheel. It was round, that was true. It had ten spokes. The rims were hard and smooth. They moved over the artificially level roads of Carl's world so perfectly their wagons wouldn't need shocks. He stared at it some more. It was made out of oak. He'd sanded it to a mirror finish. When he made a wheel, even untreated wood appeared lacquered. Oak. He wondered if that was the best wood for the job. He'd never thought of it before, but maybe a more flexible wood like pine might handle the wear of travel better. Maybe a metal band around the rim might keep it from splitting. Maybe these were bad ideas, but they were ideas. He'd never had an idea before. And maybe modeling the number of spokes off the number of his fingers wasn't the best idea ever. Maybe eight spokes would be better. It would certainly be easier to drill them in the right places. 
Maybe 12 would be good if 8 were too few. 12 was divisible by 4, 2, and 3, so modeling them on a round surface would at least be easier than figuring out the proper spacing for 5. Hmm. The questions puzzled him, mostly because he'd never thought of them before. These seemed to be the basic questions of his craft. He never even wondered whether he should be considering them. And for the first time in his life, he wondered about everything. Why hadn't he married? Did he really believe in Ralph, the porcelain god? It was said that everyone worshipped at the porcelain altar at some point in their lives, but did he really have faith? Most of all, did he like his life? He worked twelve hours a day in an unadorned room making circles. Circles. All day long, every day. He went out at night. He picked up whatever barmaid seemed handy. He took her home and made long, sweet love to her all night. He ate meals in a seedy dining hall. He never found love. He never affected the world. He never did anything of consequence at all. He just drew perfect circles all day long. You know, for kids. It was a hollow, empty life. He stared at the wheel he'd finished an hour ago, picked it up, rotated it slowly in the air. Why did he like this? What purpose did it serve? He spun it faster and faster. The math, previously beyond him, seemed obvious now. The way the thing could convert any force into movement, change the direction, shape the vector, it was amazing, really. Ingenious. Who had invented it? But it was a hollow life. All day working, sweating, all day grinding and shaping, all day measuring out one-fifth of an arc, chiseling out holes because he didn't have a drill, fitting and molding and creating. The wheel could take a force and amplify it. He could see that now. He held the thing in his arms and studied how far he had to move the outer edge to get a small turn from the axle. Mechanical advantage. In essence, each spoke operated as a lever. Amazing. But no love, no real home, no future, no past, just lonesome meals and meaningless sex. He made money, but he almost never spent it. He just used it to buy more materials when he needed to make more wheels. Why had he chosen it? Why did he live it? He needed more, didn't he? Every man needed more. He examined the unfinished wheel. Then his completed work. Suddenly, it hit him. The wheel amplified force through mechanical advantage, but it wasn't where the force came from. The wheel wasn't natural. All that advantage came from the work he did here, in this workshop. The wheel and axle weren't the lever. It wasn't them that moved the world. It was him. It was a hollow life. Or was it? <laughs> Either way, he loved it. But maybe tonight, after anonymous sex with a nameless barmaid, he might cuddle just a little. Chapter 26. No pun too low, no joke too old. Bob Defendi. So I got a question, D'Amico said as they walked through more featureless generic wilderness. If he walked around any given tree here, he was sure he'd find there were painted two-dimensional boards with rear supports and snickering stagehands. Shoot, Gorthander said. Omar, Arithian, Jerkin, and Ladiana just walked on in silence. You know those anti-piracy commercials they used to put in front of movies? You wouldn't steal a car, would you? Yeah, Gorthander asked. Notice how they never tell you whether the car has the latest Marvel movie playing inside? Yeah, Gorthander said. That's the problem with the world these days. It's all trick questions. They came over a rise just then, and Omar in the lead froze. Arithian stopped behind him, Ladiana to the left. Jerkin pulled up next. Finally, Gorthander D'Amico came up next to them. Ladies and gentlemen, Arithian said, the Swamp of Unknown Peril. Below them was a rather round depression in the surrounding hills. At the bottom was an even rounder peat bog about fifteen feet across with vapors rising up. It occasionally burst into flame for no reason. A small lizard basked half out of the milky water. Gnats swarmed in the air. I was rather expecting something more... impressive, D'Amico said. I was wondering how we were going to get around the swamp of ultimate doom, Gorthander said. Give me a running start, Jerkin said. I'll sail across on my belly. In the end, they walked around the swamp of unending agony. It added about five minutes to their trip. 
An hour later they came over the next ridge of hills and stared across a line of mountains some ten miles high, the walls near vertical cliffs. The peaks clawed at the sky with such wretched violence they developed their own weather systems. Hmm. Wow, Omar said. The mountains of fell ruin, I take it, D'Amico said. Damn, Jerkin said. Yeah, D'Amico said. Someone's seen one too many Middle Earth paintings. They dredged on, their hopes crushed. How are they going to cross mountains like that? How are they going to find the very heart of darkness if they had to scale ten vertical miles? Would there even be air at that altitude? They found a wide road cobbled in flat stones and began walking along it. Soon they passed a wagon, then another. When D'Amico crossed behind the wagons, people in them would begin talking animatedly. Some would argue. Some would begin passionately kissing. One wagon rolled off the road as all of its occupants just got up and walked away. As they got closer, they could see that the road led right up to the mountains. Soon they passed a sign. Funkin Wagnalls Memorial Turnpike. When you need to travel, go there on your Funkin Wagnalls. D'Amico rolled his eyes. At the end of the plains, the road curved up into foothills, then ended in a large opening. The sign above it said, Purple Worm Transalpine Tunnel. He certainly makes it easy, doesn't he? Jerkin said. Well, I suppose it's hard to be an evil overlord if all your tax collectors die of exposure on the way to your dread fortress. True, Gorthander said. True. It took a day to travel all the way through the tunnel, but there were lamps lit by some sort of natural gas, the kind that came out of a dwarf's ass from the smell. They camped that night at the halfway point, and Latiana curled up about five feet away from D'Amico when they went to sleep. When he woke up, they were sharing body warmth. They came down the mountains and across a fetid plain with standing infested water. Bugs swarmed and mosquitoes were thick enough to demand insect suffrage. Vents of flames climbed up into the air from geysers in the earth. He passed the same dead cow skeletons five times like he was in a speedy Gonzales cartoon. Some scenery, huh? he asked. Heraldoff had it shipped in from all over the world, Jerkin said. Even the mosquitoes? D'Amico asked. Especially the mosquitoes, Jerkin said. The things were so big that he expected one of them to hit him in the shoulder and say, Hey, boy, you're wearing my jacket. They were the kind of mosquitoes that could carry off a Shetland pony complete with the birthday party of ten-year-old rich girls. These mosquitoes needed special FAA permission just to settle down and have kids. As they traveled, a keep grew in the distance. It was big with jagged towers and crenulated walls. Spikes adorned the tops of the roofs and the peaks of the towers. Rusty stains covered the masonry. Bodies dangled from pikes. This is what Sleeping Beauty's castle would have looked like if Walt Disney had been Aleister Crowley, D'Amico said. That place certainly is a magic bullet cure for optimism, Gorthander said. As they approached, the people took on increasingly downtrodden expressions, as if it were some sort of law. They dragged their feet, their wagons swayed, the animals showed more and more rib. Eventually, they realized there was a village in the shadow of the fortress. They approached cautiously, skirting the village and heading for the side gate to the castle wall, trying to plan their next move. A large sign hung over the top of the gate, painted in what appeared to be human blood. The words, however, were clear. Heart of Darkness, bed and breakfast. We'd love to have you for dinner. I hate funny overlords, D'Amico said. They backed off and wandered away from the fortress, quiet and somber. Over the first hill they stopped and took a breath. Erythian peeked his head back over the top. The place is well defended, D'Amico said. I count one hundred or more guards overlapping fields of fire, loaded crossbows. Vigilant, Arithian said. So, what do we do? Gorthander asked. I say we beat feet, D'Amico said. What? From the tone in Gorthander's voice, D'Amico might have just said something vile about his mother. I'm not going in there, D'Amico said. Or if I am, I'm doing it alone without all you noisy bastards. That leaves us out of the adventure, Omar said. Yeah, that's why I say we just turn around and walk away, D'Amico said. But the adventure is right there, Omar said, whining a little. D'Amico rolled his eyes. I'm not going in there. It's a death trap. He almost said it was a stupid adventure, too, but he knew Carl wouldn't pass that along. If this really was real, which it wasn't, it didn't really matter. If he was in hell, he still had to play by the rules Lord Satan had set for him. So, do you have a better plan? Gorthander asked. I didn't come here just to eat Brian's Cheetos. Hey, Omar said as if he'd just noticed something in the real world. I say, we back off, stake the place out, and wait for Heraldoff to leave. Then we nab him and ransom him back to his people for the artifact. Gorthander smiled. I like it. Thinking outside the box. But the adventure is storming the castle, Omar said. Screw the adventure, D'Amico said. They both looked at him funny. 
Carl had it passed that on, of course. Or at least his eternal tormentor didn't want him to think Carl had. Fine, Omar said too loudly. The moment they moved away from the castle, the sound of the gate rose up behind them, then the sound of booted feet. D'Amico scouted ahead, found a grove of gnarled trees, and waved for them to follow. Once the others were inside, D'Amico hid them, his skills coming easily. Then he snuck out to the edge. Ten guards walked over a green hill of waving grass and straight toward him. He pulled back and waited for them to come into the grove, cursing Carl or Satan or whoever. Someone wasn't happy they had left the Heart of Darkness without sieging it. He waited until the guards tromped into the woods and then fell in behind them, stepping between the leaves and acorns without a sound. He raised his sword, inserting it between the shoulder blades of the rearmost guard. He caught the man, a hand over his mouth, and eased him to the ground, cutting his throat and moving on to the next one. Easy. Too easy. He just killed a man. Killed him. D'Amico stared down at the body, stunned. These were men. He'd killed a man. No, these were targets in a game, or they were his tormentor's tools. Either way, they weren't real. They weren't people. They were just things. He kept telling himself that, over and over again. The next one fell just as easily, if not more, and the next, and the next... Each time it didn't just become easier physically. Each time it became easier to convince himself they weren't humans. They were objects. A sociopath kills because he wants to. A psychopath kills because he doesn't believe you're real. No, officer, he was such a quiet young man, kept to himself. Of course, he played those evil devil games. D'Amico dropped two more before the guards walked straight to his people. Then another fell, sleeping to the ground. The remaining three turned, their faces screwed up in confusion, and then looked up in horror. Gorthander and Omar stormed out of their hiding places even as D'Amico attacked one more from behind. The bad guys fell in seconds. They moved on, sliding to the edge of the grove. D'Amico checked both ways and then headed to the right, down a valley of green fields of waving grass gone to seed. They made whispering movements as he walked, the rest of the party falling in behind him. He came to the end of a valley and peered around the corner. He could see a large, open area ringed by hills. The ground was muddy in places, dusty in others, the hills covered with bits of bare bushes and a single skeletal tree. It resembled a Bob Ross painting, if Bob had just discovered his wife had been boinking the producer. In the middle of the basin stood twenty guards. "'He's persistent,' D'Amico whispered. He held up a hand to stop the party and then led them up and over the ridge and down between hills to the east of the basin. They glided along, D'Amico a ghost, the rest clanking and clanging as they came. At the next ridge, D'Amico crawled up through the dirt and the mud, poking his head over the top. In front of him, grubs and cockroaches writhed and squirmed like people in the final scenes of Conan. He raised his head farther. Forty troops. Well, I'll be damned, he said. He led them back and around and through another valley, quiet like a cat, subtle like a Dennis Miller joke, unrelenting like Ariana Huffington. Mr. D'Amico, a voice said. Fifty guards surrounded them, appearing on the ridges as if from nowhere. They pointed down at the party with crossbows and alert expressions, great mountains of beef with weapons of pointy death. Behind them stood a man in tights, a doublet, and a mask. Damn it, D'Amico said. There would be no escape. It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter how clever he was. Carl would cheat if necessary, because in Carl's head there was one thing more important than skills and plans and characters' free will. The adventure said they were supposed to go to the castle. Chapter 27. No, really. Where's my thesaurus? Bob Defendi. If you wanted us to go to the fortress, Gorthander asked, why did you talk us into leaving? He sounded angry, almost petulant. D'Amico couldn't blame him. They thought that he was a non-player character, and so everything he said seemed to come from Carl. To have Carl railroad them into being captured right afterward, it had to seem like the cheesiest village in Asseldom. They sat in a ten-by-ten ten cell with benches along one wall. Ladiana sat in one corner. Her feet curled up under her, her forehead against the wall, folded in on herself like a turtle who just found out she'd flunked her SATs. Arithian sat next to her, humming because they'd taken his mandolin away. Gorthander sat next, his feet dangling in the air like a kid in a high chair. Omar stood in the corner, mainly because I'm tired of writing sat, growling and glaring at them angrily. Jerkin stood in another, his expression pensive, like an IRS auditor when you've told him that visiting Grandma was a business expense. D'Amico understood all their frustration. He wished he could say something that would make them feel better, but he was too scared. Most of them were in a game. 
he would experience everything as if it were real. It is real, Jerkin said as if reading his thoughts. D'Amico scoffed at the middle-aged man. Go buy some just for men, he said. Jerkin frowned, puzzled. He was the only one here who couldn't get that joke. The thing he didn't understand was why Carl had even passed his arguments on to the rest of the group in the first place. If he wanted them to go into the fortress, didn't he just have to not tell them anything D'Amico said? But then again, maybe D'Amico wasn't the only one who had to play by the rules. Maybe Carl had to pass certain things along. Everything D'Amico said in character, for instance. He passed along the out-of-character pop culture references, too, but he probably chose to pass those along because they made him seem wittier. Actually, maybe Carl didn't know what was going on any better than D'Amico did. Hmm, that was an interesting thought. It's all your fault we got into this mess, dwarf, Jerkin said. You were so loud every soldier in three miles must have heard you. D'Amico wanted to correct Jerkin, but he didn't see how. How did one explain to a person that their entire life was at risk, not due to anyone's actions, but because the adventure stated they had to be captured in Act Two? Jerkind was alive. He had free will. He couldn't possibly understand the portions of this that were still a game. D'Amico cursed and his frustration mounted. They were going to torture him. They always tortured you at this point in the story. Dwarf, are you listening to me? Jerkind asked. Stop acting like your name, D'Amico said. Come on, Dwarf. You got us into this mess. So now I'm going to get beaten to death and she's going to get raped and it's all your fault. Lad, Gorthander said, his voice growling with threat. Shut up. Jerkin's voice sounded wild, a bit out of control. Just a tinge of hysteria like a forty-year-old Star Wars geek when he comes home to find out his sister has let his nephew take all of his little man-dolls out of their original packaging. But that didn't scan. Jerkin wasn't acting right. Had he just changed personalities like Ladiana? Tomiko studied him, but didn't get any clues. "'You did this to us, you prick!' Jerkin shouted. "'That was really out of character.' "'Shut up, lad,' Gorthander said. What? Are you too stupid to keep up? Jerkind asked, his voice desperate. Was he claustrophobic? This was just a little bizarre. Gorthander slid off the bench and walked over to Jerkind. He stared up at the man from chest height, his beard quivering. Quietly, he said, Shut up, or I'll shut you up. Make me, Jerkind said, his voice almost sounded hopeful. Gorthander shrugged at the rest of the party as if to say, What are you going to do? And then he punched Jerkind in the throat. The man reached up, his face turning white, then red. He grasped his voice box and collapsed, choking. He was still flailing when D'Amico rolled his eyes at Gorthander. Did you have to kill him again? Technically, I'm just finishing the job from the first time, Gorthander said, climbing back onto his bench. D'Amico was really too worried to feel for Jerkind. That was just too strange for him to have any proper feelings about it. Was Carl taking over Jerkind? That didn't make any sense either. It was almost as if Jerkind was egging the dwarf on. Did he know something the rest of them didn't? We have to get out of here before the torture starts, D'Amico said, ignoring the wet sounds coming from near the ground. You think we can? Gorthander asked. I think the adventure says so. Chapter 28 Objects in this chapter are closer than they appear. Bob Defendi Listen carefully, and you might hear it. Step. 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 It's the sound of hard-soled boots on flagstones. The measured beat of doom. Step. 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 It's the sound the serial killer makes right after leaving the cutlery shop. It's the sound your pacemaker makes as the battery runs low. It's the sound of her father's feet on the stairs. It was headed this way, and D'Amico wasn't ready. D'Amico looked up from Jerkin's dead body and glanced at the rest of the party. Their faces were tight, Ladiana drawn more closely into a ball. He watched the door, and at that moment lost all his former confidence. This was it. He was going to be tortured and killed right now. This wasn't supposed to be happening. None of this was. Who would have ever thought you'd be shot in the head and things would go downhill from there? Oh, God. Please, he'd do anything. Anything. Step. Step. Stop. D'Amico watched the little window in the cell door, but it didn't open. Instead, a bar slipped, and he reached for the weapons he no longer had. The door opened. There, framed in the doorway, stood a man in tights. The tights were purple, and his codpiece bulged like he was an actor in a Ron Jeremy film. His doublet was blue and yellow silk, his mask white porcelain. His hair fell in immaculately oiled curls. 
Ah, he said. There you are. Haraldoff, D'Amico said. D'Amico, Haraldoff said back. And suddenly, D'Amico knew. He didn't know because of evidence or deduction. He didn't even know through some deep subconscious link to his character. He knew because he knew this story. He'd seen it far too many times. Now he was living it, but that didn't change anything. It was still the story. And this was what happened next. You two know each other? D'Amico asked. He's my brother, D'Amico said. It was so obvious. Every character in a game had to have a backstory. D'Amico's father in real life had died when he was young. But the character D'Amico in the game would have had his own history and his own fictional family. His father could well have been the former overlord, his brother now on the throne. That would make him the plucky adventurer out to right the wrongs for his family. It was so cliché it hurt to think about it, and that meant it was almost certainly true. Now that Heraldoff was here, the fear was gone. The man could do to him whatever he wanted. D'Amico would face it. Your mother named one of you D'Amico and the other one Heraldoff, Gorthunder said. Did she have a sense of humor? D'Amico shook his head and stared into the man's eyes. They were beautiful eyes, perfect eyes, but they were also D'Amico's eyes. Definitely his character's brother. This is when you come to taunt us, is it? D'Amico asked. An evil overlord needs to have fun too, Haraldoff said. You can come up with a better line than that, D'Amico said. How about these little diversions tickle my fancy? Haraldoff asked. There you go. That wasn't so hard, was it? D'Amico asked. Arithian looked up now. You're his brother, prithee. Would you like to tell the story, brother? Haraldoff asked. D'Amico hadn't written this story. It was all an invention of Carl. I'm sorry. This is Jim's fiat. I don't know it. Then allow me, Haraldoff said. When we were boys, our father set for us a destiny. My brother was to be evil overlord. I was to be his enforcer. But my brother forsook his duty and left our home. It was left to me to kill our father and take over. D'Amico was an only child in the real world. He didn't really know how to react to finding out the character he played in the game had a brother, so he just said, You killed our father. He couldn't find the gumption to feel bad about it. D'Amico's real father had died the day after his eighth birthday. Heart attack after an appendectomy. Evidently, he was fatherless in the in-game story as well. Indeed. Well, what are you going to do? D'Amico asked rhetorically. Raldoff didn't seem to get rhetoric because he said, Kill you. Everyone. You aren't going to torture us first, D'Amico asked. Father would be so disappointed. A little improv there. Well, a son can't follow entirely in his father's hobnailed boot prints. So, you just came here to gloat, D'Amico asked. Pretty much, Haraldoff said. You aren't very good at it. Haraldoff cleaned a bit of dust from his doublet. I'm in a transitional phase. Well, I hope that works out for you, D'Amico said. He walked up to his brother and put a hand on one shoulder. Brother? Yes, brother. Never let someone get this close to you. In a single move, D'Amico twisted Haraldoff around and caught him by his neck. He pulled the mask clear as his guards rushed from the door. They exploded, one after another, like giant balloons filled with red paint. Splash! 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 The scene made the end of the fury look like a Pokemon movie. When the guards stopped coming and blood dripped from every available surface, D'Amico bent his brother's struggling head forward in a move he was never allowed to do in high school wrestling. When Haraldoff went completely limp, D'Amico put the mask carefully back on and wrung the dead guard juice out of his clothing. How did you know to do that? Omar asked, staring at the gore with envious respect. He's my brother, D'Amico said. Obviously, D'Amico had no idea how any of this worked, since he just found out that the character was his brother five minutes ago. Still, he somehow knew that one. He knew it the same way he knew how to backstab. Maybe he'd seen it in games and recognized the trope. Maybe he'd just made a lower family skill check. Either way, it was done. The sound of guards rattled toward them. Let's get out of here, D'Amico said, and they ran through the door. They barely had time to gather weapons from the guards outside before sprinting down the hall. Chapter 29 The sword was the first point-and-click technology. Bob Defendi. Wait! Gorthander screamed as they stumbled down the hall. D'Amico checked both ways, past the gore dripping from the ceiling and down bleak, irregular hallways. An occasional torch cast the only light, creating shadows more than illuminating. Except for the links of loose chainmail from the dead guard still rolling along and spinning up tiny sprays of blood, the coast was clear. He glanced at Gorthander. What? What are we doing? D'Amico looked back and forth between the faces of the party members, confused. 
they appeared more confused. He was confused by their being confused. They were confused by his confusion about their being confused. He was, you know, never mind. We're running through a doorway. Gorthander examined the doorway as if to check this hypothesis. Why? he said. We're escaping from the dungeon of the evil overlord, D'Amico said. Guards are coming. But for a moment they weren't. Time must have stopped at the table. He thought about going back and killing Harald off now that he had a weapon, but that would just restart game time, wouldn't it? He watched the nearest turn in the dungeon hall. They could be close. Huh? Gorthander asked. Still no guards. This conversation was definitely taking place out of game time. Oh, Gorthander said. I remember that was a long time ago. That was thirty seconds ago, D'Amico said. No, it was four weeks, Gorthander said. I still don't remember, Omar said. I think you fell asleep at the end. I did not. Then you snore when you eat Cheetos. I occasionally rest my eyes at a game. I never snore. Oh, good grief, you always snore. Shut up, D'Amico said. They all fell silent. Why has it been four weeks? D'Amico continued. Dude, it was your fault. You were the one with the car problems, Gorthander said. D'Amico opened his mouth, then reconsidered and closed it again. They thought they were talking to Carl. He kept forgetting that. Carl's car hadn't worked. They'd missed four weeks? Dear God, he really was dead. This had to be hell. But what if it wasn't? What if he hadn't actually died, and this was still the game? What if Carl's mother was Kathy Banks from Misery? Could they have kept him alive for five or more weeks? Or maybe he was John Doe languishing in the hospital in a permanent coma. If he'd been in a coma for more than a month, what were the chances of ever waking up? No, he had to push on, one thing at a time. We have to get out of here. You, Gorthander said, pointing at D'Amico. Choir, he indicated the rest of them. And D'Amico heard the guards start approaching again. D'Amico cursed and shot off down the hall, still dripping blood like Carrie at the prom. He reached the bottom of the stairway, which led up and out, and climbed the stairs as quickly as a ghost, or at least a ghost with boots full of blood that made the nearby mice shudder and say, Ew! At the top, he found a guard and dispatched the man with a squishy backstab, then out and down a hall and running, running, have to get out now. He skidded to a halt at the edge of a large marble room. The place had vaulted ceilings and intricate frescoes. The walls were mirrors, the floor had a mirror finish, the balconies lined the top, and guards stood on either side. He didn't see how he could get across without sticking out like a burst blood bag on a snowbank. "'What do we do?' he whispered. "'Now you leave it to me,' Omar said, stepping out into the room. He pitched his voice to Carrie. "'Hey, assholes! Yeah, I mean you! We're escaping your fortress! What are you going to do about it?' Gorthander darted up past Amico, careful not to touch the big, blood-soaked man. Then the two tanks stood in the opening, their weapons drawn. D'Amico fell back to the rear, ready to guard their flank. "'You think that was a good idea?' he shouted. "'I think if I'm going to have to fight every guard within shouting distance, I don't want them picking the spot,' Omar said. For once, D'Amico could see his point. The guards descended in droves, great hulking droves, like cattle. It was open range in the ballroom, and Omar was the lunch special. That's not a mixed metaphor if you allow for cannibalism.' The guards thundered as they descended, each guard eight feet tall and wearing enough armor to explode an MRI machine. They carried great hacking blades that they wielded with the finesse of a fishmonger. It wasn't pretty, and things were awfully stinky, but if you gave them a clear shot, they only needed one swipe to remove a head. Omar did what he did best. He tanked. The job of the tank was to take obscene amounts of damage so he didn't die before the cleric could roll out his healing spells. It was the role-playing equivalent of when you got your first athletic cup in high school and ran around the locker room screaming, Kick me in the jimmies! Omar was beautiful, an indestructible work of art. He picked up one of the popped guard's weapons, and now he cut and thrust in that doorway, his armor taking hit after hit as he worked through the guard of one enemy, then another. Perry, Perry, hack, Perry, 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 hack, Perry. Brian had designed his character to do one thing, and they'd been trying to deny him this the entire game. Now it was his turn to shine. When someone needed to read a book, it was Ladiana's turn to be a Viking. When someone needed to play an instrument or thee and thou a woman into bed, it was Arithian's turn to be a Viking. When someone actually needed to be a Viking, it was Omar's turn. He made O.J. Simpson look like Pee Wee Herman. The rear reinforcements rushed in. 
D'Amico caught an incoming blade with his own, parrying and dancing and diving to one side, cutting up and under, and then there was another foe, another dodge, cut, parry, riposte. He didn't have time to think, to act. It was just spin and up and wrench and cut and drop and roll and back up and, dear God, parry, no, parry, parry, thrust, hack! A second guard fell, and a third, and a fourth. They were tough, but they weren't alive. They weren't desperate to survive, not like D'Amico. Sun Tzu said to put your men on dying ground, and they'd win. The bad guys weren't free-willed enough to realize they were on dying ground. But D'Amico was. Pain hurt. He wasn't having any more of it. He threw himself under one swing, thrusting his sword into an enemy's crotch and twisting. That was enough to get a reaction, and he had a hack halfway through the man's neck before he would stop screaming. They always asked for the butcher's bill in historical novels. When D'Amico saw the fountains of blood and gore, he understood why. This was beyond carnage. This was beyond slaughter. This was the kind of fight that coined the term bloodbath. No, a blood shower. Give him a rubber ducky and paste no skid stickies on the floor. Hack, thrust, spin, parry, twist, block, dodge. He didn't even see the swords anymore, just sensed the motions, felt the pain of exhaustion. Then the pain of a wound and a sudden ecstasy as it vanished. Gorthander must have been there, Johnny on the spot with the healing. And then, nothing. D'Amico cut a few times in midair, panicked and hacked at some of the bodies that lay on the ground, then spun at a noise. Ladiana watched, her face a mask of concern, pristine and clean and beautiful as he dripped more buckets of blood. Are you all right? The animal in him responded. He shook his head and tried to get control of himself again. Better. Let's try a transition here. No kill? Golf clap. Ah, uh, she said. Right. Though there was blood everywhere, the rest of the party was spotless. Completely clean. D'Amico growled again for good measure. A lead, Omar said, running into the ballroom. D'Amico had to stumble over piles of bodies to catch up. It looked like the field of Gettysburg had been fed through a mafia wood chipper. There was so much chum hanging from the chandeliers, D'Amico was afraid of sharks. Omar headed down a side hall and a few more twisting passages. They all burst into a huge boiler room where a metal tank sat flickering over a coal fire nestled in a hive of pipes. Omar hacked one pipe, then another, knocked a gauge off a valve, and fled through still another hall, the boiler rumbling behind D'Amico. "'You have ranks in lore boiler?' "'Just lucky,' Omar shouted. He was lucky again because he led them up a spiral staircase and onto a balcony. Below them, a leafy green tree of indeterminate species sat perfectly positioned between them and the outer wall. This was getting ridiculous. Omar jumped to the tree and worked his way down through the branches to the other side. Gorthander followed. D'Amico realized what was going on. Omar had read the adventure. D'Amico smiled. That crafty bastard. This didn't feel like a store-bought adventure, and D'Amico probably would have recognized something about it if it were. That meant Carl must be keeping notes. Omar had seen those notes somehow, maybe when Carl went to the bathroom or to get a drink. He'd planned their escape route, complete with blowing up the fortress. The boiler rumbled, then, just in case you hadn't figured that part out yet. It was D'Amico's turn, so he leaped into the tree and scrambled to the other side. He jumped to the wall and was about to go over, but Omar had run down the inner stairs to a little guard shack. Omar smashed the door open and ran back, his arms heavy with their confiscated gear. They redistributed their stuff and listened to the boiler make look-at-me noises. With one last prayer to Ralph the Porcelain God, they all vaulted from the walls of the fortress. A hay cart waited below. Omar might just have made changes to the adventure when he read it. They made it five hundred yards before the fortress exploded, sending a cloud of tic-tac soldiers into the air to fall like slim pickens across the plains. The boom washed over them. Hmm, D'Amico said. Good, my lord, that was truly a magnificent deed. I suppose it is traditional to blow up the fortress on your way out, D'Amico said. That must have killed the bastard. Don't mention it, Omar said. There's only one problem, D'Amico said. What? Omar asked. Weren't we supposed to get the artifact, D'Amico said? Omar frowned. Just to keep him from using it. Are you sure about that? D'Amico asked. No, Omar frowned more deeply. Would my friends, comrades in arms, we were supposed to seek the artifact here to find it before Heraldoff did. Ruthian smiled. It's in my notes. But Heraldoff was here, D'Amico said. 
it's a stupid adventure, Gorthander said. So if we were supposed to get it, D'Amico said, what were we supposed to do with it afterward? And was that important? Gorthander asked. And did we just blow it up? D'Amico said. Omar stepped aside as a four-hundred-pound meteor of higher dead muscle crashed to the ground. I hadn't thought of that. Chapter 30 All right, fine. The spear was the first point-and-click technology. Bob Defendi. Breathe. It's difficult. An effort of will, sucking through the teeth and mask, filled with dust and sand. It chokes the lungs, clogs the throat. He retches at the slimy mess it forms. Tries again. Breathe. This one is better. Stronger. He can begin asking questions like, Who am I? Where am I? And why am I licking dirt? Breathe. Heraldolf. His name was Heraldolf. He twitched violently, shuddered, and shook. He lay on the floor of fitted stone. His arm hurt. His head pounded. A thousand angry imps had taken up residence throughout his body and were clearly trying to build large ranch-style additions. Heraldolf coughed and rolled over. He seemed to lie in the remains of his guards. Sticky. Even an evil overlord felt a twinge of guilt at that. They hadn't done anything to deserve popping. One of them had even written poetry. He peeled himself off the ground and stood. His heart pounded as if a punk rock band performed in his head and screamed the lyrics to Liberty Burger, Hold the Government. Clouds of choking dust filled the air. He stumbled and accidentally kicked the body of one of the prisoners. Funny, he didn't remember killing any of them. Then he went out the door, stumbling through the halls, the flickering bands of orange torchlight painting angled rays in the clouds, dancing and seeking like a thousand sails at a thousand used car lots. He reached the stairs and tried to climb, only to find them clogged with stone and debris of shattered rafters. He stumbled back down, claimed a torch, and headed deeper into the dungeons. He wouldn't have been a decent evil overlord without a few escape tunnels, but he also needed the artifact. He headed toward the dungeon of dungeons, and when he arrived, he opened the secret door. He gathered the artifact and other treasures and filled his pouch with them. Then he stumbled toward the nearest exit. By the time he made it to the surface, he regained much of his strength. He reached up and felt his mask. The left half had shattered, so he peeked carefully around the corner before leaving. The tunnel exited into a beautiful forest glade with tall, majestic oaks twisted like a slave's back with little white flowers gathering in clumps around the bases. For a moment, nothing happened. Then six squirrels exploded, dousing the glade in blood, acorns, teeth, and fluffy tails. Damn, he'd have to do something about the mask situation. And in the past, wasn't it only their eyes that exploded? His power... His curse had evolved somehow. Had he become more beautiful? If so, why? The glade was dry, but squirrel blood made for decent mud, so he found the wettest patch and slathered it on the exposed portions of his face. He started through the trees, finding hope in the fact that no more wildlife airbursts went off above him. Finally, he reached the edge of the woods and examined the remains of his fortress. The walls still stood, but the central building had exploded, transforming the structure into a giant crater. Smoke and steam rose from the ruins, changing the sun into thin gray light. Why do they always blow up my damned fortresses? The village escaped unscathed. His men stumbled around, walking wounded, cradling broken limbs and torn flesh. He could hear the moaning from here. A little round form in furs came hobbling toward him, his bald head shining in the dim light. Over bare patches of earth and muddy grass he moved, more like rodent than man. "'Your Majesty!' he cried. "'Not Beaver,' Heraldolf said with a nod. "'Your Majesty, I'm so glad you're alive!' "'Not as glad as I am,' Heraldolf said. "'Not Beaver laughed uproariously. Heraldolf smiled. His ass could use a good kissing once in a while. It kept the skin young. "'What's our status, Not Beaver?' Heraldolf asked. "'Fetz is dead, Your Majesty.' "'Who the hell is Fetz?' "'I believe you called him Legs, Your Majesty.' "'Oh, right. That's too bad. I kind of liked Legs.' Your men are injured, your counselors scattered. I can get more counselors, he said. It wasn't a skilled position. How hard was it to agree with him, after all? Not Beaver was the only one he could trust with a chamber pot and a secret. You're injured, Not Beaver. A trifle, your majesty. You should have a healer look at that, he said. I don't see how that would help, your majesty. Perhaps said healer could treat it just a little while they were at it. I'm afraid I can only afford them to do the looking. Go see a healer, Heraldolf said. I'll pay. Not Beaver gasped, astonished. 
You could tell by the way his mouth opened and flies flew inside. This generosity is too much, Your Majesty. It's not generosity, Raldoff said. It's an idea I've been kicking around. Have all the men go to the healer. Everyone. When they ask who's paying, tell them I'm starting a new policy. What policy is that? It's called a medical plan. Chapter 31 It's Not It's It's Not It's Bob Defendi D'Amico scowled as they crossed the next hill. The grass here lay beaten down, covered in mud. A single elm stood on the top of the hill. One shell-shocked squirrel stared down at them, guarding an acorn as if it were the crown jewel of squirreldom. "'Is it just me, or are the descriptions of this place getting more detailed?' he asked. "'It's just you,' Gorthander said. They stood over a valley of flowing green grass and red-buried bushes. Along the bottom, the stream snaked, dark and brilliant white, and the contrast of the reflecting sunlight, waving and shimmering as it flowed. D'Amico shook his head. "'I tell you, these descriptions are getting better.' "'Stop flattering yourself.' They thought that Carl was fishing for compliments again. Oh, well. Maybe Carl had gone on a nature hike or something. My dear comrades, we still don't know what we're doing. What shall be our next leg of this grand adventure? Arithian said. Find something, Omar said. Kill it. Repeat as necessary. Until what? Gorthunder asked. I don't understand the question, Omar said. D'Amico flopped down on the crest of the hill, the grass soft, the earth loamy. He pulled up his knees and rested his wrists on them. The winds blew, the smell of green flowed on the air. I think we should start asking around, D'Amico said. For what? Gorthander asked. He flopped down next to D'Amico with a rattling sound. Erythian walked down the hill a bit in front of them. Laliana folded up gracefully opposite the dwarf. I don't know, D'Amico said. The gusts whistled gently along the top of the hill, blowing across the sweat and blood that kicked D'Amico. So this is what blowing the stink off you meant. A roar sounded in the distance, and a half-dozen orcs appeared in the middle of the open hillside, already in a charge. They didn't step out of hiding places. They just appeared. Carl needs to study the spirit of the encounter distance rules, D'Amico said. I didn't catch that, Gorthander said. Never mind, D'Amico said, scrambling to his feet as the orcs charged. Omar blasted past, his axe out as he roared down the hill. Arithian backpedaled, and Gorthander rushed in with a shrug. D'Amico charged. Omar crashed into the first two and Gorthander the next two, each parrying blows and shouting. D'Amico sprinted toward the last one, his sword still in its scabbard. The orc's great green head tilted to one side, perplexed as it sucked on its tusks. It drew back its sword for a hack at his midriff. D'Amico leaped, placing a hand on each of its shoulders, flipping into the air, tucking into a ball. The orc's sword swung through where he had been a moment before, the rotation of his shoulders adding a twist to D'Amico's flip. He landed with an easy movement facing the orc's back and drew his sword. He hacked the thing down before it could react. It gurgled in a spray of blood. Gorthander's first orc dropped next to the body of Omar's. A pulse of three white lights shot over Omar's shoulder, dropping an orc at the same time a dagger appeared in the throat of the last one. D'Amico relaxed and cleaned his sword. Arithian collected his dagger. Ladiana lowered her hands, the light from her spell still fading. The wandering monsters aren't very difficult, Gorthander said. D'Amico shrugged and decided not to try to explain the demographics that went into random encounter charts. Carl probably wouldn't pass the information along anyway. What were we talking about? Gorthander asked as Omar tossed the orcs for treasure. They thumped when they landed. Obviously, Brian hadn't gotten his intention across to Carl. That was a nice little flip you did there, Gorthander said. I've been putting ranks in tumble, D'Amico said, assuming it was true. Then a thought hit him. It had nothing to do with the matters at hand. Brian, Gorthander said to Omar, do you have ranks in tumble? I don't know, Omar said. Gorthander sounded puzzled. Check your character sheet. D'Amico ignored the two as a thought took hold and blossomed into an idea. I spilled a Mountain Dew on it, Omar said. So you're in a state of flux, Gorthander said. D'Amico smiled. I'll respend my points before next week, Omar said. No. D'Amico was sure about it. He studied his new idea from every angle. It made sense. I know what we ask, D'Amico said. Everyone looked at him. Huh? Omar said. When we ask around, D'Amico said. We ask where Heraldoff went, and if he has the artifact, where he might have carried it. Omar and Gorthander exchanged glances. Arithian tilted his head to one side. Ladiana smiled as if she understood. Heraldoff's dead, Gorthander said. No. And how do you know that? Gorthander asked. Because I don't feel any tougher. Gorthander and Omar exchanged glances again. I don't understand, Omar said. If we'd killed Heraldoff and destroyed the artifact, for good or bad, 
The adventure would be over, right? D'Amico asked. How do you know it isn't? Omar asked. Because when the adventure ends, we get experience points to spend, D'Amico said with a smile. I haven't gone up a skill level. Omar nodded, his eyes lighting up. I haven't leveled either. Garthander smiled. Well, I'll be damned. Chapter 32 This Page Intentionally Left Blank Bob Defendi The inn had a large central room with a huge fire pit in the center, producing smoke that flowed up through a round hole in the roof. Torches lined the walls. Heavy wooden tables sat throughout, shimmering with spilled beer and dust. On the benches, patrons laughed, shouted, and generally stunk up the joint. Barmaids with low-cut Swiss mist dresses worked the crowd, smiling in their pigtails and dodging the grabs and gooses. Gorthander snored quietly on his bench, no doubt frightening entire ecosystems of beard lice. Erythian had already vanished with a barmaid on each arm. Omar had gone to bed. D'Amico sat staring into his beer. Laliana next to him. Actually next to him. She wasn't even hunching over. That was pretty amazing, she said. D'Amico smiled at her. She met his eyes for the first time since the evil Ladiana, as he thought of her, had shown up. They were lovely eyes, expressive. What was? he asked. The whole escape from the dungeon thing, he shrugged. It was pretty old fare. Now you're just being humble. Omar did most of it, he said. Yeah, she smiled slyly. That's how I remember it. She was talking to Carl in the real world. Was she buttering him up, or was this really in character? Maybe she wanted a new staff. The silence drew out between him, and D'Amico decided it was too early to tell. Instead, he watched the barmaids, the tavern patrons, and marveled at how alive they were. He wanted to talk to Ladiana about it, he wanted to talk to anyone about it, but the only one with whom he could have a real conversation without Carl interfering had been jerkined. He felt alone. His chest tightened and his heart ached. "'What are you thinking?' she asked. He held her gaze before she broke it. "'I don't know what to do next,' he said. I mean, ask around, yes, but beyond that, I have no idea. You'll figure something out, she said. Yeah, he said. They sat in silence for a time longer. Laniana stood. I'm going to bed. She cast one smile at him over her shoulder and walked away from the table. Wait, he said. She stopped. She didn't face him. D'Amico stood behind her and approached. She swayed back toward him slightly, and he turned her around. She stared up into his eyes, her own full of implied promises. He leaned over and kissed her. He pulled away reluctantly, then reached up and cupped her face in both hands. When she looked away, he turned her back and gave her a gentle nudge. She walked up the stairs to her room. He didn't follow her. Instead, he went back to the table and sipped at his ale. He wouldn't follow her tonight. He didn't know what happened last time, but he was afraid he'd pushed her too fast, that the abrupt mood changes were his fault. He would move slowly this time. Back to the kiss, and no further. Give her time to get used to it. Make sure she didn't regret each step along the way. The fact that she was willing to role-play this with Carl was amazing enough as it is. He still hadn't figured out quite how that worked. Did this scene play out at the table like Gorthunder had hinted at earlier with his comment about Carl being charming? Or did Carl just say something like, D'Amico makes a pass at you, and she reply with, Okay, I catch it. Was this all just a game reflection of an abstract conversation, or was it something more? Would he ever really know? He watched the tavern patrons. Three men played a game with bones, laughing and slapping the table with every throw. Two barmaids giggled by the door, leaning in and pointing at a big, grizzled man who drank in silence, until one of them pushed the other toward him. A dog worried a rat in one corner. These people were alive, and it was because of him. In the face of that, did he really need anything more? He still felt weaker, but was it so much to sacrifice for this? He had Ladiana in her own way and Gorthander and Erythian. God help him, he even had Omar. He might have died in the real world. He might be in ICU at the U of U hospital. He might even have been in some hole in Carl's basement. At least he couldn't put the lotion in the basket. That would show the bastard. No, none of that mattered. He was here, and for the first time since he'd come here, he was happy. Too happy to worry that he was probably killing himself with every person he brought to life. He watched them, and he smiled. Chapter 33 This chapter contains 5% post-consumer recycled material. Bob Defendi 
D'Amico and the party left the inn the next morning, walking out into streets of earth and straw. A four-year-old girl in a dirty brown smock led an ox down the road, forcing them to stand to one side. They pressed against the splintering lumber of one of the houses, and when the ox passed, stepped out into the throngs of people and beasts. They headed toward the edge of the city until they passed the last house. "'Where are we going?' Omar asked. "'I'll figure something out,' D'Amico said, smiling at Laniana. "'D'Amico!' a voice shouted in the distance. D'Amico stared down the road, and Gorthander groaned. D'Amico shared a glance with Ladiana and then raised his voice and said, "'Jerkind!' Jerkin carried a sword that didn't fit his scabbard, balancing it on one shoulder as he traipsed down the road like Andy of Mayberry. If you whistle while he walks, it might take you back. D'Amico! Jerkin cried again and jogged until he met them, his middle-aged brows sweating with the effort. D'Amico smiled despite himself. You died? Again? One-shot resurrection charm, Jerkin said, holding up a bobble on a leather thong. I thought you already used that. I had more than one, Jerkin said dismissively. "'Greetings, aged master,' Arithian bowed. "'It's good to see you escape from the depredations of the foul dungeon. "'What's up?' "'He probably came for his sword,' D'Amico said to Omar. "'Oh,' Omar said, pulling it from where he'd strapped it to his pack. "'He tossed it to Jerkin, who caught it and sheathed it before tossing the other sword to Omar, "'who unslung his pack and strapped the sword in place. "'That made five major weapons by a cursory count. "'There's another thing, of course,' Jerkin said. D'Amico nodded. "'Hurled off. He was gone when I came around.' "'You knew he had come to the cell?' Arithian asked. "'It took me a long time to die.' "'Sorry about that,' Gorthander muttered, looking away. D'Amico squinted suspiciously. Jerkin hadn't moved or gurgled during the visit. If he was still alive, had he been playing dead on purpose? That whole scene still seemed contrived. "'Anyway, I think he's still trying to get the artifact,' Jerkin said. "'He's doubled his searchers. He's scouring the countryside.' "'So he hasn't found it yet,' D'Amico said. "'Don't know why we were supposed to look in his fortress for something he hadn't found.' "'I told you,' Gorthander said. "'It's a stupid adventure. "'But now that he's got more men looking, he'll find it sooner,' D'Amico said. "'And destroy the world,' Jerkin said. "'What exactly does this artifact do?' Arithian asked. "'Privy,' he added as an afterthought. "'It allows the wielder to change reality,' Jerkin said. "'With it, he could unravel this world.' D'Amico went cold. Pieces fell into place. The artifact, it could change reality. It could destroy the world. A world he had once hated a world in which he'd found peace and filled with people he'd given life. A world in which he'd been trapped. He hadn't seen it because it was such a well-worn trope. Of course the villain was going to destroy the world. That's what villains did. It was one of the oldest plots in gaming. The world is going to be destroyed. The ultimate threat. An easy way for the GM to make it seem like there's a lot at stake. No trouble for him. If the bad guy won, you just start a new game next week. The artifact. The world. It all came together now. D'Amico's legs grew shaky, and he stumbled, falling to the dusty road. Ladiana rushed to his side. Jerkin watched him, confused. But D'Amico's head swam, his gut plummeted. The angels of his better nature gave up and flew off to have a good lie down somewhere. His hands shook. He vomited into the ditch. D'Amico, Ladiana's voice filled with concern, are you all right? Better to ask if a grieving widow was all right. Better to ask if the orphan child was all right. All right. He was so far beyond all right, the light from all right dopplered into deep maroon. All right. I'm fine, he wheezed. How could he be all right? He figured it out. He didn't know how he knew, but he knew. He knew with the same certainty one knows his spouse is cheating on him. He knew. He understood. It all made perfect sense. All he had to do to escape this world was let Haraldoff win. He could get out, escape this place. If only he were willing to destroy it. It and all those people he'd somehow brought to life. He was still alive out there. He could feel that now. His soul would return to his body. He would regain strength. He hadn't died yet. He'd get out of here. He'd recover from the coma. He'd get his life back. And all he had to do was let everyone die. Chapter 34 not for internal consumption, Bob Defendi. Her name was Gravelon. You should be used to it by now. Honey, her husband shouted, I'm home. It's the kind of line we hear every day, if we watch Nick at Night or TV Land. The kind of fifties home life that only exists if you're a TV actor or stoned on quaaludes. Or a TV actor stoned on quaaludes. She walked out of the kitchen and into the house's main room. 
Benches and ladder-back chairs surrounded the main floor, the entire place decorated in a suitably pseudo-medieval style. This was a fantasy world, after all. Dust covered every surface because Gravelon's method of cleaning was to sweep the room with a glance. She didn't even leave the shutters open. Her husband probably had a name, but she'd replaced it long ago with terms of endearment. Her favorite was Worm. Worm, she said. We did well at the smithy today, he said brightly. She couldn't stand him. He was like that little piece of popcorn stuck between tooth and gum. He was the person that speeds up the moment you switch on your blinker. The ingrown hair in the anus of humanity. I'm sure you did your putrid best, you son of a bitch, she said. Now, make me dinner. He looked like he was going to try to argue with her, the pusillanimous little bug. She would have to make him pay tonight. And she didn't feel the line between D'Amico and the artifact. She didn't feel it because it didn't pass over her. It passed over her husband. What did you say? His eyes lit up in a way that she'd never seen before. I said, make me dinner, you son of a bitch. And he smiled. That was strange. Yes, dear, he said. And then clean the house. Yes, dear. Stranger still. And then do the laundry. His voice quivered with pleasure. Yes, dear. What was going on with him? And then a thought hit her. Come here, worm. He stepped close. On your knees. He fell to his knees. And she smiled, too. Chapter 35 This quote was brought to you by the Emergency Broadcast System. If this had been an actual quote... Wait, what? Bob Defendi. The new mask didn't fit like a glove, but it fit like a mask. Heraldoff stood on the top of the hill, watching one of his villages... The peasants swarmed out of the place like cockroaches in your college apartment. Well, maybe they didn't swarm. They trudged. But the whips helped. A vast swamp lay to the north of a village, and the peasants moved into it now. They carried shovels and baskets. They searched amid bugs that sounded like a fleet of zeros swarming in on Pearl. They seem lethargic, not Beaver, Haraldov said. He didn't bother to check if not Beaver was there. They are, your majesty, Not Beaver said, magically at his elbow. Not Beaver was everywhere, like grass, or opinions, or reality shows. Why do you think they're like that? I don't know, your majesty. Do you think they're trying to foil my evil plan? You haven't told them your evil plan, your majesty. You have a point there. You haven't told me either. We must be careful. That's right, your majesty. You can trust me about as far as you can roll me. Heraldoff smiled. Not Beaver was the perfect yes-man. He hadn't disagreed with Heraldoff, but with a one percent slope and a stern word, you could roll Not Beaver for miles, at least until the fat ablated off his body. They say they haven't eaten, your majesty. Heraldoff nodded. That was the type of thing peasants would say. But then again, we have the army here, right? Yes, your majesty. Call the peasants in feed them. That might make them soft, your majesty. Bones are hard, but they don't dig very fast. Unless you make them into a shovel, your majesty. Don't get cute. I don't think that's possible, your majesty. Not Beaver had him there. The man was ugly enough to scare the stink off sheep. Just do it. Not Beaver gave the order to whatever syncophats kissed his ass, and they passed the orders and so forth. Soon the people were eating. An hour later, the peasants moved back out into the swamp, if not vigorously, then with a bit more spring in their step. Brilliant, your majesty, Not Beaver said. Not Beaver? Yes, your majesty. Shut up. Of course, your majesty. Now you'd find it that much sooner. Chapter 36 Please, not another chapter quote, Bob Defendi. Rattlesnakes can be comfy, once they've settled into your bedroll with you. The trick is getting up without disturbing them. They can be grumpy, too. D'Amico slid out of his tent, freezing, when he heard the telltale rattle. Shh. He started moving again. The snake slithered over into the warm spot and curled up. Hmm. D'Amico stood naked in the middle of the camp. You wearing out your unmentionables? Gorthander asked, lounging by the fire. I usually change in my bedroll, D'Amico said. Why didn't you? "'Because I didn't want to change into a corpse?' Gorthander grunted as if it were a joke. They had camped in a lovely little clearing. The trees had been dark and solid, rustling like flowing water and swaying in the wind. 
The sky was so clear and the stars so bright that it resembled a slightly fake green screen effect. The grass was soft and inviting. Today it looked like a Boy Scout camp after the entire troop had gotten poison oak pissing in the brush. Gorthander shrugged and went back to making bacon for the breakfast beers. D'Amico realized what the dwarf was doing. Something wrong with Ladiana? I thought she hated your cooking. She hasn't gotten up yet. Hmm, he said. He considered going over to her tent and then thought better of waking her up in his birthday suit. He was about to suggest to Gorthander that they switch, but then he considered the implications of cooking bacon au naturel. Finally, he decided to fetch a burlap sack and a stick and take care of the snake. Even with the stick, it wasn't as easy as it looked. Hey, Gorthander, I just got bit by a rattlesnake, he said a moment later. This isn't one of those friendship tests, is it? Gorthander asked dubiously. D'Amico held the angry snake up in one hand. Gorthander shrugged and stood. He seemed to think again and picked up the pan. He poured the hot grease over the snake's head and D'Amico's hand. Son of a bitch! D'Amico yelled, leaping away and dropping the stunned snake. Gorthander stepped on its head. Quit your whining. Gorthander grabbed his hand. It was like one hit point damage. This isn't some freaking game! D'Amico said. Sure it is, Gorthander said, healing the hand. The spell hit like a fresh breeze in a hot day, if you were naked, falling out of a plane. Now for the poison, Gorthander said and cast a second spell. This one had no tangible effect. D'Amico grumbled and headed back into his tent. He pulled on his small clothes while cursing Gorthander, then his breeches while he cursed the dwarf's ancestors. When he was fully dressed, he'd gotten to several broad and masterful profanities about the entire dwarven race. He stomped back out. Feel better? You know that word I was using? My father was a gunnery sergeant. Did you know you can use it as almost every part of the human language? Yeah, you're a regular Ernest Hemingway, Gorthander said. Now, drink your breakfast beer. D'Amico pulled a strip of bacon out of the beer, and Gorthander swilled a swig and started chewing. D'Amico went over to Ladiana's tent. Ladiana? Yes, her voice sounded distant. Are you going to get up? Yes. Are you going to get up right now? If you'd like... D'Amico shared a glance with Gorthander, who didn't seem to notice. Yes. Get up right now. There came several shifting sounds, then Ladiana crawled out of the tent, fully dressed. Her hair was messed up, but only on the back, as if she slept all night without shifting. Strange. Are you all right? Yes. She stared off into space. And D'Amico figured it out. Ladiana couldn't come to the game today, D'Amico said. Carl must have passed that on, because Gorthander said, Yeah, that's why I was going to have her hold the horses. D'Amico was about to say something more, but... First the fun Ladiana, then the bitchy Ladiana, then the shy Ladiana, now the absentee Ladiana. It all made sense. Different people were playing the character. D'Amico stood there, shocked. He'd wondered before about women willing to play out love scenes with Carl. This was the answer. They couldn't. They lasted one, maybe two sessions... It was a testimonial to his charm that D'Amico could get them to last that long. He would have to live out here alone, after all. He'd have to live with no company but jerkind. And let's face it, Gorthander was killing him again in three, four chapters tops. Alone. Alone, or destroy the world. What choices were those? He sighed. He took a drink of his beer. He was starting to get used to the bacony goodness. This is pretty good, he said his mind already searching for his next move. Chapter 37 I'm not writing any more chapters today, Bob Defendi. They marched along in silence because D'Amico didn't start any conversations. He didn't have the heart to detract from the other players' fun. They would say something like, We head off again that morning, hoping Carl would let time pass and say, Okay, that night... But D'Amico craved attention, and some days he'd try to start conversations to pass the time. This passed the time for him, but was boring for everyone at the game table who didn't have to live through the tedium of walking all day. He exchanged a few words with Jerkin, but even those would get through to the party and bring them back into real time, he was sure. They answered, at least. They answered, at least. So he spent the rest of the time, as they walked along the dusty road, watching Ladiana. She wasn't just an automaton, even though her features had blurred. She no longer resembled some player's favorite actress. Now she resembled a mannequin. And technically, he could probably do anything he wanted with her right now. But the thought of taking advantage of that sickened him. 
and sickened him more that the thought had even occurred to him. He was just so desperate for human contact. When they got to the next town, he needed to find some barmaid who had come alive and take her to a back room where they wouldn't disrupt the game and just talk. Dear God, when had he come to need human interaction so much? The time slogged on. He counted the trees. He counted the villages and the bushes and his steps. He counted how many times Jerkin muttered to himself. He didn't count them, but he was painfully aware of each swish of Ladiana's skirts. None of this was real. But that wasn't true, was it? It was real to Jerkin and Barmaid Barbie and all those people in that last tavern. To them, this was their lives, their world. And all he had to do to save his own mind was to destroy them. Eventually, the sun began to set. There were villages pretty much every mile along the road, so when they realized night was coming along, they stopped at the next one. It consisted of a line of waddle and daub huts along a central road, their roofs bushy yellow thatch. A manor house stood at one end, squat and uninspired, a big frame house with some stonework and a wooden shingle roof. There was an inn next to it, too big for this town. As they walked through the streets, people peered out of windows and doorways at them, emaciated, desperate-looking people. They wore dirty, tattered tunics and haunted eyes bruised with hunger. There were dogs, but they didn't seem willing to break the mood, so they just sulked. D'Amico led the group through all these people into the inn, hoping beyond hope the place was alive. He needed alive. He could be happy just watching alive. They moved through the front door and into a place bustling with activity, full to the rafters with sights and sounds of people. They found their way to seats and waited while a barmaid maneuvered expertly through the jostling patrons. She stopped and smiled down at them. Hi, my name is Bunny. Can I help you? She was perfect, like all barmaids in Carl's world. She was full of life, and she seemed ready to burst out of that dress and the stained apron, and yet not in a sexual way. It was like clothing couldn't contain her because skin couldn't contain her. She was a comet, not a person. Or maybe it was just the loneliness talking. You have a lot of people here, D'Amico said. It gets like this every night. He stared out at the downtrodden village, then back at the fat, happy people in here. I don't understand. We're thirty miles down the road from the last town. And then he got it. In the real world, everyone traveled a different distance every day. But the game transit table said thirty miles on foot on a road. It didn't matter if they started early or late. Thirty miles. Everyone stopped here. The rule book said so. Why are those people so hungry if the inn is doing well? D'Amico asked. It was a bad crop this year, Bunny said. The overlord's tax collectors, you know how they are. D'Amico faced the rest of them. We could do something for these people. Isn't that nice, Bunny said, laying a hand on his arm. Now he really needed to help these people. He considered her. If you have a high customer volume, you must have all sorts of food. We have a lot, she said. How much to feed the whole village a meal? Five hundred gold, she said, give or take. I think we have that, D'Amico said. Everyone, how much do you have? Nine hundred, Gorthander said. Nine hundred, Arithian said. Forty-two hundred, Omar said. D'Amico paused. He blinked. He examined Omar, as if he might have missed the giant bag of money. Do you know how much that weighs? he asked. Gorthander looked over into Omar's pouch. Yep, it's right there on his character sheet. That's eighty-four pounds of gold, D'Amico said. I've played this character in other games, Omar said. And Brian never spends any money, Gorthander said. D'Amico shook his head and turned back to Bunny. We're buying the village dinner. That's so sweet, she said, touching his arm electrically. Get the chef cooking, he said. And what time do you get off work? I'm not that kind of a girl, she said skeptically. You don't have to be. I only want you for your mind. Chapter 38 Must Make Deadline Bob Defendi they came in one by one. Barmaid Bunny told first one, then another, who had fed them this evening. They came to D'Amico, and they touched him, and they thanked him. Mothers wept as their children laughed and ate. D'Amico took up another collection and ordered seconds for everyone. They came into the room as automatons, but as they touched him, they lit up one by one. With each touch, he felt himself getting weaker. He was fading. He had to stop this. The food would have to be enough. He called Bunny over. Yes, she said, bouncing over next to him. 
I have to leave. The people want to thank you. She beamed at the villagers crowding the inn, spilling out onto the streets. It's taking a lot out of me. It's killing me. You've given them a meal, she said, confused. You don't want to give them this? I can't. Too much. He felt a tug on the back of his pants. He turned to two children. One had black hair and one blonde. A boy and a girl in identical dirty smocks. They gazed at him with dead eyes. Thank you, sir, they said in hollow unison. Aren't they cute, Barmaid Bunny said. Dead eyes and dead faces. Dead souls and dead bodies. It was as if someone had ripped everything good and pure out of these children. They had no hope, no dreams, no drive. They were nothing but vague, embodied want. D'Amico went to one knee. He gathered both children into his arms, and he shuddered. The sound that came out of his mouth was wet, thick, wordless. He pulled back and looked into brilliant, inquisitive eyes. Eat as much as you can, then go play. And they did. He stood and watched these people. He swayed slightly as he compensated for the lost life force. How many people had he brought to life so far? This village? Would he die if he kept it up? He'd done enough. It would have to be enough. See, Barmaid Bunny said. He grabbed her arm, pulling her close. Then he kissed her chastely on the cheek. Tell them all they have to come shake my hand, D'Amico said. Find anyone who already left. Shake your hand. I'm Italian. I can't break bread with someone I haven't met. I don't understand. Tell them it's payment for dinner. Barmaid Bunny smiled and moved away. D'Amico watched her go. He turned back to the people and continued to dole out his life to them in measured sips. Chapter 39 If the effects of this chapter last more than four hours, please consult a physician, Bob Defendi. One by one, the party members went to bed, and D'Amico felt a twinge when Lariana left. Not because of her sudden absence, but because he felt vaguely like his attentions in the barmaid were some sort of infidelity. But it wasn't. He knew that. He'd forged a relationship with two different women, and both of them had left him. The fact that they'd left the body behind was no matter. He was alone, uncommitted, without even implied promises to hold him down. Finally, he sat alone, smiling as he watched one small boy work his way through the food line for a third time. He could tell by the wry expression on Bunny's face she noticed, too. She smiled. Eventually, the crowd dissipated and the cook collapsed face-first onto one of the tables. Bunny came over and did the same on the bench next to D'Amico. He shook at the loss of life, diminished, half a man. Still, it didn't matter how sick and weak the drain left him. In spite of it all, he felt so damn... Good. Good work, he said. Yeah, she leaned against him slightly. He smiled and inhaled the scent of her. He'd never seen anyone bathe in this world, and yet they didn't stink. She smelled sweaty, like she might have after a workout or lovemaking, but no more. Maybe bacteria didn't exist in Carl's world. For anyone other than him, that is. I just want to go to sleep, she said. Go ahead, D'Amico said. He basked in the warmth of her. They eased their backs onto the wall, and her head fell against his shoulder. It's inappropriate, she mumbled. I need to get up. The cook will talk. D'Amico nodded and caught the eye of the big matronly cook, now the only other person in the room. He smiled at her and said in a loud voice, Bunny thinks she'll start spreading rumors about us. The cook nodded as if that were an instruction. Honey, Bunny's sleeping with the new guy. That's nice, dear, a voice called from the back. Bunny hit him. She didn't lift her head, but she did feel awake now. See, D'Amico said, taken care of. She chuckled, and D'Amico couldn't see her eyes, but from the cook's expression the two women shared a look. Then the cook rose to her feet, grabbed the huge pot, and waddled out of the common room. D'Amico stared down at Bunny and found her staring back up at him. He leaned over and kissed her. She kissed him back. Then, in a breath between what he hoped were more kisses, she said, I thought you only wanted me for my mind. Aren't I kissing your mind? Not hardly. I better try harder, he said, kissing her again passionately. Still not there, she murmured. Let me try one more time, he said, kissing her so deeply it should require a license to practice medicine. Oh, that was it, she said between gasps. They kissed for the next ten minutes, one thing leading to another. Then he rose and led her to his room. 
Still kissing, he fumbled his way over to the big bed. They fell in together. I can't do this, she murmured between kisses. I beg to differ with you, he said. You're pretty good. They kissed some more, and somehow they seemed to be losing clothing. Evaporation. No, really, she said. We need to stop. You're on top, he said. You have to stop first. I can't have sex with you, she said. I didn't offer it, he said. She stopped, pulling back and giving him a look, as if she couldn't decide if he were for real. Her expression was one of puzzlement, confusion, and just a little bit of hurt, as if she wasn't sure if he rejected her. I'm not that kind of a boy, he said with a straight face. A smile blossomed on her face. I only want you for your mind. Oh, well, that's okay then, he said. They fell back into kissing. This was what he meant by fun games. D'Amico woke to the light of the dawn slanting through the window. Bunny was gone, but his lips still tingled as if she'd kissed him good morning. For a time he stared at the ceiling, feeling good and whole for the first time since he'd come to this world, despite the loss and the spent life. He needed it so badly. The sex had been almost an afterthought. He needed that emotional connection, and he'd gotten it. As he dressed, he felt a strange sensation, not as if someone had walked over his grave, more like someone had crumpled his character sheet. A moment later, he felt a great noise. He didn't hear it. It felt like someone was rubbing a cat against a big pile of laundry, in his genitals. He reached out and caught a ladder-back chair while he waited for the nausea to pass. He'd gotten as far as putting on his pants, so he rushed out the door, through the common room, and out onto the street. Omar came out in his small clothes and a Rithian in a long shirt with a village woman on each arm, dressed in more of his shirts. Jerk had exited bootless and cloakless, but otherwise dressed, and Gorthander came out in full kit. Ladiana wandered out, probably homing in automatically on the largest concentration of party members. "'Did you feel that?' Jerkin asked. "'What was it?' Gorthander asked. "'I can't describe it,' Jerkin said. "'You keep saying that,' Gorthander said, probably talking to Carl, not Jerkin. "'As I dressed,' D'Amico said, "'I felt a strange sensation, not as if someone had walked over my grave, more like someone had crumpled my character sheet.' A moment later, I felt a great noise. I didn't hear it. It felt like somebody rubbing a cat against a big pile of laundry. In my genitals. Gorthander just stared at him woodenly. I didn't catch that. It felt like a foreshock, D'Amico said. A foreshock of what? Gorthander asked. The end of the world, D'Amico said. I think Raldoff found the artifact. Chapter 40 uh-oh, they're in trouble now, Bob Defendi. D'Amico found the village reeve. At least he assumed the man was the reeve. Everyone kept asking him questions like, What the hell was that? And, Are we all going to die? And, Have you thought about that little problem I brought up last week? The man looked harried, as if his car horn had stuck behind a pack of Hell's Angels. He looked like a grown man who just discovered that to get into heaven, he needed to have a briss. Sir, D'Amico asked, walking up to him. Yeah. The man looked as if he expected assassins, or more likely the Women's Auxiliary Committee, to jump out at him at any moment. We need to find Hraldoff. The reeve went white past his forehead. That was quite an achievement considering that the forehead in question reached all the way to the back of his head. The Overlord is everywhere. He sees all. He hears all. He is the guiding hand at the whipstaff, the motive in the heavens. He is the nightlight in our darkened room, the blankie in our arms. He is the mind that guides the universe. D'Amico blinked a few times. I need to know where he is. The Overlord is everywhere. He sees all. He hears all. He is the guiding hand at the whipstaff, the motive in the heavens. He is the nightlight in our darkened room, the blankie in our arms. He is the mind that guides the universe. What's a whipstaff? Omar asked. You use it to steer a ship? Gorthander said. Then what's a tiller? D'Amico ignored them. I need to know where he is. The Overlord is everywhere. He made you memorize that, didn't he? The Overlord is everywhere. He sees all. He hears all. Skip it, D'Amico said. You need to tell me where to find him. The Overlord is everywhere. He sees all. He hears all. He is the guiding hand at the whipstaff, the motive in the heavens. He is the nightlight in our darkened room, the blankie in our arms. He is the mind that guides the universe. D'Amico appraised him and sighed. The man's eyes weren't dead. D'Amico must have awakened him last night. That meant he wasn't unable to respond. Omar... Yeah? I don't think he has enough blood in his brain. A moment later, the reeve dangled by one ankle, his bald head buffing the dirt road as he swung back and forth. 
The little fringe of hair stood out around his head, like a koala. D'Amico knelt in front of the reeve. "'I'm a reasonable man,' D'Amico said. "'I can see that, master,' the reeve said. "'Good. Then we can have a reasonable conversation. "'I'd love to. Have you seen the beautiful seed we have for the winter crop?' "'Maybe later,' D'Amico said. "'Now, my friend is a hands-on kind of guy.' The reeve looked up at Omar, which involved looking down from his unique point of view. He grinned earnestly at D'Amico. "'I see that,' the reeve squeaked. "'Now, I've told him you aren't getting enough blood to the brain. Let's prove him wrong before he attempts surgery.' D'Amico came from a long line of Italians. He reached out and casually straightened the man's clothing. "'What do you want to know?' "'We seem to have blown up Heraldoff's heart of darkness. Where should we go next?' He'll kill me. That's a very long-sighted view. Look closer. Omar thumped the reeve's head against the ground. He has a summer palace, the man squeaked. Very good. Where would we find it? You know, to pay our respects. North. A week's march down the road. D'Amico reached out and patted the man's cheek. See? That wasn't so hard. Then, with mock surprise, Omar, what are you doing? Put this fine man down this instant. Omar dropped him on his head. Very good. D'Amico circled south past Ladiana, seeking a clear view up the road. He brushed up against her in the process, and she gasped. It was the type of gasp that D'Amico usually related to more personal dealings. He looked over at her, and she looked at him. Her eyes were deep, intelligent. She was stunning with long, dark hair and a lithe figure, but she didn't resemble any actress he knew. Something had happened, and he felt weaker, knew somehow he'd worked his magic on her. She was self-aware— but he didn't have time to worry about that now. He needed to find Heraldoff. But, more importantly, he needed to get her out of the same village as Bunny. Chapter 41 Bar Fights Are Trite, Bob Defendi Plutonium keeps better in small, separate pieces. I think Gene Roddenberry said that. The same could be said for girlfriends. Bring two together, and critical mass. D'Amico had felt good about his little tryst with Bunny. He still did, but he expected Ladiana to next become aware when she had a new player, a player with no connection to her past, a new person with whom he'd have to start anew. With Ladiana still an NPC, but aware now, he wondered if she still remembered everything they'd been through together. No clean slate, the same person, just born again. He still, f he still felt like he was in the right with Bunny, but he wasn't at all sure Ladiana would feel the same way. Best to get the hell out of Dodge. They traveled hard that day, and twenty miles later, Ladiana seemed to get a bearing on this development in her head. She walked next to D'Amico. She talked to him, too. He fell back out of hearing from the PCs so they wouldn't interfere with Carl saying, So, that night, he enjoyed it. For the first time, he was able to have a conversation where he felt like it was actually her he spoke to, not Carl. This was what had attracted him so much, at least initially, to Bunny. Real human contact. It was everything he could do to not constantly invent excuses to reach out and touch her. So, that night, they reached another village at the end of the road. Not surprisingly, this one had a tavern, and when they entered, about half the people they'd seen the night before were here as well. The half that traveled in the same direction, presumably. They settled in at a corner table, Ladiana snuggling up next to him, Omar on the other side, not snuggling, thank God. Gorthander and Jerkin went to the bar, arms around each other jovially. Arithian transformed into a barmaid-seeking missile and set off into the room. "'It's nice how those two have started getting along,' Latiana said, nodding at Gorthander and Jerkind. "'Yeah, I guess you kill a man in an excruciating manner, and he forgives you, and you see him in a whole new light.' "'You kind of got lost in that sentence, didn't you?' "'Yeah, but whenever I'm tackling a big sentence, I take two Sherpas and a couple of strong goats.' "'Good man,' she said. He put his arm around her, and she nestled into the crook. Omar scoffed and waved over a barmaid. "'Hey, sweet cheeks, how about a brewski?' The barmaid wore the traditional naughty Swedish girl outfit, but her eyes were anything but. She rolled them and smiled at Ladiana and D'Amico. "'You want anything?' "'Beer,' D'Amico said. "'The lady wants wine.' 
Ladiana made a content affirmative noise. The barmaid smiled at them again and left to get the order, casting Omar a last scathing look. D'Amico watched the top of Ladiana's head, content. He was happy with the prospect of more happiness down the line. Maybe he didn't need to destroy the world. Maybe he could be content, just like this. But, he sat bolt upright. Oh, God, no. What? What? Ladiana and Omar asked at once. He couldn't decide how to answer. He couldn't tell them what he had just realized. Luckily, he didn't have to. Because Gorthander and Jerkind picked up their drinks, downed them in one pull, then smashed the mugs into each other's heads. That! D'Amico said, pointing and pretending that that's what he'd been reacting to all along. Gorthander roared, but he seemed to be enjoying himself. People backed up as Gorthander picked up a stool and smashed it over Jerkin's head. Jerkin stumbled back, cursing, then hurled himself into the dwarf's belly with a clank that couldn't have felt good for either of them. "'What the hell?' D'Amico asked. He had just gotten used to them getting along. Did they draw their daily moods out of a damn hat? "'It's just a bar fight,' Omar said. The barmaid came back with their drinks, only to be bowled over by Gorthander and Jerkin spraying ale into the air. "'Son of a bitch!' Omar shouted, launching himself to his feet. "'It's just a bar fight,' Latiana said. Omar pushed in and smashed a nearby patron on general principle. The place exploded into chaos. The local priest had grabbed a sword and was trying to attack with it, but it kept slipping out of his hands until he attacked with the blunt side. Another cleric had pulled a lucerne hammer and used it to lay into the crowd about him. He must have been an old cleric, because they declared lucerne hammers to be pole arms in the second edition. He must have grandfathered it in. Meanwhile, the barmaids crawled under tables, and patrons who noticed them slapped them on their rumps. A wizard in a pointy hat wearing the tavern dart-throwing medal smashed some of the more grievous offenders over the head with a staff. "'You think we should help?' Latiana asked. There was a big table between them and the fight, and he was so comfortable with Latiana curled up next to him, he shook his head. "'It's just a bar fight,' he said. Gorthander picked up Jerkin by the ankles, he had to stand on the bar to do it, and smashed him headfirst into the floor over and over again. A Rithian had crawled under a table with two barmaids, and the giggling commenced. A small child ran through the legs of the combatants, taking bets for the bookmaker in the corner. The dwarf cursed and threw Jerkin to the ground. The man lay there limply. Gorthander frowned, discouraged. He hopped off the bar and walked through the fight, punching crotches and kicking ankles until he arrived at the table. "'Damn,' he said. "'You killed Jerkin again, didn't you?' D'Amico asked. "'I didn't mean to. Who'd have guessed I'd roll a critical that big?' D'Amico shook his head, even as Omar shouted, "'You killed Jerkind!' from across the room. D'Amico said, "'You bastard!' but his heart wasn't in it. He glanced back over at Ladiana, and the idea re-emerged, the one that had made him curse earlier. He pulled suddenly away from her before the dwarf could notice. He couldn't let Carl know they were together. He didn't know how he could stop it, but he did know one thing. The girlfriend always gets snatched by Act Three. Chapter 42 Fine, you can have another Heraldoff scene, but I won't promise a good one. Bob Defendi Heraldoff placed the new artifact into the secret compartment next to the old one, the one I'm not allowed to tell you about. Then he closed the secret door and left the Dungeon of Dungeons. One thing Heraldoff had learned the hard way. If you poke the eyes out of your architect when he's done building your palace, you don't just stop him from creating a beautiful palace for someone else. You also stop him from building a summer palace for you five years later. So Heraldoff's mountain palace used the same plans as the Heart of Darkness. He called it the Heart of Light because evil overlords had the sense of symmetry of an OCD ward. He walked through the dungeons and up the stairs and eventually into his throne room. Here, his toy soldier guards stood at attention. He stopped, his feet crinkling the plastic mats. He checked his mask and walked over to one side. The men stood there, if anything, more attentive as he approached. But he didn't look at them. His gaze was, instead, on the fine art that covered the walls. "'Not Beaver,' he said quietly. "'Yes, Your Majesty,' the man said, appearing at his elbow. He needed to buy the little freak a bell. "'Why do I have fine art hanging on my walls?' "'You like fine art, Your Majesty?' "'Do I?' "'You've always said so, Your Majesty.' Heraldoff considered, nodding. He examined the paintings of overweight women, the bizarre pieces where the man had too many noses and not enough eyes, the picture of cherubs. "'Cherubs!' he scowled at Dot Beaver. "'Take them down.' "'All, Your Majesty?' "'Everyone.' "'What do you want in their place, Your Majesty?' 
Why do I need something in their place? Otherwise, it might look rather bare, Your Majesty. Haraldoff nodded. The little twerp had a point. It might even be a good point, he considered. Posters. Posters, Your Majesty? Yeah, about thirty years old, vintage stuff. Frame them. Light them indirectly. No track lighting. I'm not gay. Then maybe some art wire? Hang some nice smaller pieces. Maybe a bookshelf in a corner with knick-knacks. Are you sure you're not gay, Your Majesty? Haraldoff spun a knock beaver. What did you say? I said we'll do it your way, Your Majesty. Haraldoff nodded and stared back at the throne of skulls. Hmm. You think maybe you could get a nice futon while you're at it? Chapter 43 I told you that joke so I could tell you this joke, Bob Defendi. The army had been building for a year, in the back rooms of taverns, in the fields of the peasants, in the homes and universities and shops. It was the type of army that formed to take out a dictator. The type of army a boy like Carl would put into a game when he didn't think the characters could take out the main bad guy by themselves. Deus ex bellicus. Pardon my Latin. They camped just under a week's journey from the Heart of Light, anxious in an automatic sort of way, ready to pounce, to defeat the tyrant, to do all those things peasants' armies like to do, or rather, don't like to do. Usually there are sergeants pushing them from behind. Often they have whips. But this army had nothing but the will to put down a despot. Well, not exactly a will, but they had pitchforks and a script. And several good songs and optimistic slogans like Down with the Oppressor and Make War, Not Love and Pointy End Towards the Enemy. I have to admit, they didn't shout with great zeal. It might have been more accurate to say they recited, or mumbled, honestly. They camped on the plains, all of them standing, staring dully into the fire or out into the night. They stood around, waiting for their next line. They wouldn't have anything to do until tomorrow. Tomorrow they would march precisely thirty miles closer. And then the invisible line between D'Amico and the first artifact passed across the camp. It started with a sob, and then a scream. Then three of the watch wailed hysterically, weeping, pulling out hair, gnashing their teeth, all that biblical stuff. The outer ranks disintegrated first, one soldier after another standing up and wandering off into the night. Then the core of the camp started to disperse. Then the final groups of peasants, deep in their tents. Soon the entire place was empty. They were peasants and students, not soldiers. They weren't building a barricade. They weren't expecting the masses to rise up around them. They were going to throw themselves against the walls of a well-defended castle, and there was a world of difference. And just like that, the army that was meant to save D'Amico, to maintain game balance, and to make it possible to win the game, disbanded. Chapter 44 Okay, I lied, but I needed a chapter quote. Bob Defendi they marched down the road without jerkind again. Laliana and D'Amico talked all day long, again well behind the rest so as not to pull the group back into real time. For a while, they even held hands. He felt like a high school kid. Actually, there was a lot less awkward fumbling and blurted apologies than in high school. He felt the way a kid in high school wished he could feel. He didn't know how any of this worked, but he didn't think Carl could keep it all in his head at once. D'Amico was counting on these images only connecting to Carl through the eyes of the characters and the NPCs he controlled. Since he didn't control either D'Amico or Ladiana anymore, he could only hope the things they did, the things they said in private, would go unnoticed. After all, if he did sum up the day's travel with that night, how would he perceive a day's worth of conversation between D'Amico and Ladiana without going mad? Matter. Essentially, D'Amico tried his damnedest to hide from God. He could only hope that it worked out better than you'd expect. They arrived at the village about sunset, finding their way to a quaint little tavern with a large beam frame and blonde plaster walls. The windows were wavy glass like the snapshot of the heat distortion over a fire. A sign hung over the door showing a rooster, leaning back in a heraldic pose, its wings in the air in front of it like a rearing lion. To the left stood a plucked and embarrassed hen. Carl certainly has an interesting taste in tavern signs, D'Amico said. Who's Carl? Latiana asked. I'll tell you later. He walked up three uneven stairs and into the mudroom. He stomped his feet politely, and when his boots were relatively clean, he pushed into the main area. 
The place was full of people, but for once they seemed to be locals. Naughty Swedish barmaids worked the crowds, and D'Amico almost wished Carl would set a different image into his head. Maybe French maids. He really needed a change. They made their way to the traditional corner table, and D'Amico sat on the bench. Omar and Gorthander sat on either side of him this time, and he didn't try to change his seating. Perhaps this was best. The barmaid came over to the table. Welcome to the Rapid Cock. How may I help you? Ladiana gasped, Omar choked, and Arithian chuckled. Only D'Amico and Gorthander laughed. What's so funny? Omar said. The name. It's a heraldry joke, D'Amico said. Omar frowned suspiciously. Never mind, Gorthander said. If you have to explain it, it's not funny. We'll all have beers, D'Amico said. Make sure Gorthander's is in a dirty glass. The lady would like wine. The barmaid nodded and headed off. Arithian rose from his seat. Lords and ladies, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their barmaid. He then followed her, his wink predatory. So, Gorthander asked, what's the plan? More what? D'Amico asked. Five days out? Something like that. We need to start gathering intelligence, D'Amico said. See what Heraldov's up to. Come up with a plan to beat him. What if there is no plan? Omar asked. There's always a plan, Gorthander said. It's an adventure. There's always a way to win. Most of the time, D'Amico said, you don't even lose half your hit points. It seems rough, Gorthander said, but it will be exactly as hard as we can handle. After a time, they realized their drinks weren't imminent and Arithian wasn't coming back. Oh, look, a rocket scientist. Anyway, D'Amico went to the bar and fetched their drinks, and Omar and Gorthander became quietly hammered while they argued about whether the newest D-30 fighter's book was worth buying. Eventually, they wandered off to bed, leaving D'Amico and Ladiana alone at the table in an alcohol glow. What do we do now? Ladiana asked. Stop coming on to me, you scandalous woman, D'Amico said. Oh, you think I'm coming on to you? He considered her, his expression a carefully crafted leer. Hers was an expression of comic innocence. I've come to expect it, he said. My lot in life. She moved closer to him. What would you say if I told you I was just being polite? Taking pity, even. I'd say it's a pity you're such a liar, he said, rolling his head back to watch the room. There was a pause, and he felt her mood grow more serious. He glanced at her and found her attention inward. He left her to her thoughts. It was a while before she said, "'What's happened to me?' "'What do you mean?' he asked, his voice carefully even. "'I was nice, and then I was awful, and then I was shy, and then—' "'Then I don't remember much until one day—one day—' I just sort of woke up. D'Amico nodded and took her hand. Does it matter? Yes. D'Amico caught her chin, urging her to face him. He leaned in and kissed her gently. Then eagerly, he pulled away. Do you want to go upstairs? He whispered. Yes. He smiled. Good. Then I'll explain everything afterward. She leaned in, nibbled on his ear. Are you so eager? You're the eager one, you wanton woman, he said with a smile. Then why not tell me now? Because if I tell you now, it will sound like the biggest pickup line ever. And with that, he swept her up and carried her to bed. Chapter 45 If you lived in this book, you'd be home right now. Bob Defendi You don't get to know what happened next. If you must read about it, you have the entire internet to satisfy you, and several online bookstores will deliver adult material right to your phone. Anyway, if Carl has to be in the dark, you don't get to peek in the window. Later that night, they lay tangled in the sheets, the musky smell drifting languidly in the air. D'Amico smiled and stared at the ceiling, lazily considering waking up Ladiana for another go. A bump and a curse echoed in the hall. He smiled. Another patron heading for bed, drunk. It wasn't that the walls were paper-thin, the plaster was so thick it splintered under its own weight. There was an inch gap below and above the door. He rolled over and studied the vertebrae of her back, each one outlined under the skin, following one after another from her lustrous hair to the triangle of her pelvic girdle at the edge of the blanket, that small-of-the-back spot women in the real world like to cover in tattoos. The creamy skin gleamed softly in the moonlight from the window, and he traced the vertebrae carefully with the tip of his finger. One, and then another, and another. They felt warm and hard under his touch, a braille map down the axis of her body. She stirred slightly and moaned. He reached up and stroked her hair, and she went back to sleep. He smiled again. He must look like an idiot. The door shattered inward, and the latch whipped across the room, striking D'Amico in the eye. He screamed and reached up in pain, and so it took him a moment to realize men flooded the chamber. 
He didn't notice until the pitchfork slid between his arms, catching him under the chin and the throat. Isn't this pretty, a voice said. D'Amico glared at the peasant that stood above him. The man had a beard like pre-ginned cotton, filled with little bones, chunks of food, and bits of wood and seeds. His face resembled a stress map of the San Andreas Fault, and the reek from his rotting teeth was enough to cauterize wounds. What the hell? D'Amico managed. Had he lost an eye? Would it heal? Oh, it hurt so damn much he couldn't tell. Look at the two lovebirds, the man said. D'Amico tried to see Ladiana, but the pitchfork pressed at his throat painfully into his Adam's apple. He reached under the cover and found her hand. She must have rolled over on her back. She squeezed. What do you want? D'Amico asked with more bravery than he felt, wondering if his Dodge class ability would save him if he made a move. It wouldn't save her, though. He had to think. His tunnel vision widened now, and he could make out at least six men in the room, all brandishing makeshift weapons. Either that or they thought he needed a good hoeing. We want to stop you, stupid, Dragon Breath answered. Too late, D'Amico said. We're already done. The pitchfork brought water to his one good eye, and he realized the other bled quite freely. At least he wouldn't get an infection. You're smart, aren't you? The lady's a mage, right? You think she can cast a spell if we puncture her voice box? D'Amico searched the room with his good eye, too busy trying to figure a way out to answer. We're stopping you from overthrowing Haldoff, you idiot, the peasant said. Wait, what? Why? Because he's the best thing that ever happened to us. He's giving out extra food. He's offering health plans. He's set a minimum wage. We aren't giving that up, one of the other peasants spat. He actually spat it. D'Amico felt the splash on his cheek. Then what happens next? D'Amico asked. That's for the overlord to decide. D'Amico's heart sank. They couldn't be on Haraldoff's side. That just didn't make any sense. They were off book now, and they weren't supposed to go off book. Son of a bitch! Chapter 46 Your Ad Here Bob Defendi A point of light. Perhaps it's a star in the heavens. Perhaps it's a torch in the distance. Maybe it's the fiery streak of an angel cast out of heaven. Next to it, a curve, a field of white like porcelain, a concave shape, the play of light and shadow. Let's pull back. The camera's too close. Another curve, a slope, an eye hole, another. As we zoom back, we can see it for what it is, a mask, Haraldoff, his posture brooding. Pull back farther. His chin on one hand, his furred cloak and crown, he is the evil overlord, like Conan on his throne. You know the movie I'm talking about. But that is another story. Watch. He stirs. Haraldoff rose from his throne and crossed the room, the plastic matting sliding beneath his feet. He walked over to his mirror and examined his hair. It was perfect. Everything about him was perfect. Too perfect. He didn't seem real. He mussed his hair, hung his tunic a little sloppier, Moved the cloak's brooch off center. There. Now he looked a bit more like a real person. Maybe he wouldn't comb his hair tomorrow. Maybe he'd put on an artificially aged tunic. Hmm. That might be nice. Maybe he wouldn't polish the mask either. Not Beaver, he said before he even realized the fat man had entered the room. Yes, Your Majesty. The tiny fat man hovered so far back in the distance he might have been wall art. What do you want? I want for nothing, Your Majesty. <sighs> then why are you here? I thought you were researching those workers' rights laws. I want to know if workers are more productive with ten-minute breaks. I was thinking also of some sort of central location where they can take these breaks. A room of some kind, perhaps? With free snacks. Very forward-thinking, Your Majesty. The only thing I can't figure out is why I want to call their wives life partners. I'm sure you'll figure out why, Your Majesty. Haraldoff admired himself in the mirror a bit longer, then turned away. Not Beaver was a furry pile of fidget. Either he had to use the garter robe, he had to say something, or he had a wicked case of the crabs. Not Beaver? Yes, Your Majesty. Speak. We've captured your brother, Your Majesty. Haraldoff's eyebrows rose under the mask. If this were a comic book, the brow ridges of the mask would have risen too, and there would have been emotion lines radiating from his head and the women would have been as top-heavy as an after-hours board meeting. Why the ants in your pants? Your brother was injured, Your Majesty. They hit him? 
I think he was caught in the eye with a rupturing lock, Your Majesty. Haraldoff nodded. There should be rules about building in his empire. Maybe a set of codes. Building codes. That was it. Will he be all right? He might lose the eye, Your Majesty. Haraldoff nodded. Take me to him. They walked down the hall and down the stairs, past the guard who slept with his key within easy reach of the cells, his sword conveniently on the table. Even evil overlords had cousins and domineering aunts who tried to get them jobs. Past this lay the real dungeons, the ones where the keys weren't even kept in the same room as the guards, where the bars were electrified and the secret doors in the cells led to shark-infested waiting pools. They walked into these dungeons, through three sets of valve-like doors, each requiring two simultaneous keys, carried by guards with clearly identifiable faces. He had done some work since their last escape. The hallway was dark and both dank and dusty at the same time. They needed to bring in an interior decorator to get the right effect. The spider webs were imported, too. He stopped at the door. They replaced the heavy oaken doors with gates of bars after last time, so he could have a civil conversation without a prisoner tearing his mask off. It was strange. In the old days, he'd never seemed to learn. He stood there for several seconds before D'Amico and his friends noticed him. D'Amico wore a large bandage over one eye. So we meet again, Haraldov said. You've been reading from the villain quote book, D'Amico said. Haraldov smiled. D'Amico thought Haraldov was the villain. Brother, he said. I work hard. I toil for my people. You are the rebels trying to overthrow my just empire. Your evil empire, D'Amico said. He lay along a bench, his head in the lap of the pretty mage. Just because it's evil doesn't mean it isn't just. My people love me. I have improved everyone's quality of life. And Hitler loved his mother and made the trains run on time. Now, D'Amico, Gorthander said, the first person to mention Hitler in any argument loses. D'Amico shrugged and contemplated the ceiling. This left his blind eye on the side of Heraldoff. Why, brother? Heraldoff asked. Why do you want to destroy me? The throne could have been yours. I would have willingly destroyed your enemies for you. Because I am the good guy. Don't get down on yourself, Heraldoff said. No, D'Amico said with a sigh. I'm the hero, you're the villain. I'm afraid you have it backward, Heraldoff said. Really? D'Amico asked. Then how do you explain this? He pointed at the bandaged eye. Building codes. I'm working on it. No, D'Amico said, his one eye penetrating. I'm scarred. Branded. So, Heraldoff asked, confused, the hero always gets branded by the end of the second act. Heraldoff blinked, opened his mouth to speak closed it again. D'Amico was right. It wasn't always a physical brand, but in every good story, the hero was branded. But no, this was just a trick. This was fast talk to bring down Heraldoff's resolve. D'Amico was the villain. He, he was. He had to be. And yet something tickled in his memory. Didn't he used to think of himself differently? No. I'm the hero, Raldoff whispered. Every villain is the hero of his own story, D'Amico said. I didn't think Carl was smart enough to know that. Raldoff's stomach sank, his head light as if it might float off his shoulders. Dear God, what if D'Amico was right? What if this was actually true? No, no, Raldoff was the hero. He had to be. He walked away, out of the dungeons, through door after door. He moved up through the fortress, seeking higher and higher levels, but no matter where he went, it just seemed dark and stifling. He searched for the light, but he couldn't find it. Chapter 47 What is the sound of one chapter quoting? No, wait, Bob Defendi. Jerkin straightened and twitched, then relaxed. The first thing he noticed was the smell. The next was the smell. The third was the slime, but the fourth, well, it was the smell. He lay on a pile of garbage. And if the massive flock of birds circling overhead was any sign, it was a big pile of garbage. Either that or the end of days, and the crows were a host of vengeful, stinking angels. Jerkin had an image of angel droppings falling from the sky. He shuddered. 
He was getting too old for this. What was he now? Fifty? He didn't know. He climbed to his feet in the shifting pile, dripping garbage juice. Either his head swam or the fumes were so thick he could see wavy lines. Jerkin stumbled out of the trash heap, tripping over two more dead bodies and out to where he could see clearly. The wavy lines were more subtle now. They must have just been the stink coming off him. The town lay off to one side, a constant line of wagons leading from it to the heap, each one piled with waste, most of it rotting cabbage. Garbage day. He shook the rotting cabbage off himself as well, wondering vaguely what this diet did to the town's outhouse habits. Then he stared off into the distance. The party had to be heading on by now. They would assume he was dead, that he didn't have three one-shot resurrection charms. He needed to track them down before they made it back to Haraldoff's clutches. It was time to tell D'Amico the truth. Chapter 48 All Your Joke Are Belong to Us, Bob Defendi Wake up, the guard said, pounding the bars. D'Amico jerked and glanced over at the door. The guard stood there, mail hanging loosely from his body, one gauntleted fist poised for a round of knocking. His face resembled a bowl of oatmeal that had been left in a light rain. "'What's all this, then?' D'Amico said in his best English Bobby voice. The guard didn't get the joke. "'We're moving you to another dungeon.' "'Why?' D'Amico asked. "'Are the sharks off that one hungrier? He'd done a little exploring since you'd gotten here.' No, the Overlord wants you in the high-security area. D'Amico sighed and kicked himself into the sitting position. Wake up, boys. We're going to Alcatraz. Everyone rose to their feet. Ladiano looked confused. They lined up, and the guard opened the cell door. Then they led them out and through the great valve doors as D'Amico whistled the theme to get smart. Or at least he tried to. Instead, he got the theme to the odd couple. They climbed one flight of stairs and into another dungeon area. The guard here wore rusted chain mail and a mace hung on his belt. Its head had been replaced by a ball of duct tape, proving once and for all the stuff couldn't fix everything. The man was round around the middle and going bald. His face was covered in acne. He had a strange likeness to D'Amico and a stranger likeness to Don Knotts. The new guard showed them to their cell, this one with an oaken door and a high window. There was only one cell. They stepped inside and the door closed. The lock clicked, then a chair ground up next to the door. The guard leaned back on the chair, and within moments, he snored soundly. "'Well, I'll be damned,' Gorthander said. D'Amico could almost sense the keys there on the man's belt. They'd be within easy reach of the cell window if he started with a little assisted stretching. He faced the party. "'I don't even know what to say,' he said. "'Maybe this is some elaborate trick to get a shot trying to escape,' Omar said. He's an evil overlord, Gorthander said. Why play coy? D'Amico shook his head, trying to process this. Then he craned his neck to examine the guard through the window. I think this guard is my cousin. Well, bully for you, Omar said. No, I mean, that would make him Haraldov's cousin, too. Gorthander's face screwed into a puzzled expression. That makes less sense. I can understand hiring him if he's family, but you don't give him responsibility. You think it's a trap? D'Amico asked. Good, my lord, I'm sure it's a trap, Arithian said. Ladiana nodded sagely. Then let's spring it, Omar said. It's the only way to be sure. Omar, 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 Gorthander said. Don't ever change. Why? Omar said. Because at the end of time, during God's final judgment, there might be a written test. So? So I like what you do to the curve. Omar ground on that, but D'Amico decided to say something before it sank in and started a fight. We need a decision. I still think it's a trap, Gorthander said. Me, Me too. too, said Latiana and Arithian at once. So we're agreed then, D'Amico said. They all nodded. Give me a go, no go for escape, he said, feeling like Gene Krantz. Go. 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 He nodded. This was an RPG, after all. What had he expected? He did a little stretching, which involved Gorthander pinning him to the wall with a boot while Omar tried to tear his arm off. He'd learned that during high school wrestling. Then he snaked his arm out the window and reached down unseeing, wondering what blindness did to his pickpocket skill check. He couldn't remember. But after a moment, he snagged the keys off the guard's belt hook. 
He hefted the mob and twisted like a woman in the Kama Sutra, fitting the key in the lock, all the while wondering why Haraldoff would let them escape. Was this some stupid honor among villains thing, or was he playing at, Before I kill you, Mr. Bond? Could this be Carl's own stupidity imposing itself on the game? No. Haraldoff was better than that. So much better, in fact, that D'Amico suspected he'd gained self-awareness. Minimum wage, indeed. The key clicked in the lock and the door opened. D'Amico stopped doing his Gumby impersonation and pulled his arm back. He stretched again briefly and pulled open the door. They sneaked past the guard one by one and found a cabinet in the guard room. They opened it up and found all their equipment minus their money. They carried their stuff halfway up the stairs and put it on. Maybe he thinks if he lets us escape, we won't blow the place up when we leave, Gorthunder said. D'Amico still didn't say anything about Omar reading the adventure. He hoped Carl hadn't figured that out yet. I wish we had money in case we need to bribe some guards. I have a hundred gold, Gorthunder said. D'Amico frowned, puzzled. You hide it up your ass? No, Gorthunder said. I wrote it on my character sheet in ink. Good thinking, D'Amico said, sneaking up the stairs. A quick backstab at the top took care of the guard. D'Amico scanned the area, finding featureless hallways in every direction. How do we get out? Omar asked. We don't, D'Amico said. Why not? Omar asked. Because this ends now, D'Amico said. Let's go find Haraldoff. Chapter 49 You get one exclamation point in the narrative of each book. Bob Defendi D'Amico is in the heart of light now. So is Haraldoff. So are both artifacts. No longer is it just lines of force that resonate between D'Amico and the artifact. Now the tension builds between them. It builds. Waves of force roll out from the heart of light. They cover the land, a great wash flowing outward, one after another. Let us sail above it all. Consider all the land around you. Notice the animals and the cities and the fields. Hear the birds migrate because Carl no longer controls their action with his poor understanding of ornithology. Hear the gazelle change their grazing patterns. Hear the wolves stop howling as they stalk their prey. Look there. A city, peaceful a moment ago, now pours smoke into the air. Its citizens riot in the street. Its guards cower in terror. That'll teach the Lord not to outlaw pornography. And there. Let's look closer. Through the roof. See the chapel, the stone floors and walls, pews nicer than a king could afford. Witness the priest there, young and so sure of himself now. Watch as he pauses in the middle of his sermon. See the confusion on his face. Now he walks away. Not only does he have no faith now, but he never had any to begin with. Notice that man wandering through the streets, tears streaming down his face. He's looking for his wife, the wife he left years ago. Now he can't seem to remember why. And that barbarian, his muscles oiled, his sword limber, is he counting? Has he cast aside his arms? Don't tell me he's giving up his former life to become an accountant. The world spins. The world churns. Most of all, the world moves. It moves! And yet, it moves. Chapter 50 No plan survives contact with the enemy. No plot survives contact with a word count. Bob Defendi it was all fine and dandy for D'Amico to make blanket declarations such as, let's go find Haraldoff. It was another matter to implement them. In fact, it began to annoy him just how big the Heart of Light was. In a game, Carl would have said something like, you search for hours before you find him. D'Amico was forced to live through those hours. He snuck down hall after perfectly squared hall. The walls were so smooth the mortar could have been painted on, like movie set walls. He had the urge to choose scenery. I want to kill something, Omar said. D'Amico didn't think Brian was saying this in the real world. More likely, Carl was letting time pass in seconds in the real world and just had Omar say that every ten minutes when he was on an autopilot. You know, to be true to the character. D'Amico didn't speak. He didn't want to do anything that would force Carl back into real time. Not if he didn't want Omar and Gorthander bored. Bored players made mistakes. They might not have anything at stake, but D'Amico and Laliana could die for real here. He didn't care about himself so much because he didn't know what happened if he died shortly before the world blew up. But Laliana? No. He couldn't let her die. 
He was doing it all for her now. And what did that do to his plans? Not so many days ago, the thought of letting the world be destroyed was an easy sell. It might be the only way back to his body, after all. Now he had two women here he cared about. Real people he brought to life. He shook his head to clear it. He'd have to make that decision when it was time. No sense anguishing about it now. It would only bore the readers. The problem with this damn castle was that it had too many corridors. It had to have been created by some kind of random computer mapper. It made Dagerfall look like Berserker. He made his hear-noise check and heard a sound up ahead. He held up his hand and the party stopped behind him. He crept ahead, his sword out, ready to mete out backstabby death to anyone who came around the corner. Closer? Closer? He raised his sword at the sound of the person not ten feet away. The light flickered and cast strange leaping shadows. D'Amico poised to strike. Jerkin walked into view. The man seemed older now, elderly instead of middle-aged. It was as if the weight of the world beat upon him, as if he lived a fake life for so long that now that he was real, he aged at high speed, as if the author kept readjusting his age every scene, hoping you wouldn't notice. Jerkind? D'Amico? The man's voice was full of relief. I was afraid I wouldn't find you. Why are you looking? Are you dead? One-shot One resurrection. resurrection. They both said in unison, getting a jump on the script. Okay, why are you here? D'Amico asked. I came looking for you. I found out they'd captured you and brought you here. I came as quickly as I could. You just slipped through the guards? They didn't notice. D'Amico nodded. You're an NPC. Does that mean God is looking out for me? Jerkin asked. Just the opposite, D'Amico said. It means he doesn't really have a good idea what happens to you when you aren't with us. The party came up behind them. Jerkin, you old bastard, Forthander said. Did you write down your one-shot resurrection in ink, too? Huh? Never mind. We need to find Hraldolf, D'Amico said. But this place is a maze. I can find the way there, Jerkin said. How? Are you the architect? D'Amico searched his head for the cliché that would make all this logical. No, but I oversaw all the early plans. D'Amico still didn't have it. How? D'Amico, Jerkin said. I am your father. Oh, good grief, Gorthander hefted his axe. I'm killing him again. Stop, D'Amico said, holding out one hand. Gorthander stopped. D'Amico studied Jerkin. He could kind of see the likeness now, around the eyes. What do we do next? D'Amico asked. We, Latana said, we, 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 we. She skipped like a mail-order rental DVD. Mariana, D'Amico asked, watching as she performed the same movement over and over in a continuous loop. Then she disappeared. What the hell? D'Amico asked. Gorthander, Omar, and Arithian waved their hands through the spot she'd just been. D'Amico tried to figure out what strange blending of fantasy and the real could have caused this, but it was Arithian who hit on the answer. She was an illusion, he said suddenly. D'Amico squinted, trying to figure that out. Excuse me? He replaced her with an illusion, Arithian said. It must have just hit the end of its duration. He must have done it when we changed cells. Why? D'Amico asked. The evil overlord has appetites, Arithian said. He takes women to his chambers, does things with them. But he's changed, D'Amico said. From what I've heard in the last few villages, Arithian said, if anything, he's doing it more often. The village girls were very excited about it. Dear God, no, he said. Chapter 51 No Mirror Scenes, Bob Defendi Heraldoff sat in his throne room watching a fly buzz around his head. He had the woman in his bedchamber, not Beaver, kept an eye on her. It was the normal method of doing things, and right now Haraldoff enjoyed letting the mood build, delaying gratification. He discovered this trick on the last woman. It had been most pleasing. The fly buzzed and buzzed. He gazed at it pointedly. It continued buzzing. That was strange. Humans needed to see his face to die, but flies could measure his beauty with one glimpse of his eye. Was the fly blind? Another buzzed into the room. He gazed at it. It kept flying, too. If anything, they both looked drunk with pleasure. Strange. Get me a slave, he said. One of the guards stepped out and returned immediately. 
They kept slaves in a locker out front. The slave screamed and hollered as the guard dragged him down the plastic mat, twisting and tearing his clothes as he struggled. Heraldoff watched him distractedly, then told the guard, Avert your gaze. The guard did, and Heraldoff pulled off the mask. Nothing happened. The slave stared up into Heraldoff's eyes, his own face dreamy with ecstasy. Your majesty, you're exquisite. Heraldoff stood, waiting for the splash, but none came. The man didn't burst. He didn't even die. Heraldoff had lost his power. Frowning, he walked over to the mirror, stared into his own face for the first time in his life. It was exquisite, with skin so pure it appeared painted on. His eyes were deep, knowing, steel blue, his nose perfect, slender yet commanding. His jaw was a delicate arc from the chin to the joint. He was riveting, the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. He could barely tear his eyes away. The sight was that magnetic. But his hair was tousled, his clothes slightly askew. They added appeal, made him painfully attractive, but he wasn't perfect anymore. Not perfect enough to kill. He turned and all the guards gasped. They fell to their knees with their visors up, their expressions rapturous. A third fly took a doring orbit around his head. He couldn't kill, but he could enslave. He smiled. Take him away, he said. I'm going to visit the lady now. His grin widened. Chapter 52 I'm out of chapter quotes. Better start Act 3. Bob Defendi Jerkin led them down the halls of the Heart of Light, the old plan springing unbidden to his mind. Left here, then straight, then right. He ran, and he listened, and he smelled the air for clues. But the memories were still fresh after all these years. "'Are you sure you know where we're going?' Omar asked. "'I stared at these diagrams every day for a year, making tweaks here and there. I still dream them sometimes.' He stopped at the intersection and took a deep breath. "'We have to decide what to do from here.' "'What do you mean?' D'Amico asked. "'Well, this leads to the Lord's Chambers,' Jerkin gestured down the left path. "'This leads to the throne room,' he gestured the other direction. "'We go after Ladiana,' D'Amico said, his voice tight, the muscles in his neck straining. "'But where is she?' Jerkin asked. D'Amico stopped, blinking. "'In his chambers, right?' "'Unless she's in a slave bikini chained to his throne,' Gorthander said." D'Amico cursed, and his eyes darted around like a trapped animal. Jerkin's heart ached to see his son's pain. "'This is sick women in refrigerator bullshit!' D'Amico growled. "'I'm going to rip out Carl's throat and feed it to Gail Simone, the dirty son of a bitch!' "'What are you talking about?' Jerkin asked. "'Google it!' D'Amico said. Well, Jerkin had no idea what any of that meant, but this was the first time he'd seen D'Amico too upset to make a call. So he took a deep breath and said, Look, maybe we should make two groups. And maybe we should all split up, Omar said. Each with a flashlight. One of us is sure to find the axe murderer. What's a flashlight? Jerkin asked. A wand of light, Gorthander said with a dismissive gesture. His point is that splitting up is always a bad idea. Except when it isn't, Jerkin said. Oh, that's brilliant, Omar's voice dripped with sarcasm. I'm sold. Look, Jerkin said. I don't know what he's doing, but he let us out for a reason. So, D'Amico said. So it has to occur to him that you're going to try to stop him. So? Omar asked. So whatever he's planning, he must think he can do it before we get to him. Omar opened his mouth to say something, then snapped it closed. D'Amico looked back and forth between the two. You think he's toying with us, D'Amico said, taking a deep breath and visibly seizing control of his emotions. I don't think he would let you go if he thought you could stop him, Jerkin said. So, you're saying we have no chance of winning? I'm saying we have no time for arguing. Or staying together, good my lords, Arithian said. Or staying together, Jerkin nodded. This could be his plan, Grothender said. Split us up, kill us one by one. Because he's a theatrical git? D'Amico asked. He is the evil overlord, Grothender said. Point taken. D'Amico seemed to agonize. Then he nodded. Omar, you're with me. Jerkin and Gort, you go to the throne room. Arithian, make sure they don't kill each other. 
Jurgen nodded and described the route to the Lord's Chambers. Then he described it again. Then he described it a third time and made D'Amico recite it to him. Finally convinced D'Amico could find his way, he nodded at Gorathander, and they headed in the other direction. Do we have a plan? Jurgen asked as they ran down the corridor. Burst into the throne room, kill everyone inside, get the artifact. A good plan, pretty, Arithian said. Jurgen nodded and said, good plan. They ran down the halls and around corners. Soon they skidded around one last turn, Jurgen gasping short of breath. Three guards stood in front of them. They were huge, seven feet tall and four feet wide, covered in armor, heads like grapefruits on their shoulders. When Heraldoff was a boy, Jerkin had talked about using magical breeding programs to produce the perfect guard. Obviously, Heraldoff had taken the idea too seriously. The guards charged. "'Get past them if you can!' Jerkin shouted at Gorthander and Arithian. Jerkin had his one-shot resurrection, after all. Jerkin drew his two swords and charged, screaming like a fop in a mud factory, running into the guards. He hacked and thrust and smashed, and for a moment, just a moment, the juggernauts paused under his onslaught, looking for all the world like bulls that had just had their noses slashed by a kitten. In that pause, Gorthander shouldered past them, hugging the wall. One of the guards followed him, and Jerkin slashed his right-hand blade into the guard's back. The mail parted and bone splintered. The guard gurgled and fell. Gorthander and Erythian were passed, and Jerkin stood alone in the hall, fighting two men who were big enough to shit him in a privy. He was doomed. He'd die in seconds, but he wanted to make them long seconds. Get Gorthander a head start. Call the one kill good and end it there. If he could hold out long enough, Haraldoff might die before anyone could react. The boy could kill with a glance. If Gorthander didn't beat him fast, he couldn't beat him at all. Jerkin fell back under the sudden onslaught of the two guards, whipping his swords around, parrying like there was no tomorrow, parrying like the devil himself attacked, parrying like any other clichés you cared to think of. The guard on the left knocked Jerkin's sword away and slashed at his neck. Jerkin leaped back from the attack, a hot pain following the tip of the sword as it cut across his throat. A hot trickle of blood squirted down his front. Not a gush, just a squirt. He smiled. A clatter rang from the ground. His one-shot resurrection hit the stones, a small glass trinket. Jerkin's eyes widened as the guards stepped on the charm, shattering it. His last one-shot resurrection. Ah, hell! Chapter 53 You might want to close your eyes while you're reading the next part. Bob Defendi Ladiana came around slowly, her head aching as if a thousand drunken elves were inside, making a thousand chocolate shoes. She reached up and grabbed her forehead, poking herself in the nose as she did so. Her hands didn't work properly. She pulled them back and tried to work each of the fingers in turn. It was like trying to operate an elephant from the inside, using only pulleys and levers. "'What the hell? she said, then frowned. She looked around, the movement causing her vision to split— then come together again. She lay in a bed piled in furs. Around her a lavish bedchamber blurred out of focus. Some sort of gold-trimmed armoire stood in one corner, a large silver mirror in another. Fancy carved chairs and padded benches decorated the rest of the room. Over one of them hung her dress. She tried to peek under the covers, but it took three tries to make her hands grasp them. She wore nothing more than a light shift. She dropped the covers. What was going on here? Besides the obvious, it didn't take a mage's intellect to know why an evil overlord would stick a half-naked woman in his bed. The dress was reassuring, though. Maybe she was supposed to put it on. No, the thing that puzzled her was what was wrong with her hands and her mouth. She didn't feel drunk. She felt like she was hung over, but her body responded like she was drunk. Or drugged. She had to get out of here. If she couldn't move her hands, if she couldn't speak, she couldn't cast spells. She needed to move before somebody came. Ladiana fumbled aside the furs and swung up into the sitting position. It took three tries. She needed to take this slowly. She couldn't move too quickly when the slightest miscalculation could send her skull first into the flagstones. Ladiana placed both her feet firmly on the floor. Using her hand to form a tripod, she carefully heaved herself off the bed. Teetering there, she assessed her balance, then stood. She took a step. Another. 
her dress firmly in view as she stepped forward, and again, and again. It wobbled and wavered in her vision, but she made it there after a few eternal minutes. She lifted it into the air. Her shift barely reached to mid-thigh, and it was all but transparent. She had to get this dress on before walking out into the hallways filled with guards and servants and who knew who else. She examined the dress, and the laces in the back seemed undone. That was good news. She didn't think she could get the thing over her head before. Going somewhere? She spun and started to fall, barely catching her balance on the chair. She squinted across the room, but all she could see was a blurry form with a bald head and a round, shaggy body. Who are you? she asked. She'd been hoping for a maid and an invitation to dinner. That's what happened next when one woke up with a dress neatly laid out for them, wasn't it? The dress should be fancier, though. The overlord calls me not Beaver, but you can call me by my real name, Henchman. She tried to make out Henchman's details, and as he approached, she managed to focus. He was short and fat and covered in furs. His expression was one of... interest? She pulled up the dress in front of her. Goy, she said. I'm afraid, my lady, the evil overlord sent me to prepare you for tonight. Santa maid! Henchman chuckled and stretched out in a nearby chair. He examined her curiously, but the interest seemed more academic than threatening. I always prepare the ladies for an evening with the overlord. It's... tradition? She squinted down at him and swayed. He said, Sit down. It was better than falling down. She collapsed into her chair. She spread the dress over the front of her as demurely as her club hands could manage. I've been in his service a long time. Did you know that? You must be very prude. You probably meant proud, he said and smiled. I am, I suppose. Do you know what I've learned? She shook her head, but he continued without looking at her. It's all ashes. I was once content to do everything he asked. He was my only concern in the world. Now something's changed. I don't know if I love him or I hate him. I feel so strongly. It's hard to tell. She squinted at him. Where was this going? In the past, I just did what he said. I never thought about it. I did the bare minimum for myself. The rest was all for him. It's funny. He's given me so many leeways, especially of late. It's never occurred to me to indulge in them before. What's happened to me? The last came out very small and childlike. She tried to smile at this poor man. She knew exactly how he felt. She'd felt the same way since the change. She couldn't convey what it was like to be so empty inside and then to inexplicably have that emptiness fill. The poor fellow didn't even have a real name. She reached out to pat his hand, and only when hers flopped uselessly did she remember the drugs. For instance, the henchman said, considering her, he's given me very specific instructions on what I can do when preparing his women. Before tonight, I've never done them. He leered at her, and she went cold. Well, there are certain things I can't do and keep you fresh. There are many, many choices left to me. Henchman smiled and stood, smelling of wood chips and fur preservatives. He reached up and jerked the dress out of the way with a single pull, leaving her shivering and exposed in her shift. Very nice. She screamed. Chapter 54 And That Isn't Funny at All, Bob Defendi Haraldoff made it maybe fifteen feet when he heard fighting in the hall. He retreated to his throne room and glanced at the guards on either side. There were twelve total. The girl would have to wait for later. The guards moved to block the way behind him, and Haraldoff waited. A single dwarf came around the corner, his axe drawn and glowing with fell power. His chest heaved, but if Haraldoff knew dwarves, it had nothing to do with exhaustion and everything to do with excitement. The dwarf ached for battle. "'Little one,' Haraldoff said, beyond his wall of meat. "'Who are you calling little, Nancy boy?' the dwarf growled. But his expression was one of surprise. His eyes were locked, and the dwarf must have been shocked to have survived the process. 
just like that, it would have been over yesterday. Yesterday. Your name is Gorthander, correct? Oh, I, the dwarf said. Are you ready to die, Gorthander? Do you think you can kill me? Haraldolf stroked his clean face and shrugged. Perhaps not any more, but my guards can. How about you and I, Gorthander asked. Single combat. Why do I have the urge to say yes to that? Haraldolf asked. Good God, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Stupider than letting us escape? Gorthander asked. I had to know. The what? If I was the hero or the villain, Haraldolf whispered. And what do you think the answer is? Haraldolf didn't need to think any more. He closed his eyes and felt the tears welling up inside. Dear gods, he knew. Maybe that was actually why he'd let them out in the first place. He knew. I'm the villain. Then time to die. The dwarf charged into the guards, and Haraldolf turned away. He was the villain. He was actually the villain. Dear gods, what did that mean? The grunts and howls of combat echoed behind him. He didn't watch. Gorthander hacked and growled, axe and sword and armor ringing on one another. The villain. He couldn't be the villain. He'd done all this for his people. He'd done all this for humanity. Even destroying the world had been for the good of his people. But why? Die! Gorthander screamed. The grunts and the hollering intensified. Blood spattered loudly on plastic mat like paint on a tarp. The villain. The villain. Dear gods, the villain. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath. He had to decide what to do. He had to plan his next move. With a grunt, his final guard fell. He turned, and Gorthunder stood there, doused in blood, a great statue in tribute to slaughter, a mighty visage of death and strength and terror. The dwarven warrior, so iconic, he was a cliché in and of himself. The guards sprawled around him, hacked and carved into torn chunks of red meat, pieces of twisted armor peeking through the mess. This was only slightly more coherent-looking than one of his guards after he displeased Heraldoff. The overlord had to admit it. The dwarf got the job done. You killed my guards. Twelve of the best guards in the world. I'm a player character, the dwarf said. Gorthander, Heraldoff said, falling into talking mode. Villain mode, he now realized. Gorthander, what do you expect to accomplish? I can see your face, and I ain't blown up, Gorthander said. What do you expect to accomplish? I don't need to blow you up, Gorthander, Heraldoff said. He scanned the dozens of dents and tears in the dwarf's armor. You sure you don't want to heal up before this fight? Gorthander watched him suspiciously. What's the trick? No trick. Stand as far away as you like. Gorthander backed up until he could watch both the door and Herald off, and he cast a healing spell on himself. The dwarf shivered, then drew to full height. Perfect. New. And he could single-handedly defeat twelve of Heraldolf's guards. I still don't get it, Gorthander asked. You're no good to me, wounded. Heraldolf smiled. His gaze hadn't worked passively on the dwarf. They probably didn't find humans all that pretty to begin with. But now the dwarf's eyes lit up in delight, and he fell to the stone floor, his chest heaving in rapture. He gazed on Heraldolf, and he was the overlord's slave. Master, Gorthander said. Yes. Chapter 55 No Joke Now, Writing, Bob Defendi D'Amico and Omar sprinted through the halls of the Heart of Light, tearing around corners, racing upstairs. D'Amico's lungs rasped. He wasn't pacing for distance. He burned calories like a ton of bacon fat in a coke furnace. They burst out onto the top floor of the palace, staring down the hall into the necks of ten soldiers in front of a door. Those necks were each the size of a torpedo. Their arms could tear the roots out of mountains, and their swords would have made Damocles' entire family cower in fear. D'Amico didn't have time to worry or think. He charged. Omar surged ahead, his sword out, screaming a bloody battle cry, but D'Amico's feet hit the floor and twisted out from underneath him. He barreled into a tumble, barking both knees and knocking the wind from him. Omar filled the hallway, hacking and cutting and generally being Omar. 
D'Amico stared down at his foot. It felt funny. It looked funny, too. Or rather, it looked exactly like it was supposed to, if it were transparent. He could see the floor through it, the wall, the stairway at the end of the hall, everything. Then it solidified. Damn it! He rolled back onto his knees and rose. He felt like Marty McFrickin' Fly. What was going on here? Had he finally brought too many people to life? Or was he dying? Dear God, no. That was it. He was dying. He had slipped away in the real world, and now his soul was without an anchor. He had, what, five minutes? Ten? Thirty on the outside? This was it. The big question mark. Death. The Reaper. His mortal coil had taken up square dancing. No. He stepped forward, carefully placing his feet, which seemed happy to comply for the moment. He stumbled more quickly toward Omar, who had already dropped the first bad guy. D'Amico held up his sword, and it flickered with power. Carl had seen this coming all that time ago. He'd given them these weapons just for this palace. This was it. He was at the end of the adventure. But the end. How? Omar bellowed and hacked down a second foe, then one of them thrust a lucky blade through his defenses and into his belly. Crying out, he fell back. Tag! D'Amico screamed, leaping into place. He parried and hacked as Omar pulled out a potion bottle and uncorked it. D'Amico could hold them now. First one attacked, then the other. Then D'Amico found his opening. It happened like that over and again. And he didn't have trouble with the multiple foes. They took turns. Carl must have been rolling separate initiatives for the bad guys. D'Amico had a hand it to him. The boy had heart. That was a lot of damn bookkeeping. D'Amico hacked and hacked, cutting through their hit points, whittling away until the first one dropped, gasping. Then he started on the second, his initial stance defensive until he figured out the new pattern of initiative rolls. And then he hacked again, the niggling pains of his own whittled hit points aching. He wished Gorthander was with them. Omar loomed behind him, and he cut and dropped a second one. Tag! he shouted, stepping back. Omar leaped up into position, and D'Amico could barely stand still from the anticipation. He wanted to be first. He needed to be first, but the numbers clicked through D'Amico's head, and he knew that under these conditions, Omar had a higher damage per second. He was the best at being a Viking. But still, the images of Ladiana ate away inside his head. He could see her there in his mind's eye, lying under a grunting hurled off, raped by his own brother. The gorge rose in D'Amico's throat. He had to fight. But he couldn't. He had to sit here, helplessly for her sake. Omar could cut through this brute squad faster than D'Amico in his wildest dreams. Another wave of shakiness passed over D'Amico, and he fell to one knee. He held up his hand, and he could see through it now. At least he was taking a breather, not playing Johnny Be Good. He shook and stared at the hand and willed it to become solid again. Somewhere, his body lay dying on a bed because his soul wasn't in it. He knew if he could just be there, he could give his body the will to fight. He had the strength. He could do it. But he couldn't get there. He was trapped here, and that was the end, dead in a hallway, faded away to be replaced moments later by an NPC simulacrum. Carl wouldn't miss a beat, he knew. Somehow, he knew Carl knew that he knew. They were connected, the two of them. He could sense the reality of this place with a certainty he found inexplicable. But it was here. He knew how it worked. He knew why it worked. He struggled to his feet again, and Omar had only two guards left. Then he hacked, and there was only one. Omar fought not like a banshee, not like a berserker. In truth, he didn't even fight like a Viking anymore. He would call out battle cries now and then, but it no longer held the excitement he carried at the beginning of the battle. Now he cut with a perfect economy of movement. Twist, just so to parry. Faint, ever so slightly thus. Attack, parry, riposte, and his blade bit the bad guy. Now that the battle had gone this long, Omar wasn't a barbarian or a madman. He was a professional. This was what he did, and nobody did it better. Q. Carly Simon. The last guard dropped, and D'Amico shot past Omar. He slipped in the blood and pressed on. He scrambled to the door, and his head passed straight through the ring. He collapsed, his breathing ragged, the insubstantiality bordering on pain. 
and he had control again. He straightened and reached for the ring. The woman he loved was on the other side. He heaved and threw the door open. He raised his sword in triumph and shouted, Hey, you! Get your damn hands off her! But there was no one there. Not only was there no one there, but the room was disused. The bed cleaned even of the mattress. No one had used this place in years. The guards hadn't been guarding. They'd probably been on break. This was the wrong room. Chapter 56 Now is the time for all good players to come to the aid of their party. Bob Defendi Die, you son of a bitch! Jerkin fought like a cat. Meaning that he made himself appear as big as possible, scratched for the groin, and generally sprayed a lot of saliva. The two guards attacked him, giant men wielding weapons that looked almost like toys in their hands. But they weren't toys, not unless you were the type of child who liked to play with entrails. He ducked under a blade and stumbled backward. These weren't the most talented fighters in the world, but neither was jerkined, and what these guards lacked in skill they made up for in sheer acreage, muscle mass, and applied leverage. The guard's sword smashed into the wall, spraying gravel across jerkined. The little man smiled, fainted, and kicked the one on the left in the groin with all of his might. The guard rattled like a bag of coins, but that was the only sign of damage. The guard chuckled. Ah, oh, hell, Jerkin said, then ran. The guards didn't run. They walked. He ran ahead of them and rounded the first corner. They clanked loudly behind, close, as if they teleported right behind him. He turned to find the guards, still walking, rounding the corner ten feet back. That was odd. When he made it to the next corner, they walked forty feet behind. But when he came around that corner, the sound of their clanking immediately became very loud and close. He glanced over his shoulder, and they rounded the corner, not ten feet back. Freaking! Okay, so they were magical chase guards. He twisted around another corner and another, and each time he lost sight of them, they miraculously appeared on his heels again. He played the floor plan of the palace through his head until he found a long stretch. Three more corners, and he was there. The corridor was some hundred feet long, skirting down one side of the Heart of Light. It had no doors along its length, opening into the gong pits at the end. He didn't know what he'd do when he got there, but it was better than running until he fell over dead. By the end of the hallway, he had an eighty-foot lead on the guards. He found a door and threw it open, expecting to be hit by the smell of human waste. Instead, he found a long shaft with rungs hammered into the wall like God's staples. Jerkin glanced back at the guards. Seventy feet. He examined the shaft. Haraldoff had changed the plans. Where did it lead? The facts fell into place now, heavy, unyielding. Facts made by a blacksmith with durability issues. Gorthander hadn't come back to rescue him. That meant Gorthander was dead. That meant Haraldoff was alive. That meant they'd failed. That meant they were all going to die. If he had been an investment banker instead of a retired overlord, there would have been bullets next to those facts. But his fantasy world status didn't change the way they lined up, besides having all the vats and all the ments on top of one another. It was a pretty bit of logic. Inescapable. Like the guards. Or marriage. Or those criers that shouted into your window to sell you stuff when you were eating dinner. And, unlike the criers, this problem couldn't be solved with a crossbow bolt, a shovel, and a discreet friend. He stepped out into the darkness, catching a rung and pulling his weight out over the drop. He craned his neck so that he could see the guards the entire time, and started down. When he finally lowered himself below the level of the floor, the clinking sound became much closer. He climbed as fast as he could, and one of the guards eclipsed the light of the doorway. The monster swung out under the rungs after him. The shaft was damp, the rungs slick as he descended. Above him, the metal of the rungs strained audibly. Flecks of rust drifted down into his eyes, causing them to burn and itch. Faster and faster he climbed, though it was obviously too late. The sound of snapping rungs announced the great rushing on approach of the fallen guard. He barely had time to step off into the air before the armored louts smashed into him, carrying him down, down, under a great weight. He hit with a splash, sending a spray of water into the air even as the guard drove him deep, a wedge carving through the smothering water. 
He struggled and flailed and managed to get out from beneath the guard, to swim upward even as his lungs burned and complained. His head burst through the surface. He splashed and gasped in the cold, wet pit. Who put a pool in a shaft in the middle of a castle? He didn't understand. He swam, searching for the ladder, but couldn't find the rungs. That was good and bad. Bad because he couldn't see a way to climb out. Good because he was pretty sure the sinking guard wore too much armor to swim to the surface. The light shone down, thin and weak. He peered up at the door, four stories above him. The head of the second guard leaned over the edge. Jerkin relished a good, obscene gesture, and he tried several now, those that didn't involve legs and feet at any rate. A strange, hard form brushed past his leg, massive in the deep, narrow pool. He jerked away with that same panic one feels when caught by a really wicked piece of seaweed. He scanned the surface of the placid water, but he could see nothing except cold, inky fluid. What the hell? A dorsal fin sliced up to the surface, and everything became clear. Chapter 57 Still, Better Look Away, Bob Defendi The squirming, awful little man threw Ladiana to the bed and then climbed on top of her. Tears rolled down her cheeks and she thrashed and fought. This wasn't happening. Not to her. It wasn't happening. It was someone else. Someone else. He reached down, his hand moving along her body, rude, grasping, the nails catching and pulling on her shift. His fingers moved like a rasp, rough along her thigh, then fumbled at himself, loosening clothing, rearranging, getting ready. She needed to get out of here, to leave her body. She could float out of herself, be another person, just for the duration. She needed to be gone. She needed to be free. Free. Ladiana stopped struggling. Her ineffectual slaps quieted. She became cold, lifeless. This flesh wasn't hers. This body wasn't hers. This was merely a piece of meat. A thing. Not her at all. Someone else. Finally, he stopped his fumbling and smiled down at her. It was time. He was going to do it now. Not to her. To someone else. No. To her. Not someone else. Not some stranger. To her. To her body. To her psyche. To her soul. She couldn't avoid it. Wouldn't avoid it. This was the world she lived in. This was real. She could deny it, or she could face it. She could surrender, or she could fight. Fight! She reached up with her weak, trembling left hand. The fingers still shook, but she forced them up. Those fingers wrapped around his throat. She squeezed, but she had no strength. Couldn't so much as force the windpipe closed. The hand just hung there, on his throat, spasming. Not enough. Not enough. He pulled back, supporting himself on his left arm as he looked down, first at her hand, then at her. Ah, I was really rooting for you there, he said. Wait, she slurred. I'm not done. With that, she heaved her body sideways. She was weak, but she managed to hop six inches, catching his supporting elbow with her shoulder. With a twitch, it folded, and his weight came hurtling down at her. But her hand was still in his throat, her forearm hanging below it. He drove her elbow into the bed, transferring all his weight onto that post of an arm into her hand. He landed on his own voice box. He fell off her limp arm and rolled onto his side, gasping. She threw herself up onto the edge of the bed and swayed to her feet. She couldn't run. She had to keep from falling. She stumbled one step and then another. The door loomed closer. A step. A step. She reached out for the ring of the door. She pulled at it, but her fingers didn't have the strength. She tried again, and her fingers slipped off. A gurgling sound came from the bed. She needed to get out. She couldn't get this far and not get out. This wasn't how this ended. This time, she pushed her arm through the ring, used her weight to pull the arm as a lever. The metal bit painfully into the flesh of her forearm, but the door scraped open. Bitch! He shouted behind her. Ladiana stumbled out into the hall. Omar! fought six guards on her right, his back to her. Oma! she screamed. 
He shot a glance her way, then back at the guards. They had him pinned down, and he cursed as he renewed his fighting. D'Amico! he yelled. She's down this way! I can't get to her! Then henchmen smashed into her, knocking her into the wall across from the door. He pressed against her. The tears started again. At least it wasn't in front of D'Amico. It was only Omar who would see. "'Thought you were going to get away,' the henchman rasped. "'Screw you,' she said. "'Don't mind if I do.' Omar bellowed, and Ladiana faced him. He stood there, his face a mask of fury, as henchmen fumbled with her shift from behind. He pulled his attention from the guards and raced toward her, his back exposed. She sensed henchmen craning to see, and heaved her head back, smashing it into his nose. He bellowed and fell into the doorway, but caught the frame and hurled himself out at her again. Omar ran three steps before one of the guards raked a blade across his back, spraying the corridor with blood and bits of rib. He bellowed like a wounded ox and stumbled, regaining his balance even as a second guard hacked, severing his left arm at the elbow. But he didn't stop. He didn't slow. Heaving himself forward, his blood spilling out, he continued, his eyes already dead, his mouth screaming, his axe raised in the air. It came down in an awful sweep, and Ladiana looked as henchmen caught the blade in the head. Both of them teetered, blood spilling onto the stone, and they fell into one another, and then to the ground. Ladiana shook. The two mutilated bodies glistened as an expanding pool of blood, bone, and gristle spilled out onto the floor. They were dead. Beyond dead. They were destroyed. She looked up at the guards, six of them. They filled the hallway like a single file line of boulders rolling calmly down the hall. Omar was gone. D'Amico and Erythian and Gorthander were nowhere to be found. She was alone, alone in front of an unstoppable force. At one time in her life, she had felt entitled to the world, like enemies were nothing but a perfectly metered challenge that she could defeat with methodical ease. But since she changed, since she'd begun to feel real, nothing was so certain. She stared at this wall of metal and muscle and knew that they were just men, and she was just a woman, helpless with the drugs. Omar. Her eyes welled, but the tears weren't for her. Omar. It used to feel like the world was a game for her to win. Now she knew it was nothing more than a series of events, any one of which could destroy her. Six men, six new potential killers, or captors, or tormentors. Did it matter? She ran. Chapter 58 One Player Character Left Bob Defendi Raldoff gazed down at Gorthander and stroked the side of the dwarf's face. My pet. Master. A thump sounded by the door as the bard stepped into view. What was his name? Oh, yes. Arithian, where have you been? I went on a drink run, you bastard! You weren't supposed to start without me! Raldoff didn't know what that meant, but nodded. So, it comes to this. Pretty... It does. Do you even know what pretty means? Shut up, Arithian circled. Do you think you can beat me? Haraldoff smiled, causing the torches in the room to flare. My dear sweet overlord, Arithian said, I'm immune to charm spells. Haraldoff shrugged. Are you immune to dwarven clerical berserkers? Gorthander would never kill me. I never really liked you. Gorthander said. All those these and thous talk like a normal damn person. Arithian frowned, doubtful. He looked back and forth between Haraldoff and Gorthander. Don't do this, Haraldoff. We can't let you destroy the world. But I must, Haraldoff said. Because the adventure says so. Shut up, Haraldoff said. This is madness. This is my life's work, Heraldoff glowered. Why? The words spilled out of Heraldoff faster than he could think them. Because I have this face. Because I've spent my life as a pariah. Because my father left me, my brother left me, alone. Can you imagine what it was like to be alone, no matter how many people are in the room? Can you imagine what it's like to know that no one can ever look you in the face. No woman, no man, even your family flinches when they see you. Imagine 
that! The rage boiled in him, a rage he barely understood. Arithian shook his head. Fine, Phantom, go back to your opera house. He rolled his eyes as if he thought this was some badly thought-out story. This was no story. This was Heraldoff's life. Do not mock me, Bard. No, Arithian shook his head. Please tell me about your pain. His voice dripped with sarcasm. I will kill you, Heraldoff said. I will kill you all. What a great way to know love, Arithian said. What do you know about me, Heraldoff said. My spies report on you, a woman on each arm, the others gazing at you with dreamy expressions. You can never know my pain. Let me get my violin, Arithian said. The little son of a bitch. This silly adventurer was mocking him. He'd laugh if it wasn't so sad. Didn't he know what Heraldoff felt? Didn't he know what it was like to suffer this much? No. No one in the world did. That's why. That's why he was doing it. Gorthander, Heraldoff said. Kill him. The dwarf screamed and launched himself at the bard. Heraldoff let Gorthander handle it. This was it. He finally had his answer. Up until now, the pieces of his life had fallen into place one at a time. The peasants, the women, the art. He thought of these things one by one, and with each, he felt more like a real person. Had he been hollow for so many years because of the pain? Was that why he'd been so two-dimensional? So silly, so shallow? Maybe, but with the sudden exposure to his own inner turmoil, he understood. He'd never noticed it before. He'd never seen all that anguish and loneliness below the surface. The clash of weapons rang behind him, the dwarf snarling with battle rage. With this last piece, he finally felt whole. He could sense it all clicked together. This was it. He was a complete person. The dwarf roared. Heraldoff heard a wail of pain from Erythian. Heraldoff reached into his belt pouches, pulled out the two artifacts. He looked at them. This was all he needed. With these, he could destroy the world. Gorthander had opened a large wound in Erythian's belly, and the bard lay on the floor now, gasping. Gorthander smiled above him. "'What do you want, master?' Gorthander asked as if he sensed Heraldoff's attention. "'I want to destroy the world,' Heraldoff whispered. "'Gods help him. He did. He had to end it all. "'Should I kill him?' "'Go ahead,' Heraldoff raised the artifacts. "'It won't matter.' Chapter 59 You didn't think this was going to end well, did you? Bob Defendi. D'Amico stumbled back into the corridor, his breath aching in his lungs. He came on the site of slaughter. Past three dead guards lay Omar in what used to be a man. Omar's back was open, the armor rent, bone and bits of lung exposed. The other man's head had been cloven in two by Omar's axe. But where was Laniana? He stumbled down the hall, staring down at the body of his dead friend, but he couldn't bring himself to grieve. Ladiana was still out there, still in trouble. Omar had said she was here. He noticed the door open next to the body, stumbled over to it, and checked inside. A bed in the center of the room looked rumpled from some kind of struggle. Her dress lay to one side. He was too late. Dear God, he was too late. He stepped in, the pain pounding in his heart. This was where he'd failed her. Why even bother going on? He'd already failed the woman he loved. Maybe he should just let the world end. He still believed that, didn't he? If he let the world end, he'd be released. He wasn't sure that meant he went home. Maybe the alternative was he simply ceased to be. That would be good, too. Another racking pain hit him, this one making his knee invisible. He hissed through gritted teeth and waited for it to subside. Maybe he didn't have to go home. Maybe it was too late for everyone. He started to leave and saw an armoire, the door ajar. After limping over, he opened the door. There were clothes inside. At the bottom, a chest. His knee felt solid again, so he genuflected and opened the lid. There was a sock inside. 
a pile of new batteries, some guns from Star Wars action figures, one cufflink, a television remote control. And it started to make sense. Plot coupons. He'd seen them in so many games and stories. You needed to find the red key to open the red door. You needed to find the ingredients to make the poison. You had to get the pieces to reassemble the artifact. Plot coupons. Collect them all, and you can progress to Act 3. They were like storytelling trading cards. But Carl was working it backward, perhaps in an attempt to be less cliché. In this adventure, D'Amico wasn't trying to collect the plot coupons. Raldolf was. And from what D'Amico saw, he collected a lot of other things along the way. But D'Amico knew now. He understood the shape of it. The artifact was a plot coupon. Raldolf had it, and he could destroy the world. And D'Amico suspected what it was. This was so much worse, because he knew they'd failed. Worse, because he knew Gorthander couldn't win. Jerkind couldn't win. Only D'Amico would know how to use the artifact when he saw it, and he'd sent the others into the lion's den. He'd lost. He'd never make it back in time to stop Haraldoff. That meant they would all die. Too late for him to get back to his body. Too late for Lariana, if she were still alive. Too late. He hung his head. What had he done? Why had he let his emotions get in the way? It was all so obvious. He should have understood in the beginning. But he didn't, and now he'd failed them all. All those people he'd brought to life would die. It was all his fault. No. He forced himself to his feet. He had to get the artifact. Keep fighting. Maybe Haraldoff would monologue. D'Amico had to keep fighting. A scream echoed down the hall. He ran out of the room and heard the scream again. Ladiana. She was still alive. Alive and somewhere to the left, still screaming. Maybe not raped after all, but to the left. The throne room was to the right. But there wasn't time. He already wasted too much because he hadn't figured it out sooner. He could head to the left and save her, and Haraldoff would probably destroy the world. Or he could go right. Save the woman he loved and let them all die. Or save the world and live with the guilt forever. He closed his eyes and cursed, the abyss opening beneath him, the pain spreading out into his limbs, everything fading, fading, fading. Chapter 60 He Disagreed with Something That Ate Him Bob Defendi Quoting Ian Fleming Jerkin froze quite figuratively. The water was the temperature of urine. If you think that's a coincidence, you've never shared a tank with a shark. He went limp, floating like the metaphorical seaweed from Chapter 56. He needed time. Time to think, chiefly. But millions of years of survival instinct also wanted time for time's sake. It doesn't care what you use the time for. Something sprinkled down out of the walls, and the smell of the water became strange and pungent, not a smell he usually associated with shark tanks. He tried to nail down the odor, but after a futile second, his mind kicked out all speculation in favor of planning for his next heartbeat of oxygen-enriched blood. That was all the brain cared about, no matter what anyone else told you. But the shark or sharks could put a stop to that. He needed a plan beyond holding still and hoping the drowned guard hadn't scraped himself and bled on the way down. Jerkind, being a retired overlord, knew a good deal about sharks. He knew swimming and thrashing about attracted them. He knew blood attracted them. He knew they rarely attacked anything bigger than them. Finally, he knew they hated the taste of human flesh. And still, that smell made his eyes water. It seemed stronger now. He took a breath. He needed to stay calm. The hysteria dragged at him. He needed to keep his cool. He couldn't risk any accidents. The smallest drop of blood in this water would mean death, or at least a savage tasting. The thought didn't appeal to him. Here, at the bottom of the shaft, the water glimmered darkly. It still rolled and splashed with the earlier impact of the guard, each wave slightly smaller than the last. The black water and silver pox-ridden crests made for a mesmerizing sight. It took some time for him to wonder what would give the water pox. 
He reached out carefully, skimming his hand across the surfaces, catching dozens of little bits of debris floating there. He pulled his hand into what light he could see from above him. Flecks of wet matter clung there. He pulled them to his nose and sniffed. That smell came from these bits of muck. He'd seen them fall in. Maybe the sharks had a button underwater that released them? He chuckled at the thought. He stopped. Slowly, his hand trembling with terror, with the effort, he brought it over to his mouth. With a tentative, seeking tongue, he licked his hand, tasting an explosion of spices and salt, a miraculous, marvelous taste. It was seasoning. Ah, hell, he said. The shark took its first bite, tearing the tender muscles of his belly, pulling out bowels, reaching for those tasty, seasoned organs. Jerkin screamed, but only briefly. Chapter 61 Superman never had trouble with dilemmas like this, Bob Defendi. D'Amico stood, paralyzed with terror. On the one hand, the woman he loved. On the other, the world. The rational part of his mind screamed the answer was obvious, but his soul wouldn't listen. This wasn't a time for rational thought. This was a time for action. But there was just no way to act. He carried a dagger in his hand. His fingers twitched and went numb. The knife slowly tumbled from his grasp. His ears filled with the echoes of her last scream. His mind's eye filled with images of her raped and broken, wondering why he'd abandoned her. This was supposed to be a game. This was supposed to be a series of escalating fights leading to a boss monster. It was supposed to be rollicking. It was supposed to be funny. What the hell had happened? The answer, of course, was he had happened. He transformed the lifeless into the living. He'd given will and strength and freedom to the story-bound, a third dimension to the caricatures. If he hadn't, she would be fine. If he hadn't, he would never have loved her. His mind raced faster and faster along paths of guilt and damnation. His fault. All his fault. He needed to save her and the world. He needed to have his cake and eat it, too. This was a game. This was about wish fulfillment. Who would wish for this? No, he had to move, or both the woman and the world would be lost. He had to move. The dagger clattered as it hit the floor. D'Amico picked a direction and took off. He knew in his heart, no matter how rationally he explained it, she'd never forgive him for this. Chapter 62 There was nothing funny about that either, Bob Defendi. Laliana ran, her bare feet slapping against paving stones as she tore through the halls of the Heart of Light. She ran, and she screamed incoherently, and she didn't look back. She could hear them walking calmly behind her, catching up every time she rounded a corner. They came, and nothing slowed them. Nothing stopped them. Laliana had to get away, but the wind tore at her lungs, ripped her throat raw, her side stitched. They'd run her down and catch her. She kept pushing and pushing, but her feet fumbled on the paving stones now. With one last step, she stubbed her toe in a brilliant explosion of pain and canted onto the stone floor. The fall tore her shift and bruised her knees. She sprawled, scraping her hands and thighs, then banging her head against the stone in a cascade of stars and blood. It was all she could do to writhe in agony. She had to get up and get away, but she couldn't move. The pain had become everything. The wet feel of blood, her only relief from the torture of her wounds. Finally, her gaze cleared. The guard stood, filling the hall at her feet, watching her with impassive expressions. They probably wouldn't rape her. They seemed more golems than men. But that didn't mean she could afford to have them take her. They'd carry her to the chamber or a cell, and then the overlord or another of his henchmen would have her. She needed to run, but she had nothing left inside. Just a raw, rasping breath that barely drew enough air to right her spinning head. "'Die!' she said. One of the guards reached for her, but she acted instinctively. The running, the clear word, the strength in her limbs when she fell, it all came together at once, and arcane words scratched out of her mouth and at her ears. 
a blast of lightning launched out of her hand, catching the first guard in the chest. Lightning should have sheeted across his armor, grounding away without killing him, but the same magic that directed it through the air also directed it through his heart, causing him to collapse in a spasming pile of armor and seared meat. The other guards gaped at her, stunned, then rushed toward her, but already she jumped to her feet, her hand and eyes flickering with power. She was back, and it was time to the lightning ripped from her hands, too eager to even let her finish the thought. It caught one of the guards in the chest, launching out the other side and catching the next, then the next. When it finished crackling in the air, four of the guards dropped, leaving only a single man standing amid a halo of smoke and the smell of burning hair. Re consider she said it didn't sound impressive as she vainly tried to tuck the torn part of her shift together the guard examined her bared bloodied limbs he took a step forward she raised her hands reciting the words of the spell but her tongue still felt slightly thick in her mouth her reflexes just a little slow it wasn't until she slurred the first words she realized that while she could cast spells she couldn't cast them reliably the power of the spell writhed out of control of her misspoken words, flashing through her brain with searing heat that roared in her ears. One moment she was clear and in control and winning, and the next she landed on those abused knees, holding her head and screaming in time with the pain. Her entire body ached as she tilted over to one side, the power reverberating in her skull. Her body went limp, and she fell to the ground. She stared dully at the guard standing over her. He grinned and kicked her smashing her back into the wall. She tried to scream again, but she didn't have the strength. Blood stained her eyes. Her limbs still shook in the wake of the power. There was nothing she could do to stand. And so she didn't. He kicked her again, shattering a rib, then plucked her off the ground, tearing her shift further. She hung there, broken, bleeding, and stunned, staring into that wide, pitiless face. She reached vainly for her magic, but it was gone now, burned out, maybe permanently. She spat blood across his face, and he grinned. In the distance, a noise rose, the sound of leather slapping on stone over and over again. She tried to see past the guard, but he blocked sight lines better than mountains. The slapping grew louder, faster. The guard glanced over his shoulder to see who was coming. He faced the new foe, but he was implacable. That wasn't the same as fast. A blade burst, tip first from the back of his neck, sending him crashing to the ground. He hit with a tooth-rattling impact, a spray of arterial blood dousing her, even as the sound of the footsteps dropped in pitch, receding now. D'Amico shot by in a dead run. He waved one hand without looking back. "'Can't stay!' he shouted. "'Saving the world! Forgive me!' He rounded the corner, still in a full-out run. For several seconds, his footsteps echoed back to her. She managed to lower the guard's body off her legs. She needed to get out of the open hall, so she crawled to the nearest door and pushed it open. She screamed at what she saw. Chapter 63 Hey, if Dan Brown can do it, I can do it. Bob Defendi D'Amico had read once that a properly conditioned human can run down a deer. Not only was D'Amico not nearly that fit, but his character wasn't either. On top of that, the painful insubstantiability, okay, I'm bluffing, that isn't a word, tore at him as he ran, slowing him, stopping him even, in his final push to the throne room. By the end of the run, he wasn't just exhausted. Every limb rang with pain. He stumbled the last few yards, his hands folded behind his head, allowing his lungs to fill like they taught him in high school football. He needed time to catch his breath. Still, with a misleadingly relaxed appearance, he rounded the corner and gazed at the throne room. Blood and gory remains of guards plastered the floor. To one side, Gorthander stood over Arithian, the axe bloody, the bard bloodier. In the back of the room, Heraldoff lifted two objects into the air. They were small, and D'Amico couldn't make them out at this distance, but they had to be the artifacts. Wind ripped about Heraldoff. A swirling cloud of flies surrounded him. Hey! D'Amico shouted. Gorthander, Arithian, and Heraldoff turned to him at once. Arithian looked sheepish. "'What the hell?' D'Amico said. "'I,' Arithian said, but D'Amico was having nothing of excuses. Arithian practically bled out. D'Amico needed to seize control of the situation. "'You!' he shouted, pointing at the bard. "'You were supposed to stall!' "'But I was on a drink. You!' D'Amico pointed at Heraldoff. 
Don't you know that I'm the damn hero? You can't destroy the world without telling me your evil plans. But I... He told them to me, shut up! D'Amico managed to mask his gasps by making them into screams. People gasped when they screamed, right? He pointed at Gorthender. And you! Dwarves get a plus six bonus to all resistance attempts versus magic! Oh, Gorthender said, lowering his axe. I forgot to add that in. Damn it! Do I have to do everything here? They all exchanged sheepish glances. Gorthander held out a hand and helped Arithia into his feet. Heraldoff shifted around, uncomfortably avoiding eye contact. All right, D'Amico said. That's better. Now, where were we? Dying, Arithian said. Killing him, Gorthander said. Destroying the world, Heraldoff said. D'Amico shook his head. His breath had returned enough for him to yell, but his heart still pounded so hard he could feel it behind his eyes. He needed a few more minutes, and then he'd be right as rain. He'd be a peach. Damn it! Even he was doing the clichés now. All right. D'Amico heaved a long-suffering sigh, more gasp camouflage. I'm going to make my entrance again, and I want you to be in a suitably dramatic moment when I do. That was dramatic, Raldoff said. D'Amico glared at Heraldoff, and the man stared back, exasperated. D'Amico shook his head and walked back out of the room, holding his posture until he rounded the corner out of sight and collapsed against the wall, his chest heaving for breath. Sounds from the room allowed him to judge the movements as he gasped. He checked his hand. It shook, but appeared solid. Good. He closed his eyes and rose to his full height. Still too tired, he stepped back around the wall and into the entrance of the throne room. Raldoff stood before the throne, the two artifacts held out boldly in front of him. Gorthander and Arithian stood with their backs to the door, their weapons out. Arithian dripped blood into a growing pool. He swayed as if the standing took a tremendous feat of will. "'You will not stand against us, overlord!' Gorthander shouted. D'Amico hung his head. "'Keep stalling.' "'You've got to be kidding me!' "'What?' Gorthander asked. "'I look pretty impressive,' Haraldoff said. "'I'm a little light-headed,' Arithian said. "'Gorthander, heal Arithian,' D'Amico said. "'He wouldn't be hurt in the first place if you'd read your damn character sheet.' Haraldoff? "'Good. Don't change anything, but you'll have a line.' He considered them, his breath finally slowing as Gorthander finished healing Arithian. Gorthander, you say this ends here. But he won't stand against us. Less is more, Gorthander. Heraldoff, when he says that, you say, but there are only two of you. Oh, and that isn't cheesy, Heraldoff said. We're playing to the classics here. D'Amico started out of the room. This ends here, Gorthander bellowed. D'Amico stopped. Good feeling. But do you think you can wait until I leave the room? Sorry. D'Amico stepped out. He finally had his breath and heart now, and he didn't think he could stall any longer. This was it. This ends here! But there are only two of you. Three! D'Amico said, rounding the corner, his sword out. Twenty! Twenty! The guard said, stepping out of the back, still strapping on armor. Damn it! Heraldoff had been stalling him. Chapter 64 So be it, Jedi. Bob Defendi, you don't want to know what he was wearing. Heraldoff smiled as the guards swarmed around his throne, facing off with the three heroes. This was it, his moment of truth. He didn't need to win. He only needed time to use the artifact. He held both of them up now as the first ringing sounds of metal on metal echoed through the halls. Heraldoff! D'Amico shouted over the din. Shut up, Heraldoff shouted back. Don't you want to tell me what this is all about? I told your bard, he shouted. That's the same as telling the world. It's Phantom of the Opera meets Moonraker. Arithian shouted as he ducked under the arm of one of the guards. Huh? Never mind, it isn't too late, D'Amico shouted back. You aren't convincing me, Heraldoff said as both artifacts hummed with power in front of him. I'm still destroying the world. I mean, it's not too late to come up with a good motivation, D'Amico cried as he stumbled back under a storm of armor and weapons. Heraldoff only watched peripherally. Come on, Moonraker was terrible, D'Amico shouted. 
Don't mock my pain, Hraldoth snarled, looking directly at the fight for the first time. The guards swirled around the three men, and Gorthander was the only one trained for a stand-up fight. He'd already killed one. Give me a pain I can't mock, D'Amico shouted. Hraldoth locked eyes with his brother and spat. You want pain? I'll give you pain. With that, he gestured with the second artifact, blotting out one of the guards and vaporizing a chunk of D'Amico's clothing. The clothing disintegrated into little twisted lengths of blackened rubber. Heraldoff frowned at the artifact in his hand. It had unmade mountains in his prior tests. It had just annihilated a guard. Why hadn't it worked against D'Amico? But D'Amico hissed, pain etched on his face, and Heraldoff realized it had worked. It hadn't killed him with one swipe but it had damaged him. Now, D'Amico, Haraldoff said, brandishing the artifact again, I'm going to rub you out. D'Amico glanced at him, the guards rushing back in, his face pained, his breathing heavy. What the hell is that thing? Haraldoff held up the rectangular block of white material. He flexed it slightly to show its rubbery give. Face the heraldic symbol on one side toward D'Amico. D'Amico's eyes widened with horror. "'You recognize it?' Haraldoff asked, and he had to wait for his answer as the guards overwhelmed D'Amico. "'I've seen them,' D'Amico said. "'I don't know what it's called,' Haraldoff said, smelling the magnificent bouquet of the white material. "'It's an eraser,' D'Amico said, too busy to peek a second time at the happy cat emblazoned on the side. "'A Hello Kitty eraser.' "'Eraser. How appropriate.' He could ignore the Hello Kitty part. Well, D'Amico, prepare to be erased. With that, he waved the eraser back and forth over the image of D'Amico and the guards in his field of vision. The first guard exploded into eraser leavings. The second collapsed to the left half of his side, sloughing off into waste rubber. The movement caught D'Amico across the chest, rubbing away flesh and muscle, leaving him screaming, the sheen of bone gleaming through blood. Are you ready to die, brother? "'You can't kill me,' D'Amico hissed. "'And why is that?' The guards rushed in on D'Amico, who hit the ground and rolled between two of them, rushing straight into the magical erasing blast of the artifact. D'Amico screamed in pain, but pushed through the effects of the artifact and struck out with one hand, knocking the eraser free. They both collapsed to the ground, rolling into a bloody pile as the eraser bounced across the room. The impact drove the wind out of Heraldoff. The flies swarmed in, forming a close shield around his body, biting and crawling over D'Amico, his servants. Heraldoff crawled out of the pile, D'Amico's blood slick on his legs as he crept over the floor. D'Amico no longer tried to stop him. The overlord scrambled to his feet, his eyes casting about the room for the eraser, not seeing it. D'Amico writhed, and Heraldoff couldn't figure out why, and looked closer. The man faded before his eyes, the flies going straight through him and past that seemed to cause agony. His brother's last statement made sense. Heraldoff looked down on D'Amico with pity. Of course Heraldoff couldn't kill him. You're already dead. As D'Amico writhed, Heraldoff glanced over the battle. The dwarf had made good work of the guards, but there were still a dozen left. Arithian had dropped from damage. No threat there. Heraldoff looked back at D'Amico and saw nothing but a flickering image of a man. He smiled and walked toward the eraser. He picked it up and considered it briefly. The cold, rubbery feel, it fit comfortably in his hand. This was it. With this, he could unmake the world. He could finally know oblivion. All his life, it had been as if the world were nothing but a prison. It had seemed like all his trials and agonies were hand-picked. It was as if all his trauma was geared toward making him the ultimate tragic figure, as if some great god, be it Ralph or Savegame, toyed with Heraldoff, made him suffer. Heraldoff had never wanted anything more than peace, and all he'd ever gotten was carefully metered conflict. Well, no more. Whatever God pulled his strings, tortured him for sport, it would all end now. No! D'Amico screamed, his voice wispy as if carried away on a hurricane wind. Yes, Heraldoff whispered. With one hand he reached into his pocket and pulled out a comb. Better safe than sorry. He straightened his clothing and began to comb his hair. Enough of the tousled Heraldoff who enslaved. He needed the perfect Heraldoff, whose looks could kill. The flies died first, falling out of the air one at a time. 
D'Amico seemed to figure this out quickly enough to look away, but he didn't matter. Even now, Haraldoff could barely make him out. And so Haraldoff raised his most prized artifact, and stroke after broad stroke, he unmade the world. Hello, Kitty. Chapter 65 And So It Ends, Bob Defendi The moment you begin to die, a great peace descends on your body. The pain that had seized your limbs so violently eases. Your toes, whether or not you can move them, relax. Then a great final breath flows from your body, and this is the moment of truth. The heavenly choir and the demons of your awful nature line up in a crowd, tallying your sins and good deeds one by one. A hush falls over everything as they wait for the final score. To see if the weight of your sins will bear you down or your glory will lift you up. That moment of lifting comes as the supreme moment of love and release. It is sweet like pure syrup, sweet like talking your way out of a speeding ticket, sweet like champagne licked off the nipple of your one true love. It's the big promotion skipping the asshole and landing firmly on your shoulders. The rich uncle mentioning you in his will. It's realizing the decision rests on you to approve or decline the mortgage of the prick who beat you up in high school. D'Amico experienced none of this. He didn't die, exactly. He wasn't sure if he even could die. Haraldoff had said he was already dead. Was that true, or did he still cling to a last scrap of life in some faraway world? Either way, he didn't feel his body give out nerve by aching nerve. Instead, he just sort of faded away. One moment, he lay on the ground, his erased chest throbbing with the pain of the wound. Then he was Marty McFly on a one-way trip to never was. D'Amico screamed. His hand, his faded memory of a hand, fell, landing on an object, causing a blast of pain to roar through his arm. He started to pull away, and then it hit him. Pain. Pain or just let go. Let go and maybe move on to his final judgment, maybe drift back to his body. Pain and live in this world forever. Let go and either find death or return to his former life. And he could sense the actual path back now. Not dead yet after all. He could feel the connection to his body, smell the surgical plastic, hear the ventilator. Letting go wouldn't kill him. It would take him home home. All he had to do was let go, let Haraldoff win. Nothing was real, anyway. She wasn't real. None of them were. They lived off his borrowed life. They fed on his fading soul. They were parasites, and nothing he did could change that. They had killed him. With each life he'd granted, they had weakened his soul, and now his body lacked the strength to continue. Let go. No more awful pain. Slow sleep as his body recovered. When he woke up, he knew even his head wound would be healed. Just let go. Let go. Let go of Jerkin and Haraldoff and his stupid fictional family, of his world where clichés swarmed, of the pain and the responsibility and the constant strife, of a narrative structure that guaranteed he was constantly miserable. Let go of it all. Let go of her. Her. His hand twitched still on that pain-inducing, life-giving object. It was hard, long and slender, cool. The pain intensified. She wasn't real. He created her. She was nearly his daughter, in spirit at least. And he didn't feel like living his life as a walking testament to Dr. Freud. Just let her go. Let it all go. Carl's game will end. He'll go to jail. Let go. Her. His hand grasped the object, the pain flowed into his shoulder, across his chest, the pain burst into a need for his lungs to breathe, a need for his heart to beat. With a great gasping breath, he screamed, this time for real. He writhed and flipped over onto his back, staring up into an open sky, rubble and half-deconstructed castles surrounding it. He rolled over in time to watch a large bunk of stone topple and fall. The pain became a promise of more pain, and he leaped even as the stone crashed where he lay. He rolled and came up standing. Haraldoff hadn't noticed, still excising the walls of the keep so he could access the hills and the mountains and the land. He had already erased the sky, leaving... Well, it made D'Amico's eyes hurt to try to look at nothing. To 
To one side all the guards lay dead, but Gorthander lay on the ground, his arms and legs erased, his eyes wide with panic. Arithian wept silently, his hand and mouth gone. D'Amico turned from the horror that had been his friends and examined the object in his hand, the first artifact. The connection between him and this item had brought all these people to life. This was it, the wellspring of creation. A mechanical pencil. Before, at a distance, the resonance between him and it had formed a connection between the life force and the people who he had awakened. Now, in his hand, it thrummed, filling him with life, aching, thrilling, laughing, effervescent life. He considered Haraldoff and pulled up the pencil, feeling the energy pulse in his hand. A pencil in the hand of a game designer, trapped in a game. The procreative force burned so powerfully he feared he'd contract V.D., the pencil would never feel this powerful in another hand. Perhaps there would be no power at all. Perhaps Haraldoff wouldn't even be able to use the eraser if he hadn't been connected to Carl, to D'Amico himself. "'Haraldoff!' D'Amico shouted, sketching bars in the air around the overlord. They appeared as penciled lines, slowly growing together as if they intended to solidify. Haraldoff looked down, erasing the bars quickly. D'Amico sketched a boulder in the air over his head, only to have it erased. He sketched a sword, only to have it vanish. He sketched a rabbit dog, only to watch Haraldoff obliterate it. A spiked wall, only to have Haraldoff wipe it clean. Hmm, Haraldoff said. You found the other artifact. A fish, D'Amico said, because this entire thing had become as surreal as Salvador Dali drinking bong water. You don't think you can win, do you? Haraldoff asked. D'Amico stared right into that perfect, deadly face now, but the creative force of the pencil in his hand must have protected him. He wanted to weep for the beauty of his brother, but he didn't die like the carpet of flies. "'A little trite, don't you think?' D'Amico asked. "'You do think you can win, don't you? I have to.' Haraldoff shook his head. "'My dear brother, it's always easier to destroy than to create the law of entropy.' "'I don't care if it's zetropy. You're going to die. With that, Haraldoff took off D'Amico's left arm with a swipe. D'Amico collapsed to the ground, furiously drawing, but Haraldoff took off his legs the knees. The overlord tried to take off the other arm, too, but he couldn't. The power of the pencil surged, and the eraser had no effect. D'Amico retaliated with sketched demons, his third-grade teacher, and Jiminy Cricket. Haraldoff obliterated them all before D'Amico drew more than outlines. The overlord walked to D'Amico. D'Amico lay there with only one arm, staring up at his brother, his enemy, the core of the clichés. He stared up, and he hated. "'You are the Alpha,' Haraldoff said. "'I am the Omega.' "'The yin and the yang,' D'Amico said. "'I can never remember which is which.' He sketched across Haraldoff's body, but the Overlord erased the little wounds and the horns and the mustache before D'Amico finished. "'You've lost, brother.' If you think destroying the world is winning, we've all lost. Haraldoff watched him even as D'Amico sketched on Haraldoff's body. Haraldoff gave himself a swipe, clearing away a couple doodles. I have the eraser, D'Amico. You can't hurt me. I am destruction. Just like I can do nothing more to you as long as you're creation. Now, give me the artifact, and I'll kill you painlessly. D'Amico shook his head. You're a fool, Haraldoff. And why is that? D'Amico smiled. Yin and Yang. Nothing is all evil or all good. Nothing is all love or all hate. Nothing is all creation or all destruction. It had all fallen into place now, and he understood. If it was, you couldn't have taken my legs. Haraldoff squinted. So? So I couldn't have done what I just did to you with those last marks. Haraldoff frowned and examined his arms as if he might have missed some of D'Amico's drawings. And then the first pain hit, sending him wailing to his knees. He shuddered and screamed again, even as D'Amico redrew his own limbs. They hovered in place as rough outlines before, flushing with color like a Photoshop flood fill. They swelled outward, gaining dimension and shape, and then fading from cartoon to computer animation to real. And D'Amico stood. He walked over to his brother and considered him, the limbs already twisting, the eraser lying on the ground next to a distorted hand. D'Amico picked up the second artifact— and put it in his pocket. Yin and yang, D'Amico said. Inside destruction, there is creation, and vice versa. You used my own desire for self-destruction against me when you took my legs. What have you done? Haraldoff screamed, the pain quivering in his voice. 
I used your creation against you. I wasn't just doodling there. I was giving you a cold. Cold? His voice shrieked in disbelief. And an ear infection. And syphilis. Have you ever tried to draw a spirochete? I don't understand, Raldoff hissed. I gave you a blood clot. I gave you an embolism. And a bad credit rating. Oh, yeah. And cancer. He looked down at his brother, writhing with bone cancer and stomach cancer and lymphoma and leukemia. He didn't have the heart to watch. I also gave you an appointment for next Tuesday, but I don't think you'll make it. He picked up the eraser and obliterated Haraldov's head. The body fell to the ground, and D'Amico turned from his fictional brother. He turned to his real friends and quickly, stroke by stroke, under a sky of nothing, made them whole again. Chapter 66 There's my thesaurus, Bob Defendi. D'Amico scrutinized the pencil, the writing utensil, then shook or dittered it. It made no auditory emission, empty, without graphite, only the tenuous bit of material currently left charged in the end. It would have to do. He surveilled the sky, the Empyrean. With broad strokes he began painting, rendering the blue arch. It was a big job, and he feared he wouldn't have the ablative carbon filler to finish, but he did. He terminated, using the last dull piece to sketch in clouds, fog, saturated water vapor. The things were sketchy anyway. "'Is it done?' Gorthander queried. D'Amico confirmed. "'I didn't think the world would hold together without a sky.' "'Do you have any left?' Gorthander put to him next. D'Amico oscillated his neck in the negative. "'I might have stopped when all I had left were clouds, but I didn't think there was enough to do anything but clouds.' Gorthander repetitively adjusted the level of his head in the affirmative. "'It's done, then. Done.' "'Poor Omar.' D'Amico indicated his assent with his cranium. Ryan can make another character. "'Maybe this one will be able to do something,' Gorthander posited. "'How do you mean?' "'I mean, maybe next adventure? The GM's character won't have to do everything during the climax?' D'Amico contemplated him, blinked, and laughed. Chapter 67 All's Well That Ends Bob Defendi D'Amico found Ladiana walking down a corridor, wearing a gown fit for a queen. The milky white pearl stitched the green silk in perfect little rows. The lines and whirls of the thing so cluttered the dress that, had it been red, it would have resembled the mat of a well-used boxing ring. The next thing he knew, they were in each other's arms. She shook even as he crushed her to his chest, but she didn't cry. It seemed neither of them had the strength to cry any more. This, all his life, all he'd ever really wanted, was this. What good was it to go home if this was here? What happened? she asked. We won. <clears throat> His voice cracked. He could hold her like this forever. He was willing to give that a try. Let his body stay in a coma. This was real enough. The artifact. I threw it in the fire. No one should have that much destruction at their fingertips. Not even you, she asked, a smile in her voice. He kissed her on top of the head. He felt good. He didn't know how long it had been since he'd actually felt good. If you had the ability to make someone disappear forever and without any pain, would you? It seems humane. Too humane. How could I trust myself? Their pain gives me pain, and that stops me. That's what keeps me human. How could I trust myself with something that killed so easily? Absolute power, none of the unpleasant consequences. I think I'd become the evil overlord. The way I understand it, Haraldoff was your brother. He has no heirs. Heck, you were older than him and left the throne to him. The way I see it, you are the overlord, she said. D'Amico shrugged. Omar? Dead too long to save him, D'Amico said. His brain would have started decaying by now. Jerkind. Dead, I'm sure. Well, we'll just have to wait for his one-shot resurrection to kick in. Yeah. The rest? They're fine. They held each other for several minutes, not caring if anyone saw. Then finally, as the tightness eased into Miko's heart, he let her go and looked her up and down. Nice dress. I don't know when I screamed louder, when I thought something horrible was going to happen to me, or when I opened the door and saw the entire wardrobe. Sounds like a false disaster to me. What? Never mind. 
They walked back to the throne room, arms around shoulder and waist. She nuzzled her head into him. Eventually, both of them would need to deal with the deep trauma of the day's events, but not now. It was nice to walk together. So, what was the artifact? Something from my world. Your world? I'm not from around here. He still didn't know how he'd got here. None of that made sense. Was Carl magic? Was this really hell? What final piece of the puzzle would make sense of all this? He might never know. Life was like that sometime. Or maybe the author just wanted to leave something for a sequel. She smiled. How did the artifact get here? I found socks, paper clips, and toys, all from my world. I think that when something there is lost inexplicably, it appears here, or somewhere like here. She walked in silence, then. So this is the trash pile of the universe. Something like that. We should be paid more. Indeed. They strolled in silence for a time longer. They passed two guards, but the men only nodded. Evidently, you didn't work for an evil overlord if you couldn't take a little coup in stride. So how did you get here? she asked. I said sequel. Someone shot me in the head. So you're dead. I think I'm in a coma. So this is all a dream. That one was easy. No, this is real. How do you know? she asked. He could hear the doubt in her voice. Did she know how short a time she'd been alive? Because I made it real. She nudged him with her head. You're talking like you're some kind of a god. He shrugged. Only in bed. How did he explain to her that each game master was the god of his or her little universe? And that perhaps he was a bit more? Better to let it go with a joke. They arrived in the throne room, and she considered the excised upper levels of the keep for a moment, and looked past them to the fluffy clouds. He'd given them a tint of sunset orange. He was rather proud. Gorthander had some of the remaining guards in a line, and he explained the new situation to them with a minimum of knee kicks and helmet to groin headbutts. Meanwhile, Arithian lounged in the throne, surrounded by women. D'Amico wondered vaguely where he'd found them. He did a number in this place. Heraldoff did. I was too busy trying to remember what a tumor looked like. Come again? Never mind. D'Amico flexed his hand, the power of the artifact pulsed there, flowing in his blood and vibrating in his muscles. Gorthander nodded in D'Amico's direction, and he smiled at the dwarf. For all the annoyance a player must feel at having a non-player character win the adventure, Gorthander had forgiven quickly. He was a good guy. D'Amico wished they'd met in real life. "'What do we do now?' she asked. "'After I take you to bed?' she hit him in the arm. "'What makes you think you are?' "'I'm pretty irresistible. We'll see about that.' He gazed at the room and wondered that no one had searched for treasure yet. That had been Omar's job. He kind of missed Omar. Likely he'd come back as Omar, too. The creative force still echoed inside him. Without the artifact, there was nothing for him to connect to, granting others life. Still, he wasn't sure he couldn't bring a person to life with a touch now, or even a glance. He burst at the seams. He overflowed. Enough life to birth a village, a nation, a world. You'd have to see. After that, he said, as if she'd agreed, after that, I don't know, something will come up. How do you know? Because they meet every week. Who does? D'Amico smiled and took her into his arms. He kissed her thoroughly, passionately, lifting her off the ground. When he finished, he set her back down and gazed into her eyes. I sure hope you weren't played by a guy. Chapter 68. Okay, I admit it. The pun was intended. Bob DeVindy. And somewhere, in a shark's belly, a hand twitched. The End Bob DeFendi. Age, 44. Eyes, hazel green. Hair, flowing. Build, like a Greek god, only better. Height, in guy height or real height? Race sex, human male. Skin, glowing. Demeanor, charming, witty. Dress, you aren't looking at his clothes. True attitude, what do you like to know? Home, Utah. Human wordsmith slash game designer, 99 slash 99th level. Neutral good, medium humanoid. Or large, ladies. 
Mightiness holds his own. Intelligence, hyper. Agility, once tripped over home plate. Wisdom, timeless. Health, eh. Charm, infinite. Would I lie to you? Initiative, over one million words in print. Senses, hear noise, plus four. Spot, plus four, slightly nearsighted. Languages, English, American, Scottish, Irish, Australian, South African, dropped out of Latin and French. Armor class, 28, 58 versus criticism. Hit points, 314. Weaknesses, saturated fat, salty treats, carbs. Critical weakness to peanut butter M&Ms. Allergies, gluten, he's a celiac, not a hippie. Country Western music. Grit, plus 10. Dodge, plus 8. Willpower, minus 5. Speed, 20 feet. Melee, backhand, plus 34, slash, plus 29, slash, plus 24, slash, plus 19. 1d3 plus 3, slash, 19 to 20, times 3. Ranged, scathing wit, plus 23, slash, plus 18, slash, plus 13, slash, plus 8. 1d10, slash, 19 to 20. Attack options, biting sarcasm, disarming compliment, fast talk. Special qualities, je ne sais quoi. Feats, charm, fast talk, animal magnetism, sex appeal, exquisitely beautiful, pheromones, public speaking, fake it till you make it, and spectacular humility. Skills, bluff, 21, boy scout, plus four, climb, plus four, cold read, plus four, craft, leather crafting, plus seven. Craft miniature painting, plus 11. Diplomacy, plus 21. Drive, plus 9. Handle animal, plus 2. Intimidate, plus 15. Jump, plus 3. Knowledge history, plus 3. Knowledge movies, plus 7. Knowledge sci-fi novels, plus 9. Hear noise, plus 4. Love making, plus 97. Pilot, plus 2. Profession computer tech, plus 10. Profession game designer, plus 18. Profession plotting, plus 12. Profession writing, plus 8. Ride, plus 6. Search, plus 6. Spot, plus 4. Swim, plus 3. Background history. Bob Defendi was one of the writers for Savage Seas in the game Exalted. He worked on Spycraft, Shadow Force Archer, and the Stargate SG-1 role-playing game. He wrote the current incarnation of Space Master. As the publisher of Final Readout Press, he designed and released the critically acclaimed setting, The Echoes of Heaven. He was featured in Writers of the Future 19 and When Darkness Comes. He's the author of the successful podcast audiobook, Death by Cliché. You might have heard of it. He's featured in Space Eldritch and Space Eldritch 2. Bob Defendi was born in Dubuque, Iowa, in accordance with prophecy. He reads voraciously if you consider audiobooks reading, which you shouldn't. He has yet to find, conquer, and rule a small Central American country but I think we all know it's inevitable. He is neither Team Jacob nor Team Edward. He's sympathetic to Team Guy who almost hit Bella with a truck. He shamelessly stole that last joke. It's Bob Defendi when he writes comedy. It's Robert J. Defendi for all other writing projects. No period after the J because he's an ass who likes to make things difficult for publishers. That's why. We hope you've enjoyed Death by Cliché. Written by Bob Defendi. Narrated by Robert J. Defendi. Copyright 2016, Robert J. Defendi. Production copyright 2016, Robert J. Defendi. Produced by J.M. Bell. Recorded at the Defenestrate Media Group. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.